Institute for Research in Cognitive Science here at Penn, which is one of the sponsors of this event. And uh, I'm going to kick off the morning's proceedings uh, without reading to you the speech that Bruce Nevin would have given because I don't know what it would have been if he were here. Uh, but instead, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the uh, person who will give the welcoming remarks for today's symposium, um, Provost Robert Barchi. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. And I guess I will uh, step in for, for Bruce here, who is uh, missing in action somewhere in this horrible snowstorm and those, you know, somewhere between a half and 12 inches of snow in the suburbs. But I do want to uh, take this opportunity to welcome you all here to Penn and on behalf of the president to say how pleased we are to have you here in this symposium celebrating one of Penn's most influential scholars, linguistics professor Zellick Harris, and the publication of this latest fest shrift celebrating and honoring his work. Now, the title of this book, as I read it, is The Legacy of Zellick Harris. Um, but in fact, that legacy probably is reflected more in your work and in what you're doing and in the chapters you've contributed to this book than in anything else. I know that Harris himself would have liked us to pay only attention to the work and not to the man. And so today you probably are honoring him in the way that he would have preferred, that is, to focus on the substance of the work, on the seminal contributions that he's made and you have made in following up on that line of research in so many different fields. But before you start the day, I want to take the provostial prerogative and boast a little bit about Zelig Harris, the man. He was, without a doubt, one of Penn's leading intellectual lights during the last century. He began his career as a student here at Penn in the Department of Oriental Studies and completed his PhD degree in 1934. And in 1946, he founded the first Department of Linguistics in the United States here at Penn and subsequently held the Benjamin Franklin Chair in Linguistics until his retirement. He was a magnificent scientist influencing virtually every aspect of linguistics and every line of research related to the nature of language, whether it was in psychology or computer science or mathematics or anthropology or philosophy. He initiated the applications of set theory and linear algebra to the data of language, which really has led to various formal systems that are now virtually normative in linguistics. The first natural language parser was developed on UNIVAC here at Penn in 1957, and the most recent research in computational linguistics can trace its origin back to that initial work. Harris's methodological principles for linguistic analysis based on insights into essential limitations of the language find solid corroboration in the latest developments in statistical learning theory. He articulated the notion of grammar as generative function, which was later elaborated with different methodological assumptions by his student Noam Chomsky. His innovations in linguistics include information structures and discourse, transfer grammar, string analysis, ultimately inspiring Arvind Yoshi's tree adjoining grammars, and operating grammar. His conceptualization of linguistic information in the late 80s and 1990s has ramifications that have yet to be developed and, and explored fully in the field. Ultimately, Harris's contributions to Penn and to a myriad of fields led to the creation of the Institute for Research in Cognitive Science in 1990. IRCS fosters the study of the human mind through the interaction of investigators from the disciplines of linguistics, mathematical logic, philosophy, psychology, computer science, and neuroscience. IRCS has become a major force in brain and cognitive research uh, both here at Penn and, and really throughout the world. As you honor Zelig Harris today and celebrate the publication of this new collection of writings that carry on his work, pause for a minute to think about what would have been missing if Harris had never explored the world of linguistics. That's really the true legacy of this man and his body of work. He's touched fields that I'm sure he never dreamed he would influence during his working days. His work and yours will continue to influence scholars in a wide variety of fields for years to come. From the looks of the schedule, you have a really exciting day ahead of you. Um, I wish I could be here for all of it. Enjoy every minute of it. Thank you.
best laid plans of mice and men and all of that. Um, uh, I am uh, Bruce Nevin, and I uh, should have been here to introduce Provost Barty, and, uh, uh, and I'm now here to introduce uh, Paul Peranto from uh, John Benjamin's. Uh, Paul. And uh, Paul, Paul is going to um, present the, um, well, you'll say what you're doing, but he's here with the volumes um, that uh, many of the contributors who are here have written chapters for, and uh, which volume we're here to celebrate. Uh, I just wanted to make a brief uh, presentation uh, thanking uh, particularly Bruce and Stephen Johnson for all of their work on, this, uh, on these two volumes, and the series editor, Conrad Kerner, and our own in-house editor, Anka Deloper, who also worked on the film. Uh, we have, um, I've brought the, some of the volumes that, um, that belong to the contributors, and as a matter of fact, uh, would like to present these to the contributors who are present. Um, I'm not sure exactly how we're gonna do this, uh, but if you perhaps would come up uh, when I call your name and we'll present the, the volume to you. Uh, that might be the easiest way to do it. Hmm? I guess these. Yes, and if you remain up here and then uh, while we go to everyone's name. Um, these are not in alphabetical order. One last word for me on a personal note. Uh, I'm just not, I'm not just somebody who just, I mean, I was asked by the publishing company to come and represent them. But I realized in, in thinking about what I might be able to say, which is not going to be very many words, that I'm a kind of a academic uh, great-grandchild of, of Zelig Harris, in that Zelig Harris taught Noam Chomsky, Noam Chomsky taught Jim McCauley, and I was a student of Jim McCauley. So it's kind of a, who, and I think of Jim McCauley I think Jim McCauley would certainly have had an article in this volume uh, where he's still alive. Um, and so it's, very, it's a real pleasure personally for me to be here, and I hope the conference goes very well. Thank you. I will be very brief because we want to continue uh, directly. Um, uh, there are uh, uh, a number of people who uh, uh, perhaps should have contributed to the volume and they were unable to because of time constraints and so forth. Uh, and there are people here 
who uh, perhaps should be presenters here, but again, because of timing and shifting schedules and so forth. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, recognize in particular um, Jim Muntz, if he's here yet. Uh, he's, he'll be coming later because I know he's driving down. <coughs> and Professor Karol van den Engel, uh, uh, who is, uh, I mispronounced that, who is uh, here from, uh, he's a Dutch linguist and we've been learning, uh, uh, he uh, discovered Heresian methodology on his own in Africa and then learned about Harris in 1969. So this is a delightful example of convergence of independent effort and has produced some really remarkable work with uh, computer dictionaries uh, in what he calls a phenomenal approach. But he will not be presenting, unfortunately, because of these uh, schedule constraints. Now, I would like to uh, introduce um, Professor Richard Early. Dick Early um, has his degrees from Harvard and Columbia and MIT with Halle. Uh, has been on the permanent faculty at Stanford and University of Arizona, uh, and most recently was with uh, a company called YY Technologies that developed interaction technology that uses natural language processing to read incoming text messages and automatically respond, uh, an application uh, of which we see many coming out of this. Uh, he's uh, the vice president of the Association for Mathematics of Language, a special interest group, or SIG, of the ACL. Association for Computational Linguistics. Uh, and his interests are in interconnections of grammatical composition on different um, dimensions of linguistic analysis, syntax, morphology, semantics, pragmatics, phonology, prosody, and how these interconnect. Uh, and also in a comparison of grammatical frameworks. He's written many books and papers, which I won't list for you here. Uh, his contribution to volume two is a chapter called Logics for Intercalation. Uh, and uh, his talk today is on Harris's categorical grammar. Dick Early. Yeah. So I have 25 minutes, roughly. Um, in this in this talk. Uh, what I hope to do is to extract from Harris's work some of the uh, connections that it has with um, categorical grammar as it was, as it is, as it will be. Um, so we bring it to some focus, what his contribution is in this uh, particular area. Uh, I'll begin with a, a, a brief prologue to try to establish uh, uh, the connection and some perspective upon it, then look briefly at the uh, overall architecture of Harris's uh, syntax. Um, then we'll look at what categorical grammar is, so we have some way of evaluating Harris's contribution. Look more particularly at his notions of dependence operators, arguments, and then examine uh, a computational implementation of some of these ideas, uh, which has remarkable affinities with uh, some recent and current uh, uh, directions uh, in this framework. And finally, we'll touch on his legacy uh, 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 for this uh, line of work. Um, I'd like to thank, before I start, uh, Bruce Nevin, uh, Henry Heesh, and Aravind Joshi for encouragement and ad advice. Um, and I better. I wanted to start with two uh, um, quotations from Harris's uh, theory of language and information. Uh, Interestingly enough, they're both from footnotes. Uh, the first one says, at various points, the conclusions which are reached here turn out to be similar to well-known views of language. For example, the operator-argument relation has similarities to the predicate structure in Aristotelian logic. Uh, the way it functions in, in the formation of sentences has similarities to functors, uh, et cetera, to the, in, in the categorical grammar of uh, Yeshnevsky, uh, followed by Idukiewicz and others in the Polish School of Logic. Um, these are uh, people in the, in the uh, core tradition of uh, categorical grammar, and Harris here acknowledges this, this connection, which we will explore. Um, there's another footnote, uh, which comes earlier in the book, uh, which I think is particularly representative of what he must have been like, although I never, I never met him. 
Um, and I found this really quite touching. Uh, he says that the picture of language presented here is similar in so some respects or others to various views of language, does not obviate the need for reaching the present theory independently by detailed analyses of language. So he didn't want to just take this theoretical framework off the shelf and say, okay, this seems to fit all right. Uh, rather, what he wanted to see was some intrinsic motivation from the substance, the empirical uh, material that he was concerned with uh, that uh, uh, connected directly and supported uh, this uh, theoretical apparatus. Um, so this is our, our, our starting point. It, it suggests that he wasn't interested so much in exploring the connections of his categorical framework with other work in categorical grammar, so much as finding a, a, a way of uh, elaborating ideas that arose intrinsically uh, in, in linguistic analysis. Um, so with that background, let's look first at two goals to try to understand what role categorical grammar plays in Harris's syntax uh, and what the connections are of Harris's categorical grammar and other categorical frameworks. That's our program. So we start with the architecture of Harris's syntax. And most of this uh, is just directly quoted from the uh, uh, theory of, of uh, language and information. Um, where one finds the outline of the architecture particularly clearly explained. Uh, Harris starts out with the observation that um, language has no external meta-language in which one could define its elements and relations. And therefore, one cannot appeal to the meta-language in order to define things inside the, the, the language that we're concerned with. And he goes on to say, hence, the elements can be established only by their redundancies in the set of utterances, that is, by the departures from equiprobability in the observable parts of speech and writing. And here we see already the, the deep connection in Harris's work between uh, syntactic structure, uh, uh, probabilistic properties, and information theory. Um, and he emphasizes that no matter what else this is to do, it must account for these departures. And that in, if we give an account of this, we don't want to add our own biases. That is, the, uh, the resulting theory uh, uh, should reflect uh, as directly as possible uh, those departures from equiprobability that arise in the uh, linguistic matter itself. It then turns out, necessarily so, on information theoretic grounds that the elements and relations which are reached in a least redundant description have fixed informational values which together yield the information of the sentences in which they occur. So this program, uh, it, one sees that information potential of utterances is uh, 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 directly related to properties of their form. Now, how are we going to analyze these? Um, Harris had a lot of interest in, in methods of linguistics. And I think that it's worth emphasizing here two parts. One is that uh, he had proposed a way of, of identifying distinctive speech sounds through his famous pair test. So you give informants, well, you have a pair of informants, and you uh, uh, have some words, and you want to see whether they agree on which words are distinct and which are not. Um, and in this way, you can identify the, dis the distinctive sounds. Uh, well, what about things at some higher level? Well, he also had very interesting ways of identifying uh, uh, word and sentence boundaries by using stochastic sequences tests. And what this involved was uh, if, if you start at the beginning of a word or sentence, and there you have uh, uh, very little information about what the first uh, uh, unit will be. Um, but as you proceed, uh, things get simpler and the choices become more narrow. Um, and he has these beautiful pictures of what the uh, change of probabilities are as you make these sequential transitions. Um, this is not the thing that 
draws our core attention here, but uh, it's essential for Harris's syntactic methods that he have a way of identifying words and sentences, those two, those two categories in particular. Now, once we have this, um, we can try to understand how to define this departure from equiprobabilities uh, in, in three steps. Um, the first has to do with an operator argument partial ordering that he proposed, and this is what we'll focus on in, in a bit, but it's coupled with uh, a, a notion that if the argument operator relation is defined in a particular case, uh, then also some likelihood is, is assign, assignable to it. Um, furthermore, uh, uh, there's a series of reductions and transformations that can occur on the output of this uh, uh, operator argument construction, dependent on likelihood, uh, that will give us the full set of sentences. So the operator argument partial ordering is going to give us the, the uh, kernel language or base sentences. Uh, there's a likelihood that's associated with it. There's reductions and transformations dependent on uh, uh, form and likelihood. And these are uh, informationally equivalent. So the information structure and the core syntax occur with the first step. Now, before we look at that, Harris's ideas of operators and arguments, I want to turn and look at categorical grammar briefly. So this is an extremely short course. Um, basic idea is you have some basic categories, sentence, noun phrase, for example. And in particular here, the usual assumption is not sentence and word. It's two, two, a, a set of atomic syntactical categories. Um, along with basic categories, you have some functor categories. Uh, and these things are similar to functions in ordinary arithmetic or to implications or forms of term rewriting. And the, the idea that you can use functions in syntactic analysis can really be traced back to Frege's Begriffsschrift, paragraph 9, where he explicitly talks about how one can define syntactical functions through abstraction. If you have a, a sentence, you can remove a name and then form something to which uh, uh, you can think of that as a sentential function um, so that you can carry out applications to other things through substitution. Uh, this idea is elaborated in great length in, in works like uh, Church's Introduction to Mathematical Logic, and in fact is quite standard in uh, 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 the logical tradition, even in such introductory books as uh, Wilfred Hodge's Introduction to Logic, where one sees put together the idea that you can have sentential functions, and they can be linked to propositional functions in the cases of interest to, say, propositional logic. Um, so the two ideas that stem from Frege are that one can use these notions of function to give a recursive syntax for formal languages, and that you can have composition across dimensions so that you can define syntax and interpretation on the same, same inductive structures. The categorical tradition tries to, well, takes that as its, its framework, and it was elaborated, first of all, by uh, uh, Kazimierz Radzikiewicz, uh, a member of the Polish school of, of, of logic, who proposed a fractional notation for categories. You see the fractional notation in this uh, A over B. Um, and he had a cancellation rule that said, basically, you can multiply out the, uh, the two Bs in the structure so that if you have a, a, a concatenation of those two things on the left, the fractional category with denominator B together with the B, you can assign that the type A. OK? This was Ijukiewicz's uh, uh, idea for trying to understand what he called syntactic connection. It's not that closely related to uh, uh, the syntax of natural languages as he uh, readily recognized, uh, but he proposed that if we put things into Polish notation so that the main functors are always uh, initial, then one could always have this uh, rule of cancellation with the functor category on the left 
and the argument category on the right. Uh, subsequently, Bar Hillel proposed a directional notation so that instead of a horizontal uh, uh, division symbol, you have directionally oriented symbols. Um, and there's two forms of cancellation. Um, if this first case gives a slash b, then the b has to be to the right to cancel. Second case gives uh, a b first, and then the functor category b under a, and you also have a, 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 a corresponding cancellation rule. Uh, Geach, later following Idukevich's work, uh, proposed that in addition to the cancellation rule that, uh, uh, that he got from Idukevich, that one could derive further cancellation rules by the recursive scheme given uh, by the rest of the uh, uh, display. Namely, that if you have a cancellation rule that says, given alpha followed by beta to yield gamma, then you could also have the rule, alpha followed by beta over delta gives gamma over delta. So that you could also derive functor categories. And he, uh, Agich applied this to uh, the study of the syntax of negation uh, with sentences, predicates, and quantifiers in Greek sentences. Um, and he also had a comparable rule for uh, a coordination uh, which was uh, um, quite influential. It's interesting to note that these are rules at the level of cancellation rules, that the type schemas here are cancellation schools and, uh, schemes and are not directly uh, um, applicable to sequences of types that we would get from some syntactical string. Um, I wanted to mention a few other things here. Uh, uh, Lambeck, Joachim Lambeck, Lambeck in, in, in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, uh, proposed that these cancellation rules should actually be seen as uh, a, a fragment of uh, propositional logic without uh, the standard structural rules that Gensen had proposed in the 30s. Um, alternatively, one could say, well, we have a logic that's based on identity uh, and uh, the adjointness relation between the product represented by this uh, big dot in the middle of the page there, and the directional implications that we already saw in Bar Hillel's work. Um, in this case, the, uh, uh, the types are really to be understood as derived directly from, say, lexical elements that, that carry them. And what we do is hope to find a conclusion represented by the symbol on the, on the uh, right-hand side of the arrow. Um, and all of the cancellation rules then would be derivable uh, by this uh, a species of type inference. Um, it's worth noting that the, these slashes uh, carry information both about what the domain and codomain of the functions would be, but also about what their syntactical relations have to be. That is, that the cancellation in this in this scheme, as well as in bar Hillel's scheme, uh, requires syntactic adjacency. And in uh, Lambeck's 1961 paper, you need a stronger condition that they have to be uh, 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 part of the same uh, uh, structural product. Uh, in contrast, many of the works in the, in the categorical tradition have a, a weaker idea. For example, in Montague's work, uh, this is based on a type scheme that borrows uh, IGKH's um, fractional notation, but the fractional notation has nothing whatsoever to do with the form of the syntactic combinations of the things that represent the domain category and the, the codomain category. That is, the syntax can be given by arbitrary descriptions, as those of you who know Montague's work will appreciate, uh, particularly rules such as his quantifying in rule, which is famous for uh, the many details of phenomenal agreement uh, um, vacuous quantification, and so on that, that it involves. Um, there's been further work in categorical grammar that, uh, well, uh, the, especially work in, in combinatorial ca categorical grammar uh, by, by Steedman and, and collaborators um, that treats the cancellation as forms of, of uh, uh, combinators 
uh, and is distinct from, say, the Lambeck system in that we don't have rules corresponding to this, to the uh, uh, if and only if going this way. Only you have type reductions, but not type expansions. Um, another school is the, the type logical grammar school associated with Michael Morscott, Glenn Morrill, and others involving um, multiple modes of composition. Um, these are not of immediate interest here. Um, if we step back from this historical sketch, we see that there's some interesting parameters. You have uh, a specification of domain and codomain in, in functions versus uh, actual specification of how the, how the syntactical action is to be taken and carried out. So here we have, say, Montague versus Lambeck. Um, this is a, related to things like uh, 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 the description tree, uh, the derivation tree in, in tree-adjoining grammar versus the yield of that tree, or the, the ideas in, in uh, 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 multi-context-free grammars where you have some function that gives you the spell out of the combination versus just the combination, uh, what the types are. Um, second distinction is the distinction between uh, words and phrases. Um, categorical grammar typically has is, is been derived in terms of combining phrasal categories. Uh, dependency grammars, on the other hand, have typically been associated with uh, combinations just based on words and sentences. Uh, a third distinction is the distinction between having uh, a denumerable set of categories where you think of the categorical schema as uh, derivable from basic types together with some recipe for giving you complex types versus just having a fixed set of complex types. Uh, related to that is the idea of whether you have higher order types like this type S over NP under S, which is the type of a, a monadic quantifier uh, versus types that are first order only that have no slashes under the top slash. Um, this, I mentioned that uh, uh, in, in combinatory categorical grammar, you have forms of type reduction, but you don't have forms of inference uh, uh, that uh, 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 analogous to hypothetical reasoning in, in, or the deduction theorem in logic. Um, finally, we have the cases of basic categories, whether they're language particular or language universal, and at the bottom line, whether the categorical grammar is uh, gives you the whole syntax or whether it's embedded in a, in a larger system with uh, other sorts of rules like transformations. So against these, we can see some of Harris's ideas. He has a notion of uh, dependence that, that uh, basically says, if A is a simple word and you have some ordered classes of simple words and A depends on uh, uh, these uh, simple words B through E, if and only if whenever A occurs, you find words from this set. So the presence of A uh, implies the presence of other words. And in this sense, uh, uh, you can think that A depends uh, immediately on, on uh, uh, elements of each of these sets. And we can think of A as an operator on those uh, uh, sets to yield sentences. Once we have this order, this dependency idea, Um, we can use that to leverage a whole set of categories. And the way that this is done is, well, we need to have some word classes, but we can define those word classes not in terms of universal categories or in terms of some fixed uh, uh, grammatical constants, but rather on the operator argument relation itself. So critical to this is that you have a class that depends on nothing. And these are proper names in the, in the most obvious instance. Uh, given proper names, we can then have a category of things that will make sentences if we require a proper name. These are intransitive verbs like sleep. But you see that everything here is dependent on word and sentence and not on noun phrase and sentence. Uh, equally, if you, have, you can have things that re require uh, uh, two elements from the set N. These are transitive verbs. And we can have things that uh, make a sentence if we have something that uh, uh, yields a sentence together with something that uh, uh, 
belongs to this category. These are uh, uh, verbs like asserts. John asserts that's something. Um, so this gives us a whole set of syntactical categories for basic sentences. Um, and one can think of this. Harris has the idea that this is uh, uh, essentially word-based and not phrase-based. Um, one can give a, a, a type theory for this that, that uses composition where you get the dependency relation and the category relation uh, in a way that collapses. I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to highlight on this slide where I think Harris's categorical system uh, uh, fits with respect to the parameters that we mentioned. Uh, with respect to functions, uh, with the, fir the, the, the first item, he fits in the functional class because his categories don't carry information about how the elements combine syntactically. It abstracts from that. Um, his system is word-based, but I think if you step back, you see that the distinction between word and phrase-based in, in a way collapses um, through this notion of composition rather than application. Interestingly, he has just a fixed set of categories and not a, a, a type scheme that will uh, give you arbitrarily uh, complex categories. He has only first order types, no higher order types. So for example, to deal with infinitives, he doesn't think of those as uh, um, infinitive, infinitival sentences minus a noun phrase. He thinks of those as, uh, well, they're derivable in his system through the, the reductions, not, not, uh, not directly. Um, he has, I think, both the notion of type reduction and also employs the notion of type inference. For example, when he uh, discusses how words like uh, the past tense was is recognized as a past tense because it occurs in the same environments as other past tenses really is a form of type inference rather than type reduction. Uh, finally, his Grammar is a multi-level grammar um, in the sense that it's embedded within a larger system. I have to stop, but I will say one other thing. Um, well, I'll eat into it for, say, two minutes. Um, along with this basic architecture, Harris wrote a fascinating paper uh, uh, about cycling cancellation automata uh, in which uh, the, the, the notion of the uh, a slash is replaced by uh, directionally sensitive inverses um, in a way that's analogous but not identical to uh, 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 cancellation in free groups where you have um, the uh, x with the exponent minus one is the inverse of x and they can cancel to give the unit in, in a group uh, same and it's not directional but what we want is a directional form of cancellation where if we have a left inverse can cancel an x to its right, and a right inverse, infer, inverse can cancel an x to its left. And these can be seen in ways that are directly, uh, 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 can carry directional information together with the categorical information so that Harris's idea, say, of an operator that depends on an n can be written this way, n as a right inverse, which will cancel something that precedes if it's of the right category, and yield an O, uh, uh, a sentence uh, uh, which symbolized by his O. Um, so Harris proposed a, a, a cancellation automata uh, uh, that, that was based on this principle. And I will just mention, I'll show some slides that illustrate this without going through them, and some issues that arose uh, that he identified, which are very interestingly related to things like meta rules in HPSG and other ways of trying to go beyond uh, context-free recognition. And it's very interestingly related also to work by um, uh, uh, Jim Lambeck on uh, what he calls pre-groups. Let me just close with, with uh, uh, what I think Harris's legacy is in this area. Uh, one is the methodological setting, the, the, his ideas of generality and abstractness, uh, and the scientific mm, goals in which this program was embedded um, are quite interesting and 
um, worthy of much more scrutiny in the categorical tradition. Um, his notions of categories and context are of interest both in terms of grammatical analysis, that is what categories we assign to the pieces and strings that we know about, and also in terms of learning where we wish to assign categories to strings whose character we're not sure of. Um, and finally, uh, his uh, interest in processing. Um, and I think there's, um, these are the, the uh, uh, things that I think Harris leaves to us. Um, his perspective on language and information, his methods, his analytical, uh, uh, well, his database of analytical uh, uh, insight, um, his realism towards empirical problems and the ambitiousness of his goals, and I thank you. All right. Is there a question? Well, Fernando. Yeah, I think they are quite different. Um, well, Harris starts, with, I mean, his categories are, 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 are come from linguistic research and not from, say, the philosophical tradition that gave rise to Ijukiewicz's work uh, through Lesznevsky and trying to understand uh, uh, the, the, the uh, um, semantic categories that they, you know, Bedeutungskategorien of, of Husserl and Yeshnevsky. So in that sense, they come from uh, different directions, but they converge on, on uh, ways that have uh, you know, this, this functional architecture at their base. And the idea that you can, you can uh, try to go from there to assign categories based on, on uh, dependence, which is very much like the adjointness relation that says if you have a product, if A together with B makes a C, then you can assume that, that A uh, is C over B. But for Harris, you don't have categories in the place of the A, B, and C, but rather these more primitive linguistic entities uh, uh, definable through his methods of, of uh, word and, and, and sentence uh, um, division points. So he took those as the original categories rather than the, the Bedeutungskategory. Uh, and that gives rise to a, a, a very distinct flavor in the, in the work of the uh, two parts of this tradition. But there's many common methods. I um, put you at a disadvantage because I didn't put this clock on oh. here, which we uh, thought we would provide for the speakers so they could uh, monitor this, time. This one is more difficult. Me this one? This clock is. Ah, ah this <laughs> clock is uh, very far off. It says 612 p.m. <laughs> um, the next speaker is, I think, known to most people here, or if not, he certainly should be. Uh, this is Arvind Joshi, Her Henry Salvatore Professor of, of uh, Computer and Cognitive Science. He's in the uh, Department of Computer and Information Science here at the University of Pennsylvania with secondary appointments in linguistics and psychology. Um, his interests are in computational linguistics, cognitive science, and artificial intelligence. His early research was in information theory and communication theory. He came to the US to RCA in 1954 and joined Harris's PARSA project in 1958. He was on the faculty here at Penn, here at Penn in 1961. So he was instrumental in creating the first uh, natural language parser, um, which uh, he's written about. He's a co-director of the Cognitive Science Program and uh, immediate past co-director of the Institute for Research in Cognitive Science here, uh, co-director of the National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center for Research in Cognitive Science. 
Since 1958, he's been working in the intersection of computer science and linguistics, uh, variously labeled formal linguistics, natural language processing, artificial intelligence, cognitive science, many ways you can look at this nexus of, uh, of interest. In uh, 1967 or 68, I don't remember exactly, I was in a seminar with him in which he was introducing grammars with mixed types of rules, that is with rewrite rules and Harry's and adjunction rules combined. And later out of this came tree adjoining grammars, which has been a very rich area of development, tags. Um, he has a chapter, I, I should have mentioned, uh, oh yes I did. He has a chapter in uh, uh, volume two of The Legacy of Zalek Harris, chapter five, Hierarchical Structure and Sentence Description. And his talk today is How Much Complexity is Needed for Language Description. Arvind Joshi. Well, it's a personal, uh, personal honor and uh, pleasure for me to be here to give this uh, talk. <coughs> uh, uh, I was a graduate student in electrical engineering, actually doing my PhD uh, degree in uh, information theory and communication. And uh, I saw some interesting courses in the linguistics department, and I just walked over there and asked uh, Harris whether I could sit in. Uh, I apologize for not having any linguistic background, to which he replied, that's actually good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I started. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to talk about a very specific aspect of, uh, uh, of Harris's work, as well as uh, how it led to at least some part of my work. and. Uh, so I hope it's not too specialized for you. Uh, hierarchical structure of sentence description. Uh, I will have an introduction and a uh, uh, few specific works that I was involved in one form or another. Uh, I had a section on relation to categorical grammars and dependency grammars, but that has been covered quite a bit by Dick Early. And so since I may run out of time anyway, so I may skip that <laughs> and then there's somebody. So in many of his writings, Harris pursued a strategy of eschewing as much hierarchical structure as possible. Uh, I don't think he actually said in any published work in exactly these words, but it, it was clear that that was uh, one of the things he was trying. So therefore, one could ask the question, how much hierarchical structure is necessary for sentence description? Of course, the first thing is you have to make sure, is this a well-posed question? Uh, actually, it's not quite well-posed because a sentence can be arbitrarily long, and therefore it can have arbitrarily, uh, arbitrary amount of structure. So there is a trivial answer that there is no upper bound on the structure required for a given sentence. Uh, perhaps a well-posed version of this question is how much structure within some minimal constructions and uh, how to distinguish hierarchy within minimal constructions and hierarchy due to recursion. Uh, this is actually implicit in a lot of Harris's work indirectly, although it's not said quite in that way. So what I will do is to present a, or tell you uh, a range of results uh, with respect to well-posed versions of this question. Uh, the origins of this work that I'm going to report, uh, this is reporting work means it's work done in the past, it's not reporting new work, uh, which is ordinarily the things we do in a uh, conference. Uh, so the origins of work have to do with some work of Harris during the period 57, 62, uh, Chomsky's 57 book on kernels and transformations my own work on Harris's project called Transformations and Discourse Analysis Project called TDAP from 58 to 70 and then subsequent work that I 
continued on my own. So let's take a, so we, we go back again, how, uh, how to characterize uh, natural language structures formally. This is all, I, I, uh, I have written these slides in a very informal way, so I hope uh, uh, you will accept that. So if you have a sentence, the cat has, has chased the rat, you would somehow like to be at least broken up into those little pieces, uh, chunks, the cat had chased the rat, where the extra annotations indicate that you know, they are noun phrases and verb, verb clusters and the whole thing is inside a clause. But there is, uh, we haven't showed any internal structure for these chunk, chunks and no attachment decisions and there is a very flat structure for the clause. Uh, so in fact, uh, in much of the early work uh, uh, of Harris and the one that I was involved, the perspective was that you simply take a sentence, break it into chunks there's no internal structure to those chunks and uh, flat structures and uh, attachment decisions are sort of left implicit and you'll see some examples. Now you might say, well, why uh, do this? Well, it, it's obvious that even if you have this much annotation, you, it is helpful to answer such questions as who did what to whom. In fact, the project that we, were, we started, the goal of the project to make automatic abstracts of technical papers, uh, which of course didn't happen because it was too big a problem. Uh, but it's interesting that many of the same applications currently are in vogue and people actually do this kind of analysis. They don't want to do the full parsing. So how do you do this simple annotation? I mean, simple uh, recognition. Obviously, if you just want to recognize the string finite state automaton is a possibility, but if you want that annotation, then you could use finite transducers. I'm not going to go into detail in that. So the input will be the cat has chased the rat, and the output will be that particular kind of annotation. Uh, so there is, uh, uh, the, now of course in this example, uh, the annotations have been shown by one single transducer, but this won't quite this will not be quite adequate because there is recursion, you have chunks inside chunks, so a single transducer won't be quite the right way to do it. And what is done is obviously you cascade these finite state transducers. That means you take an output of a one finite state transducer Ti and that becomes the input of some other transducer Tj. So you compose these finite state transducers Ti and Tj to get a, uh, to get a new one, and composition and other operations allow you sort of modular design. So in fact, this kind of architecture was there in the first parser that was written at Penn here in 58, 59, that I see here Lila Gleitman and Naomi Sager walked in who also belonged to that group at that time, uh, and I was involved <coughs> myself. And, uh, and there was a publication, informal publication of that in 1960, then I had a publication in 62, and at the anniversary of ENIAC in 1997, uh, uh, Hopley, an undergraduate student and myself, we re-implemented this uh, original parser, which is known by another title now, and that's been published. And so I'll give you the, an example from, this is an output of the Tunipars, but it's identical to the output of the original cascaded parser. And the example sentence is from a biology text, which was also an example sentence in the original. Nowadays, people also are extracting information from biological texts, so it's quite a coincidence. Uh, so we have found that subsequent addition of the second inducer to either system after allowing single induction to proceed for 15 minutes also results in increased reproduction of both enzymes both uh, enzymes. So there is a sequence of finite state transducers that identify noun phrase chunks such as V, subsequent addition, the second inducer, either system and so on. <coughs> then a <coughs> subsequent transducer uh, identifies the chunks uh, which are more like prepositional phrases such as of the second inducer uh, should use
one of these should work. And, uh, so something like here of the of the second inducer, where the second inducer is a noun chunk, and that's enclosed in those green. Oh, it's here. I think I'm just pointing the wrong way. Huh? <laughs> Oh, good, thanks. Second inducer. Uh, so that's done by the first, uh, uh, first transducer, and then these green brackets were put by the second transducer. Similarly, uh, this verb cluster, like have found or to proceed and results, is done by another, uh, another transducer. And then the identifying the clause, such as starting here, that subsequent subsequent addition of the second inducer to either system. And then there is an embedded clause here after allowing uh, single induction to proceed. And that's the end of that embedded clause. Somehow I'm having trouble. Uh, for uh, 15 minutes and so on until the end of the clause. Uh, so you can see that the uh, structures have very flat clauses and no attachment decisions are made. For example, uh, here, of the second inducer is one, ad uh, one adjunct and uh, to either system is sort of another, uh, another chunk, but in the representation there is no, uh, is, uh, no attachment decision has been shown these adjuncts are just coming one after the one after the other. I should speed up here. Uh, so the next step is, uh, which is really connected to the previous one, is the so-called string grammar, which is a description. Uh, string grammar, I think, retrospectively can be viewed as a description of the grammar that was implicit in the cascaded FSTs for shallow parsing. Uh, the original version of the string grammar and some of its variants are being used by Naomi Sager in her work since late 60s on information extraction. Uh, around 1967-68, uh, Kosaraju and Yamada and myself, we did a formal investigation of this class of grammars. The paper was submitted around 1966-67, but because of many uh, uh, scientific as well as the social aspects of the climate at that time, it didn't get published till 1972. Uh, a string grammar consists of a set of fi a, a finite set of elementary strings, uh, E, and these could be thought of as sort of elementary sentence forms. A subset of this set is called center strings, uh, and these will be sort of elementary sentence forms. Each elementary string has points of adjunction, one to the right and one to the left of each symbol. And uh, elementary or derived strings can be attached to these points of adjunction. And a string may consist a special symbol like say S, uh, which has no points of attachment, but it gets replaced by another string. So let's just look at this a very simple example. Uh, the people who read evening news, the people who read evening newspapers, I don't know why the N is in capital, uh, newspapers waste precious time. So here are some elementary strings, E1, just noun, verb, noun. Uh, the second is uh, a WH word, VN. Uh, third is determiner, a noun. So the idea is the, these are just flat strings. There is no hierarchical structure is shown uh, over that string. In fact, it's not even, it's even weaker than the standard dependency kind of relation where you would pull out the verb as the head and the two as dependents, but a flat structure. All it is saying is that if n, v, and n appear in that order, then that's one elementary object. And each element has left and right points of attachment. So these are, don't think of the L1 and R1 as some kind of non-terminals. They're just points of attachment. 
uh, to the left and to the right. <coughs> and then you pick one center string, which is sort of the initial starting point. So the derivation will be, uh, you start with the string uh, noun, verb, noun, that corresponds to people read, uh, I'm sorry, people waste time. <coughs> so that's E1. And then I, I won't go through the whole derivation, it's sort of obvious. Then E3 is the string that is determiner that's attached to the left of the first symbol in E1, which is N, which is the, which is the word people. So the attachment of the to people is shown by <coughs> E3 attached at the first symbol to the, attached to the left of the first symbol, and so on. And uh, this is, uh, uh, precious, the word precious, the adjective attached to the last noun of this on the left, and so on, and this is the embedding of the relative clause. So you can represent this derivation. This diagram doesn't appear in, uh, in Harry. This kind of formalization is what Kosaraju and Yamada and we did in 1970, I mean, the, in the published form in 1972. Of course, uh, you could have a symbol like an S, which is a replacement, which is not attachment. So in this case, John knows Bill left, so the, the string correspond to Bill left is, uh, is inserted or replaced, uh, which is shown here. So the point for to note here is that there is no hierarchical structure in the elementary trees. Attachments at the points of adjunction uh, Attachments at the points of injunction do not create a, a phrase structure like hierarchy. Uh, of course, there is hierarchy in the derivation. Now, if you have multiple attachments at the same point of adjunction, uh, uh, so suppose there are two, two adjectives, A1 and A2, are attached to the left of the first symbol here, uh, then the order in which they will be attached will be uh, that A1 will be attached first, and then A2 will be attached next, because we, uh, because after, at, after attachment of A1 to the left of uh, N, uh, the new string still has the, uh, the, the new, s in, in, in the new string, uh, the symbol N has still the left attachment point. So the order in which they will be attached will be a1 first and then A2 next. So the scope order is sort of implicit in the, in the derivation. Uh, uh, maybe I should skip this here. Uh, the replacement is, a, is like a phrase structure uh, rewriting rule. So you can see that uh, what is being done here is that there is some distinction being made between the hierarchies that are uh, created apparent hierarchies created in the endocentric type of constructions versus from exocentric constructions. Any uh, uniform way of composing elements, say as in phrase structure grammar, conflates these sources of uh, hierarchies. So therefore, in that framework, the question of how much structure is necessary uh, cannot be investigated uh, properly. Uh, this I can go fast because this is just a uh, way of saying how the idea of tree adjoining grammars, you know, can be seen as a continuation of the same kind of ideas as before. So you uh, replaced elementary strings by elementary uh, structures. Now adjoining is now uh, redefined on the nodes labeled by non-terminals and not on the left and right points of adjunction and substitution as before. But one thing we have retained, namely the hierarchical structure due to recursion has been factored away. So now we can ask the question, how complex the hierarchy has to be with inside a clause? And as you know, much of the linguistics effort right now is uh, really devoted to this question in one form or, uh, one form or uh, another. Uh, so the idea is that the complexity of hierarchical structure is to be located at the level of elementary structures and much of the linguistic activity is really there. So this idea of sort of make the, local, make the initial structures more complex, so, so in a sense we have gone in the opposite direction. So instead of making the elementary structures too simple, we have made them more complex, but as a result, 
lots of new results come out. And since my time is going fast, I will just flash these things. People have seen uh, the clear joining grammar, so I won't bother you with that. Uh, just tell you uh, that uh, in this kind of system, there are two kinds of derivations. One is the derivation tree, namely how the elementary trees are put together. And the other construct is uh, the derived tree, namely the actual tree that is the derived. And uh, some of the remarks uh, that, uh, <coughs> uh, that uh, uh, Dick Early made were connected with that. So maybe I'll go back, oh, no, I'm sorry. So I, I, skipped, uh, I, I skipped, there, uh, uh, skipped there an example. <coughs> but this is the derivation tree that corresponds to a sentence like, who does Bill think Harry likes? Uh, where each one of these nodes is labeled by, a, the, labeled by the name of the tree or name of the elementary object that is associated with that lexical item. <coughs> And then the idea is that, of course, if you carry out these operations, you get the, uh, you get the, you get the actual uh, string, but the compositional semantics is to be derived, is to be defined on this object. <coughs> uh, and it's clearly related to the dependency diagrams. Uh, so once you take this perspective, other opportunities arise. Namely, you can view this composition in, uh, so let me just uh, go to directly to an example instead of, so suppose we uh, take a elementary tree corresponding to likes, which is this topicalized structure, sort of who John likes. And then there is a tree that corresponds to think, so it will be like Bill think. And the one way of composing is, is to take this tree and adjoin it here or insert it here. But we can view this composition also another way, namely pretend as if this tree corresponding to who John likes is really made of, out of two, where this lower part is attached here and the upper part is attached here. So this means this composition can go either this way, this composing with this, or these two parts, which are really part of the same tree, composing with this. So this is what I call as the non-directional composition. You can make it go either way you want. Uh, <clears throat> and one thing to note is, at least in this example, is clear. This attachment is doing the predicate argument uh, relation composition because uh, this is an argument for the verb think. So this attachment, its semantics is predicate argument composition, while attachment of this here is kind of a scope scope uh, information. And uh, uh, so it turns out, I'm just going to tell you this, I'm not going to show you, that the factoring of the hierarchy as, the, as I did it, namely factoring, uh, locate the hierarchy, ask the question, how much hierarchy is required in the elementary structures? Uh, factoring the hierarchy in that way, factoring of the hierarchy of the minimal structures from the hierarchy uh, due, to, uh, due to recursion. And of course, those two operations, it turns out that the resulting systems are weakly equivalent to tag, but with more strong generative power, and they are capable of describing complex word orders, scope orders, and so on. Uh, I'll, I will skip the scope example and just go to the summary. So we started out with this question, how much hierarchical structure is necessary? We took a well-posed version of the question by factoring recursion, and that's the key idea, and that sort of pretty much comes from the, uh, some of the early work on cascaded uh, finite state transducers and the string grammars, and hierarchy within minimal structures and hierarchy due to recursion. And in, 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 in answering this question, we are led to a wide range of formal mathematical, linguistic, computational, and psycholinguistic results, I, I didn't present any of these here, but I want to sort of, I put that in there to just of, sort of tell you that at least in my work, uh, these early ideas uh, that uh, we pursued from uh, some, uh, some, uh, some basic Haitian ideas have actually paid off in a significant way. Thank you.
Okay. Any questions? <laughs> Of natural language processing to access and display of medical information. Uh, she has a long history here at the University of Pennsylvania, which I won't go into in detail, though <laughs> I could from my notes here. She, she um, uh, was involved with the PARSA project that I mentioned earlier with Arvind Joshi. Um, and her co-presenter -pre uh, is Ngo Tengyan. Um, Professor Ngo is uh, working especially on the automation of aspects of the Linguistic String Project, the LSP at uh, NYU which were very labor-intensive, manually labor-intensive, uh, during the development phase. Uh, this very important work on um, semantic pattern collection from clinical data, dictionary consistency and updating the dictionary, error checking and recovery, system analysis, robust parsing using graded acceptability, very important for Harrisian grammar. Um, many other issues there. The chapter, uh, chapter four in volume two that they co-wrote is the computability of strings transformation in sublanguage. And here to talk about from text to information by computer is Naomi Sager and later Ngo Tengyan. Okay. Someone once remarked, is that too loud? No? Someone once remarked, the trouble with Harris is that he is 30 years ahead of his time. In, the, in respect to the computer processing of language, I think you could add at least a decade. As we heard from Avan Joshi, in 1959, a group led by Harris demonstrated for the first time that language structure is computable by producing a program that did it. And this on the, and this on the UNIVAC 1 with 1,000 words of memory. But Harris's contribution to what has become the technical discipline of natural language processing goes far beyond that first proof of possibility. It lies in his methods of analysis, in his commitment to tease out of the data of language the secret of how it carries information. This focus on observables, and in particular, on the combinations of elements that characterize language at different levels of description led Harris to major discoveries in linguistics and finally to a penetrating theory of language and information such that finally it becomes clear how language could have developed as a self-organizing system. We in computation have not been able to use all of Harris's discoveries. At least my project hasn't. But several results have provided the basis for a system that converts text documents into an informational representation sufficient for practical applications. In the NYU string project, we draw upon linguistic string analysis, transformations, and sublanguage grammar, this being the title of our article in the book we're celebrating today. Back to string analysis. Arvind Joshi gave you a good theoretical basis. I'm going to speak much more simply about it. String analysis sees the sentence as composed of word strings, somewhat similar to grade school parsing. The word strings are grammatically represented as elementary strings of word classes, or parts of speech, with simple rules of combination. Elementary strings can enter other elementary strings in stated positions before or after particular elements or at any inter-element point in other strings, according to their type, type of a junction. As you can see in these examples, 
String analysis solves several problems in traditional noun phrase, verb phrase grammar. For one, modifiers at a distance. Here, who had chest pain is clearly a modifier of patient, but it is not inside the subject noun phrase. Another problem that it solves is modifiers of the whole sentence that can occur at various points, like today she had cough, no cough, she today had no cough, she had no cough today, and so forth, which also does not fit conveniently into noun phrase, verb phrase grammar. String analysis has no problem with these because all relations are between strings. Who had chest pain is a string adjoined to patient was admitted with special reference to a particular member of that string. Most important for computation is the fact that all constraints between sentence words are between words in one elementary string or between words related by a junction. That's a very powerful uh, help to computation. It turns out that for a computer to arrive at a grammatically correct parse reflecting the intended meaning requires hundreds of such constraints. Of course, to find which particular strings compose the given sentence, the string parser has to make its way through all possible string adjoinings permitted by the string grammar. The record of the path through the grammar is conveniently kept in the form of a parse tree in which strings of like positional word class occurrence are grouped together. All strings of the assertion type, for example. Despite the tree form, this is still a string parse. The elementary strings are routinely reached as the core values of the elements of the grouped strings. For example, the subject groups many elements of a elementary center string. But by defining routines that go from the higher level grouping to the what we call core, like she, core of verb has, core of verb cough, we retain the string character which is so important for applying all the rules. The parse tree, as we have defined it, is composed entirely of these string modules, which makes for an orderly application of the grammatical rules. Now I switch somewhat to another aspect of uh, Harris's work, which we have been able to exploit. In the 1950s, Harris, in fact, the early 1950s, Harris turned his attention from the structure of sentences to the structure of discourse. In order to find that structure and to align the particular word occurrences, that is actual words, morphemes, through the course of a text, he formulated a system of grammatical paraphrases in the set of sentences. The familiar active passive, but also nominalizations and so forth. He called these transformations for their similarity to mathematical transformations. A further step showed that such changes in form not only occurred in the set of sentences, but provided a means of constructing a complex sentence from transformed elementary sentences. It was possible then for us to see elementary strings as the resultants of transformations operating on elementary sentences. The string parse provided a first step toward towards informational units by identifying the words that belong together in elementary strings. The transformations enabled the identification, the identified word strings of the parse to be converted to the elementary assertions of the sentence. That's a step towards getting the informational units in the sentence. 
For example, here, a conjunction expansion transformation fills in the understood words, or to use Harris's expression, zeroings, to provide a more regular form for the information. String, string analysis and transformations identify fact units in sentences, assertions, but do not yet characterize them in terms specific to the subject matter. Harris showed that word choice in scientific fields followed quasi-grammatical rules. In a patient document, the kind of work that we've been doing, you can find patient had cough, but not cough had patient, even though both are NVN structures. Of course, there could exist the cough had patient in its grip, but this you will not find in a clinical document. Sublanguage word classes in a scientific or technical sublanguage reflect the objects of inquiry. The patterns of the word classes reflect the statements made about them. That's the contribution of sublanguage grammar, at least in a technical field. For example, as we see here in medicine, not only a noun, tense, verb, noun, but we have the sub-statement type that a patient in the patient class, have, have class, and the symptom class is the statement in the sublanguage grammar. The notation here, H indic, H indicates the healthcare sublanguage, and indic is our symptom class uh, way of talking about disease indicators. As in language as a whole, a sublanguage class is formed by words that occur in similar environments. Here, a diagnostic environment patient develop begins the, the development of the class H indic, the symptom class, as you can see here. Moving to the statement type, a statement type is formed of these sublanguage word classes occurring in syntactic relation. Now, we found that clinical statement types comprise a computable structure for holding patient information from free text documents. So here you see a, so to speak, flattened patient description statement type, including some of its important modifiers. To run over briefly the sublanguage grammar of the healthcare field, we identified some 40 word classes divided into areas. Some referred to the patient, patient areas in the patient, functions, physiological functions, measurements, parts of the body, and so forth. These, the former were usually subjects of uh, elementary assertions. In the result area, we have diagnoses, our indic, the symptom class, normal indications, test results, response, various kinds of change classes. Um, some of the um, elementary assertions are often accompanied by the test that gave the finding, various kinds, the clinical examination, the uh, things like x-rays and ultrasounds, procedures, specimens, and so forth. The treatment error, the treatment uh, sub subclass sort of signals a different um, kind of statement. Okay, the next. Uh, important to all of the statement types is the time area. The uh, distinction between the beginning, the end of an event, the location and time, duration, repetition, and so forth. Absolutely essential is the ability to distinguish a positive from a negative finding, also to indicate uncertainty, and finally to tie the facts together with the uh, connectives, which here a few examples are shown. These sublanguage classes function during processing to resolve ambiguities. For example, by matching subclasses in conjunction constructions. 
Here on the top example, growth is a function in growth and development. However, in the second example, growth is a disease indicator in no growth or masses felt. Similarly, in cases of syntactic ambiguity, we match subclasses to resolve the um, ambiguity. Here, swelling in knees and hands. The hands and knees are both in the patient part. We match them. The second example, swelling in knees and fever, it's the swelling and the fever that match. We would not like to uh, generate, by analogy, swelling in fever, just because they have the same syntactic form. In the case of resolving ambiguities of conjunction, it is not always the so to speak, head noun that is involved. You would not find a statement, the patient had an arm, a loss, and a breathing. But you would find the patient maybe had swollen arm, weight loss, and rapid breathing. So in this case, the uh, arm, for example, gets its um, sublanguage status from its modifier, swollen. In the case of the um, weight loss, uh, we give it a neutral computed attribute a result because weight loss might be a problem or it could be a, an improvement depending on what the situation was. It helps to break the linguistic processing into components. First, to do string parsing. We'll, we'll follow the English line. Then to resolve ambiguity using sublanguage co-occurrence or selection classes. Then to obtain the underlying assertions by transformation. Then to obtain a more regular form for the connection, connectives. And then to represent the particular statement type that is involved in the assertion, which we put into what we call an information format, which is then input to an application in here, the in-context or IC viewer. Similar languages can share a great deal of the grammar. We actually obtained our French parsing grammar by an update to the English grammar, you know, adjectives from the, the left to the right and things like that. Um, the co-occurrence patterns that resolve ambiguity are virtually the same in these languages. And after transformations, the same components can be used without any difficulty. Well, we are almost there. Strings, transformations, and sublanguage processing result in an informationally structured text, but not yet a labeling of its parts in terms the user may require. While for processing, the word pneumonia is simply a noun with a lot of grammatical attributes and the sublanguage class, H diag for diagnosis, the physician may want to view its occurrences in patient documents in relation to the anatomic system involved, hierarchically perhaps down to the lung, or by implicated body region, or by disease process, by organism, or by disease group. Using such an enriched dictionary, the representation of a process sentence, you will be pleased to know, not the one seen by the user, is now enriched. It has embedded tags on the words carrying the kind of information that we saw on the previous slide. The tags are inserted using the web-based extensional extensible markup language, XML. Well, if the user doesn't see this, what does a user see? The intent here is to enable the clinician to get at the, doc the content of documents in a way that is convenient in the way that a clinician thinks. And this snapshot from the IC viewer at the top of the large window, you see that patient HH1234 had 14 documents they are on view. In the middle band above, the physician has chosen anatomic system as a way to organize the presentation. 
again, in this window, choosing the diagnoses to be presented by the anatomic system, has chosen, he or she, cardiovascular system. Now, all of these things mentioned on this line were actually mentioned or their synonyms mentioned in those 14 documents. This poor individual had a lot of problems in the cardiovascular area. But the ones that are in green here are negative, denied or whatever, and that is percolated up through the documents so that immediately you can see that this patient has not angina pectoris, not ischemia. For example, from the statement in 99, no acute ischemic infarcts were identified, where ischemic is clearly a synonym of ischemia. However, for peripheral vascular disease, there were five positive assertions. For example, they stated that they felt that his fall was related to peripheral vascular disease. Well, linguistic processes was needed because when you see always on the right the context for what you have pulled out on the left, the actual sentence was rather complex. They stated that they felt that his fall was likely secondary to his weakness and decreased endurance secondary to whatever, <laughs> as well as related to his peripheral vascular dis disease, from which we got, they stated that they felt that his fall was related to peripheral vascular disease. So in this application, this, the linguistic processing with the tagging functions as a kind of elaborate index to the findings. Currently, we are working with a large medical center that captures over a million text documents a year. Physicians are clamoring for timely, selective access to the information in the documents. Possibly, hopefully, linguistic processing can answer their needs. In conclusion, I would like to say that Harris's linguistics is not only sound and profound, it works. Now, with the few remaining, I think I have left enough time for my colleague to give you just a little bit of liveliness on the uh, viewer to show what the linguistic processing can do. I think we have just a few minutes before the discussion. Two minutes? Hmm? Two and then discussion. We've got to move fast. Um, we call it the IC Viewer is a browser tool which reads from the database of information units. These units were analyzed by the natural language processing from the patient document uh, just described by Dr. Sager. Um, it allowed, uh, the viewer allowed physicians to design their own template and queries. For example, in this summary sheet, um, we, uh, we show the patient JJ1234 with 92 documents. And each document has a, uh, is a discharge summary and the date where the document was made. So uh, the 92 document is shown here. Uh, and then when you go into the patient 1234, then uh, we can go into, uh, uh, for example, the problem list. The problem list, when you go into the uh, cardiovascular area and uh, uh, look at the congestive heart failure, you can see that uh, the, the date is shown here uh, as uh, July 26, 2002, as con congestive heart uh, failure flare and where the, the document is coming from. If we look at the... Uh, uh, coronary uh, artery disease. Uh, all the uh, sentence mentioned in here is shown by whatever happened on the left hand side. Oh. Sorry. Uh, for example, um, uh, on um, October. Uh, the coronary uh, artery disease, which was normal, uh, is, uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened here. Um, 
And then uh, you can see that uh, the cat is also mentioned in this uh, uh, listed on here because of the tagging system that we have. Uh, let me uh, get out of the problem list and uh, if it, since we have only a few minutes, we go into the medication area. The medication is organized according to the standard organization. And if you look at the cardiovascular agents, you will see uh, uh, metoprolol, for example, you can see that uh, Topro uh, XL 5 milligram has the metoprolol as the uh, generic uh, 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 class of uh, medicine. Uh, let's get out of the uh, medication, then we go to allergy. Allergy, then we see uh, the medication allergy and the uh, plant and food uh, allergy. Here in drugs, uh, here in drugs, you see that uh, on, uh, in, uh, in year 2000, the, the doctor says that there was no known drug or food allergy, and yet uh, and yet there was, uh, uh, in 1997, it said that he has been intolerant to the metro methotrexate shot in the past uh, uh, as, uh, as, um, as stated above. So um, uh, in, in, in any case, uh, if the, 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 the uh, physician has all the documents that he, he has to read, like 92 documents at the same time, five minutes before they meet the, the, the patient, this is uh, the kind of information that he might need. It. So I want to stop here because uh, probably we're out of time. No discussion? You're all convinced? <laughs> Steve? Funding. <laughs> I think the system really is pretty well put together now. We can do hundreds of documents and we do get quite good quality assurance and we assure ourselves that it's always visible in its real context so that we're not, uh, you know, I'm not going to get sued for malparsing or something like that. <laughs> How about different domains? For example, I worked for Cisco Systems at Purdue. We'd love to have this for network management to make the internet work better. Let them write the sublanguage grammar. Yeah, we found really that uh, we needed a lot of detail in the medical world in order to make something useful. It took some, quite a number of years, as you can imagine, to get through the linguistics of parsing and all the rest of it, but you could not get to an application with that alone. You really need a wealth of knowledge from the area of application. However, we feel that the basic uh, parsing and all the rest of the stuff that we build into it is a good base for any other kind of sublanguage application. For the moment, medicine is big enough. <laughs> uh, our next speaker, Fernando Pereira, is the um, Let's see, am I skipping something here? Three, four, I'm skipping Steve. Steve, where are you? Where is, where is my page for Steve? Well, Steve seems to have dropped off my map here. Um, my nec the next speaker is Stephen Johnson, who is at uh, Columbia University in medical informatics, uh, obtained his uh, degree there with, with a dissertation in 1986 in which he implemented a, um, um, an operator grammar in Prolog and demonstrated the extraction of information from a text with that. Uh, really uh, striking and uh, very powerful demonstration uh, at a very early stage there. In the, uh, just very shortly after the Grammar of English on uh, Mathematical Principles was published. So, Stephen Johnson.
about today. Many of you are familiar with it, but I'm going to uh, quickly give a review of it just to, so we can all be reminded of what the elements are. Uh, it, it's, it's a remarkable theory uh, that attempts to explain how human language carries information. There are three elements of it, dependency, likelihood, and reduction. So let's quickly go through all of those. Dependency shows, as we saw earlier in the talk by uh, early on categorical grammar, uh, how words are organized into a, a tree structure showing which depends on which. Uh, this particular type of diagram allows us to see how the sentences are, uh, have a linear order, but we see that the various type assignments, uh, the, the zero order words such as uh, John and Snow, uh, First order words, such as falls, which require uh, some of the noun arguments. And second order words, like knows, which uh, require uh, at least one sentential argument. Likelihood it, uh, looks at the individual pairs of operator and, ar and arguments and uh, observes that not all the combinations are equally likely. And uh, various ways can be uh, used to establish this through statistical means, psych psychology experiments, and so forth. So we have um, that decreasing likelihood for these pairs of a, a zero order, order argument and a, a first order uh, operator of snowfalls with relatively normal likelihood a somewhat stranger uh, uh, pair of air falls and then perhaps even stranger gravity falls and so forth. And that we can, the point is that we can uh, order these various pairs. What likelihood gives us is for a particular operator or you, you can think of the, uh, the range of arguments that occur with it and that range of arguments and their likelihoods establishes a, a core meaning for that operator. Conversely, for each argument words such as snow, the operators uh, that characteristically occur with that establish its meaning. The third uh, aspect of the theory is reduction. From this we get uh, uh, what are from base sentences, which are elementary sentences of simple words combined with these very simple relationships, dependency relationships, various redundancies can be compressed into the sentences that we observe in everyday language. So we have a sentence such as snow falls and rain falls. This can then be reduced into the more compact form, snow and rain fall. We won't have time to go into the details of operator grammar, but we still have a dependency structure here, but a, a somewhat anomalous thing. Uh, the uh, N arguments don't usually have operators, but now this compressed piece has been put in there. This is in fact the clue or the trace that reduction has occurred such that we can uh, reconstruct the original sentence. From uh, this, what we have here is a very minimal theory uh, of language. In fact, if you, as you read Harris, you begin to appreciate it's radically minimal. Some of the obvious things about the minimalism are that, uh, that in terms of the lexicon, the majority of the base words, the simple words of language, have a single type. So if you know the word, you know its type. Once you know the type of a word, you know the types of its arguments immediately. So that's, that's quite obvious from the diagrams I showed. What might not be quite so obvious is all the other parts of speech with which we are familiar, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and so forth, have to be derived from these more uh, primitive constructs. Even more interestingly is that all of phrase structure, which we see in conventional grammar, traditional grammar, how these phrases come together to form the syntax trees we're familiar with, all of this must be derived from this more uh, primitive operations. So many people are quite willing to accept at this point in linguistics that minimalism is a good thing with regard to syntax and that we should be looking at uh, quite compact theories. In reading Harris, not everyone realizes immediately though that there's something far more radical going on, which is that all of semantics, too, is carried by this theory as well. So in particular, we don't have uh, logical uh, formulas, we don't have axioms, and there are no rules of translation 
that can tra translate the sentences uh, from the structures we've seen into some other format of logic. And we've heard reasons for that in the lack of a meta language. The profound aspect of Harris's theory is that the semantics of language arises from the simple structures that I've shown you. Harris was very concerned with this methodologic issue of least grammar. So quoting as others have done earlier today, if we have some descriptions for the language, and these descriptions are in some sense adequate to characterize the utterances, and we'll look at a little bit more detail, what does adequacy mean? But these uh, two descriptions have different amounts of departures from equiprobability, so they're different somewhat in their complexity. We opt for the, the description that has the least such complexity. So that, that and similar statements are made throughout Harris's work. The extraordinarily difficult problem is to how to begin to operationalize that to quantify those things in, in practice. So in, uh, some of the recent work we've been doing at Columbia is trying to quantify operator grammar. Some of the questions here, there's, there's a very clear relationship between what Harris is talking about and in, in, in classic information sh theory of Shannon and all those that follow. But the exact correspondence has, uh, has been uh, not always clear. So how does operator grammar relate to information theory? Uh, particular things, uh, questions we might ask is, uh, how, how can we measure how much information is carried by a sentence? That's uh, a possible question. More interesting, though, is we're ta in talking about least grammar, well, how do we act go about actually measuring the size of a grammar? And then, what, given the ability to do that, how could we then compare two grammars in the way that Harris was suggesting? So on this slide, just to give a little bit of detail to show a correspondence between Harris's theory and information theory. On the left here, we have some of the, the pairs of argument words and operator words that I was discussing earlier of different likelihood values. This notation indicates that we have an argument word uh, X and an operator word that depends on it. So there's a syntactic relationship there of predicate and argument for these uh, uh, pairs here. Let's say then we have also some means of assigning a numeric value to the likelihood, uh, we can estimate the likelihood of these various pairs. So you could use statistical means, psychological experiments, and so forth. And let's say we wound up with these values that uh, Snow had a, a likelihood of 0 0.1, the next uh, pair, is 10 times less likely and gravity falls 10 times less likely than that. But obviously in practice these would not be the true values but you get the idea. From these probabilities, classic information theory tells us that if we take the base two log or the binary log, we take the negative uh, to get a, a positive number, we get these numbers here. What this number uh, measures is the number of bits uh, it would take to represent this probability. Now many people in linguistics have thought that well, I don't really care that there, this takes three bits, what use is that? And in information theory, conversely, they haven't been interested in linguistics. If we go further, um, I'll, I'll try to show what the correspondence is though. Uh, information for theory uh, further tells us that given this uh, range of distributions uh, on operator argument pairs and these probabilities, we can devise a coding scheme using uh, standard means such as Huffman codes and so forth, and we can actually construct the bit patterns that, uh, whose length will correspond to these numbers here, so four bits, seven bits, and 10 bits, respectively. So the point, you, the point here is that, uh, to give us an understanding of how, what does this have to do with meaning, for each unique uh, pairing of an operator and argument, we are able to construct a unique binary code that represents that meaning in some kind of space of possible meanings. So this, again, this begins to get at when we combine a predicate with a particular argument, we get a specific point of meaning is constructed. These uh, bit strings that we create uh, vary in length. So uh, in those that are, are highly likely are shorter than those that are more rare. But the point about this, constructing this uh, bit codes is uh, uh, not just to make them, but rather that they represent not just that they have a length, 
but they still encode the fact that there is a dependency. So they're, linguist, they're, they're codes that represent a linguistic structure. So this is the key point that Harris was showing. It's inf we, information theory will tell us how much information there is, but what Harris is showing us is that there's a structure as well. We can expand this beyond simple pairs by looking at larger sentences where we have an operator Y and, and uh, dependence trees uh, beneath these. We are various ways of obtaining the information from this, essentially obtaining the probability of the uh, operator and the heads of these trees and then recursively uh, obtaining the, the probability of the tree as a whole. Using information theory, we can construct some kind of, uh, of bit string that uniquely re represents the meaning of this sentence as a whole. But once again, it's not simply uh, just the bit string we're interested in. This bit string will, in some way, in the various ways of doing this, encode the structure of the tree. So we have a correspondence between structure and length and uh, the information content. Now, to return to some of the other questions we were asking, how do we use this theory in, in terms of uh, assessing the adequacy or describing the content of, of a corpus? So let's say that D is our data, our, which is a finite collection of utterances, our corpus, and we're interested in establishing a grammar G, which is a set of constraints on what can occur within that corpus. What we are now going to talk a bit about is this idea of how we measure lengths of these things. So let's do, talk about the notation uh, L of D, which is the, the length of the data under some encoding. We're, most of us are familiar with ASCII files, which are a, a bit representation of the text. For, uh, we have a unique binary code for each character, for example. So that's a very trivial way of encoding it, and we can measure the length of that. More interesting, though, is given a grammar, we look at the uh, redundancies and patterns in that grammar, the constraints on it, and we could talk of L of D given G, the length of the data given the grammar. When Once we uh, describe uh, data with a grammar, we're able to represent that data in a more compact way. So we can talk, in general then, if we have done a good job of finding con some constraints in the grammar, that the length of this new description using the grammar is smaller than the original length of just uh, taking the corpus as it was. So in this sense, there's a relationship between describing a linguistic corpus and compression. So another correspondence between the information theory people and, and linguistics. We also begin to get an idea of how could we compare one grammar to another. And this, again, this was, goes back to the slide talking about the adequacy of grammars. Let's say we have two grammars, G1 and G2. If we find that the, the length of uh, using G2 to describe uh, our corpus is larger than the other, then uh, G1 is a, a, a better description because it's finding more redundancy, more constraints, and it allows us to compress the data that much more. So that gives us part of the story, but what we haven't talked about is the idea of the size of grammars, we could, which we could represent as the length of the grammar. So uh, we have some, the, we won't go into what the grammar notations look like. We all have seen different kinds of grammars, whatever they are. There's, we can look at the number and the frequency of the symbols. We can look at the ways in which those symbols combine to form rules. We can look at how many rules uh, are necessary to describe. And we can use the various information uh, theoretic methods and come up, again, with a, a, a length of how large or complex that grammar is. One thing we see immediately from this point of view, and this is very much implicit in, in what Harris was talking about, is that talking about the structure of the grammar in this way is actually exactly the same way that we were looking at combining words to form sentences in the language. So let's try to bring these two pieces together. Let's say that we have two grammars and G1 is smaller than the other. It has fewer rules. It's a simpler system. But on the other hand, when we use G2, G2 is a better description of the data. It has more rules. It finds more patterns of redundancy in the corpus. So it, it, it has, it's, a, it, it's a better description because it's finding more of the uh, rules of affixes, of how modifiers work, and so forth, let's say. 
So to combine these two thoughts, one way is to sum them together. We sum how much compression we get, we sum how large the grammar is, and if the sum of these two is smaller, then G2 can be said to be a better description overall. So we're combining two notions here. One is, of course, as linguists, we always establish rules to describe a, a, a corpus, describe our data, and we want rules that do a better job of describing. The point Harris is making is we have to pay for that description. The bigger our grammar is, the more expensive it is. And ultimately, by summing together, we're trying to find the best buy. How can we uh, get the most effective grammar? This can be shown by, so the best grammar overall is what we, our ideal is, we want to find some uh, ideal G prime by finding the minimum G uh, that minimizes this sum. Uh, we don't have time to go into this, but what we've just described is called minimum description length. It was described by uh, Norma Riesenen. It's a very general method for any kind of data, not just for linguistic data. Uh, it's an outgrowth of uh, Kamalgarov complexity, uh, and so very much in the line of the uh, information theory uh, work. But it applies very nicely to this linguistic problem that Harris is describing. One of the nice things is that uh, you don't really need to uh, know uh, you, about statistics to use this. You can instead manipulate uh, bits by counting, by simply counting things. And what Riesenen has been able to show is you, in some sense, the, using the uh, formula on the previous screen, you get the best possible description of the data. And this is the most likely uh, uh, one for the data given. So a graphical way of looking at this is it's just meant to be descriptive. Let's look at the complexity of the grammar, starting from a grammar with no rules and getting increasingly complex. If we have no rules at all in the grammar, point A here, we are uh, saying that it's whatever, however large our data was to start with. It has some, our data has some size with no rules at all. We've not managed to compress it at all. That's how, that's how big it is. Now at the other extreme, let's say our grammar contained, basically regurgitates back our data set. It says the data consists of the data, and that's our, uh, that's our uh, de grammatical description. Then we can com essentially compress our original corpus to zero, but now, we're, again, we're paying for a very expensive grammar, and at point C, we see we wind up back where we started with. We've simply described the corpus as itself and not really got anywhere. Clearly, as linguists, what we're interested in is what's in between here. And uh, as the uh, minimum description length is telling us, we're trying to find the point that minimizes uh, that sum somewhere in between. However, if you look at the various grammatical theories that are out there, most of them are probably somewhere way beyond in this part of the curve. They're extremely complex theories. They have tremendous number of symbols and rules. They involve mapping to logic, which means we now have to pay the price for all of logic and all the explanation of how logic works, a very expensive price to pay. We did some simple experiment um, on the medical corpus. This is uh, just a part of our corpus, 1.5 million words. We did some part of speech tagging, so we assigned uh, traditional syntactic classes using the Brill tagger. We've developed a, a, a fairly simple dependency uh, parser using machine learning. It's not um, uh, uh, perfect, it's, it gets about 80% of the links right, but it's sufficient for the purpose of what we were trying to look at. We're just gonna do a simple comparison of various simple models of the data. These are not deep linguistic models, where we look at, well, what if we just looked at the frequency of letters in the text and used that as a model of text? Or looked at words and, and, and used that as a model of text? Or adjacent word pairs in the text? Or if we used uh, words and, together in some way with their uh, word type, which, which, which uh, words occur as verbs, which words occur as adjectives? And finally, we're going to look at, this is uh, not exactly Harris's likelihood, but we're going to look at operator argument pairs or, or head-dependent pairs in our dependency parsed corpus and see how that works. Very simple example. We uh, have the letters or the phonemes of the text. We estimate their probabilities. We use information theory to compute uh, codes for these, find their lengths. And now we get the two parts. Essentially, our, our uh, 
our codes for each of the phonemes is our code book, or if you will, our lexicon that we're going to use. That's our grammatical theory, a very simple one, of how frequently letters occur. And then we're going to use this to encode our corpus in the way that Morse code would be used to, uh, to encode a large text. And as you know with Morse code, because E uh, is a very frequent letter and has a very short code, the text is uh, compressed. So we get these two pieces, the price that we're paying for our grammar, which is to model the frequency of phonemes, and then using the phoneme model to re reduce our corpus. How do these models work in practice? So one, one of the issues is as you uh, increase your corpus in size, uh, you, you're going to get different numbers. So we're not interested in the exact number of bits. That's not interesting. We're interested in the behavior of the curve. Very briefly, phoneme model or letter model, fortunately for linguistics, doesn't work very well. It's expensive. This is how, many, this is how much uh, total cost we have, the description length I talked about. Words, or this purple line here, uh, do much better. So if I look at word frequency, because there's a, uh, words uh, don't have every combination of letters, there's a redundancy there that words capture is a better model. And words pairs do the best. What we find, though, is unfortunately in this sort of simple uh, representation of likelihood of operator argument or head-dependent combinations, uh, likelihood doesn't do quite as well, but certainly much better than words by themselves. We can improve upon this dependent, simple dependency model that I've shown you in several ways. We can handle uh, simple things like orthography in the, in the text, uh, morphology. As we, we did various things, as you improve, fix some of the errors of the uh, dependency parser, you get better results. As you bring content words together, there are various ways of representing a dependency grammar. As you bring nouns close to verbs and, for, and get the, some of the function words out of the way in the dependency analysis, you also get uh, better results. Very much a validation of Harris's theory as you, if you can reduce the tremendous variation in the number of dependents in, a, in, uh, in these trees by various means, you get a, a much better result. And even more so, uh, if you begin to apply various reductions to these trees, reshaping them, uh, but then you have to pay the price for each reduction, you can also uh, get uh, better results. So what we are able to do so far is we can approximate the information content of sentences by finding the operator argument structure and by looking at approximating the, the likelihood, which is the uh, information content of how, mu what, how much information the predicate says about the argument, how they come together. Using these kinds of techniques, you have a semi-automated means of discovering grammars. The linguist has to think up these frameworks and rule systems and so forth. But the computer can help in several ways. One, to help validate how expensive is this particular theory? How well does it perform? The machine learning, as we'll hear about later, uh, is also very amenable uh, in this approach to help discover new ways, what kinds of transformations work best. This is something a computer can help with. One of the very interesting things that begins to result from this is that if you sort of take this information theoretic approach, the grammar is essentially uh, has to be packaged in with uh, the rest of the text. What this allows us to do is, is to uh, a new approach to grammar by formulating grammar rules by example. Uh, just to, uh, to wrap up, what, uh, by bringing together information theory with uh, traditional uh, grammatical approaches, we have the possibility of a rigorous method for evaluating linguistic theories. However, the simple experiments that we're showing where you actually try to measure these things with real text is, this is, is uh, really showing that the grammars we're using, if they're going to really show that they can do better than a simple phony model, the grammars must be extremely minimal. We have to be extremely frugal with how we spend on our grammars. Also, to get any kind of reasonable results, you have to look at an enormous corpus. You can't do linguistics of this type by looking at something uh, small. Uh, finally, this uh, type of work begins to suggest various novel approaches by a very strongly corpus-based uh, approach to grammatical theory. Thank you. <laughs> Question. Uh, 
I, I think it's implicit in this information theoretic approach. We were looking with our corpus how frequently, say, phonemes occur, and then they, uh, more frequent phonemes would get a shorter length and longer ones. So it's a very simple way of looking at language, but it's better than just taking the corpus as it was. Uh, and you saw with the curve there that it doesn't do as well as a theory that takes more of the redundancy into, of language into account, such as using words, word pairs, and as we go to larger and larger grammatical structures, taking, fi exploiting more of the redundancy. Well, in the part of resonance theory I, I'm looking at, the more re recent work, his work is, is trying to help us deal with a problem that's been in linguistic for a long time, which is what, what class of models works best? And so what I was trying to show here is I have more and more powerful families of models that I could apply. You, of course, could pick an extremely powerful model. You'll compress your data a lot. What, uh, his uh, theory is showing is, but you then have to pay the price for the complexity of that model. So you don't know, you, uh, in the more uh, recent work of, the, of in his work on stochastic complexity, you actually determine the model not from the universal encoding, but from the data itself. So you look at the data itself and you then discover for that set of data, which model uh, most effectively encodes it. Yes, uh, and this really explicitly shows that the, the, the grammar uh, has to be directly encoded essentially with the data in order to get good compression. I'm sorry I, I had to make this change because I, I, in the meanwhile I changed my slides as I was hearing, listening to some previous talk. Um, so what I'm going to do here is to give a, a highlight of a couple of uh, points uh, in my paper in the volume and make some additional remarks. And there were lots of things during this morning I said, oh, I should have thought about adding something on this and something on that. Well, of course, I only have 20 minutes. So um, I'm going to be uh, try uh, just touch on a couple of points. Uh, the paper has quite a few others that uh, are not discussed, uh, that uh, I won't have time to discuss. The way I approach this, uh, and, and, and I, I have to thank a number of people that got me in this direction, is that uh, um, I, I did a lot of work in the 80s in, uh, in various kinds of logical models uh, in, in language, the kind of uh, models that our, the previous speaker was uh, uh, somewhat criticizing, and I think very rightly so. Uh, I also then got into speech recognition in the probabilistic models, and I kind of, people ask me, are you a traitor to the sort of this other tradition? And I say, well, I don't know, it's just that these two things live in, uh, appear in my life, and uh, I, I don't quite know wh uh, which, what to think, you know, Wednesdays and Fridays I think one thing, and um, Mondays and uh, Tuesdays, uh, you know, the other days I think something else. Uh, so, uh, and some uh, coll former colleagues at AT&T, in particular Don Hindle, um, because of this sort of these two areas in which I had been working, got me uh, reading uh, Harris and you know making comments about how some of the things I was asking about could be um, uh, in could be seen in his work in a much better way than in sort of the uh, the, the sort of the background uh, that I was uh, familiar with until then. Um, so the, the divide that I'm going to address here is this sort of divide that just influenced a lot of all of computational linguistics is between the sort of the Shannon uh, way of, at Mark of Shannon way of thinking about language, which led then to, in, uh, to some of, in fact, some of the work in machine translation in the 50s, for example, and then 
uh, the sort of generative tradition uh, that uh, has uh, kind of become uh, quite dominant in academic linguistics, um, which focuses on uh, grammars as, as cognitive uh, um, pieces of cognitive apparatus, uh, which uh, define the class of possible natural uh, language, uh, the class of possible natural languages. Um, now, most of you, I'm sure, have seen before. Uh, and what I'm going to focus on is the words in red. Uh, in any statistical model from grammatical, uh, from uh, these two sentences, one and two, will be ruled out on identical grounds. Uh, now, this is a challenge to empiricism. It's also a challenge to things like discovery procedures. You know, if you have never seen a certain linguistic event, say, like, the words in uh, the previous speaker, you had the word, the combination of words, uh, gravity, false. So you have never seen that, that those two words together. What do you do? I mean, what, what, does, the, what does the linguist do or what does the, the human language user do to, re to decide what is the, what are these two words that should go together? Uh, um, and, uh, now, Chomsky says, well, if you've never seen them, you've never seen them. Uh, I'll uh, give you a, a, different a different answer. Now, one thing has happened in the last 20 years, driven mainly by the development of speech recognition, uh, uh, algorithms and techniques, uh, which came from the information theoretic tradition. Uh, is the discovery that even very simple models of language, and completely wrong models of language, much simpler in some sense than the one that we were talking about, uh, hearing about before, um, can capture a surprising fraction of the information, then predictability in language. Uh, and, these, and furthermore, these techniques have been very effective uh, in speech recognition, these days in parsing, uh, and in making decisions, for instance, about part of speech just tagging and synthesis integration, machine translation. And so one question to ask is why do these things work? I mean, certainly do not, they are typically not informed by the kind of linguistic considerations that we've heard this morning. Uh, but they, as engineering, at least, they work remarkably well. Uh, now, one observation is that even if I don't have a, theory, a grammar or a theory of, or even an understanding of what constraints apply to language, these departures from equiprobability that were just mentioned before, uh, which are core to Harris's thinking, uh, are visible to you, visible directly to you. That's what justifies things like discovery procedures. You can look at these the, this uh, linguistic material and find that certain co-occurrences are more frequent than others. Uh, and such, so they can be estimated, not exactly, but they can be estimated by simple counting. So I can count words in text, say, and get some information about what the text is about, even though I might not be able to assign a structure, for instance, for the sentences. Um, so a kind of an example of this, and in fact sort of very related in some way to the previous talk, is this uh, ob observation that, um, so there, was this, uh, there were these experiments of, of many people uh, on trying to find what, what's the entropy of English? Uh, how many bits do I need per character to code up English? Now, um, the, those ex the experiments that were done suggest something like 1.34 bits per character. That's the lowest number that uh, I know of. Now, uh, a very simple compression algorithm, which is much, you know, not nearly as good, say, as something like Ziv Lempel, um, gives you 4.43 bits per character. Uh, a simple second order Markov model trained from a large collection uh, on words, from a large, trained from a large collection of text gives you 1.75 bits per character. That is, from something which is just about list, which is very simply listing uh, frequent substrings of the text to something that, you know, is based on a lot of statistics of word co-occurrence, but, uh, um, but nothing more than that, 
you, you, most of the information that seems to be in text can be obtained. So that there's, there's a, that gap between 175 and 134 is still substantial, but is much smaller than the, the, preview, the gap above it. And this is without constructing any model like the So one actual, one interesting question regarding to the previous talk is, if I were to compare that model with a model like this, what would I find? It's an extremely interesting question as to where the information in an encoding of language resides. Does it reside in particular in the way you put words together or does it reside in the lexicon and the distribution of words and how much is in each place? That's a sort of one of the, the interesting research questions in the, uh, that one could consider following up from the previous talk. Now, but going back now from this, these results, I, I cheated here somehow. When I say a second order mo Markov model on words, so a model that deals with triples of words, I didn't say what, to you what I do if I, I'm looking at some new text and the, the, I find a triple of words that I've never seen before. Now, and that's exactly what Chomsky's implicit assumption in that quote was, that any model of language, any model of grammaticality must assign zero probability to unseen events. Because probability, how do I compute probabilities? I compute ratios of observed frequencies. However, we know now that any model like that is going to seriously overfit the data. It's going to say what can happen is only, is the only things that can happen are those that I've, I've seen before. And they will occur in the ratios that I've seen before. Uh, now, because language has many, many rare events, there are words that are infrequent, there are word combinations that are infrequent in any finite sample, in any experience of any language user, there are going to be events that we'll now see, but which will come up just in the next five minutes. Uh, a model that does this simple counting cannot generalize to this unseen data, to this new data. And I'll, I'll get to the last point later. So the Markov model, the simple Markov model that we saw before, and the thing that in fact was, in, I think, in Chomsky's, in the back of Chomsky's mind as he was writing that, is just a record of observations. So we cannot re generalize to new observations of a type you haven't seen before. But one thing we can do with probabilistic models, I'll give you, is to not only have the sort of an, a record of observations, but also have certain latent states. In fact, in, in many models in psychology, people have been using latent, latent variables since I don't know when, in the 30s maybe, uh, um, which correspond to representations of, inf of pieces of information that you don't have direct access to. For instance, past experience of a different kind or uncertainty that a language user might have about what the correct grammar is, or uncertainty about uh, the, how to interpret an experience, whether it's a linguistic experience, how to interpret this sentence, or a, a physical experience of other, another kind. So all of that type of information, which is not expressed in the, the directly in the linguistic experience, could be relevant to assign the probability to new unseen events. Uh, and one thing which is very interesting uh, is that these, even though these, very, these, all, these latent states, these hidden states and the hidden variables, hidden choices cannot be observed, you can still estimate their effect in the, on the observables purely from observed data. So I did a little experiment. Um, this is, uh, I took the following. I got myself a large amount of text and I constructed a model of that text which says, what's, it's a, a pure first order Markov model on words. Uh, but is a, uh, so, uh, which, but, so I'm going to look at the probability of word at position I plus one given the word at position I, but rather than just counting how many times did I see that pair of words, I'm going to construct a slightly a model that has 
a hidden uh, variable C, uh, which corresponds to some choice that the language user is making that I don't see. So, and I'm going to assume that the, my, the probability of the word at position I plus one, given the position I, is, um, it can be factored as uh, the, pro the sum of products over there. So basically is the sum over all possible values of the latent variable. So all, you can imagine all possible mental states, only 16 mental states. This is a very, very dumb language user. Uh, 16 overall possible states of the probability of the state given the word I've just seen. So I see a word, I toss some, some uh, multi-sided thing like a die, I get into, I, I choose which state, mental state I am in, and then given that mental state, I generate the next word. So this is a very naive language user. Now, I, so I estimate that model from uh, using a technique called the uh, uh, expectation ma ma maximization algorithm from a large amount of text. And then I find something kind of interesting. If I, using that model, so I can, using that model I can now assign probabilities to sequences of words, uh, simply by assuming a Markovian decomposition that the word is just, the probability of the current word just depends on the previous word. And I ask, what is the, uh, the ratio of the probability of the correct order of those words over the other word, the two sentences that, the two strings that Chomsky was talking about? Well, the correct order is five orders of magnitude more likely, according to this model, than the incorrect order. Now, furthermore, I don't ha didn't have this in the slide, I should have said it, I think it's in the paper. It's also orders of magnitude uh, higher than any permutation, not just that permutation, any permutation of those words. So, there's, there's something that doesn't quite agree with that statement in any model. So, I think what's the, le the lesson is a model, I mean, this is a toy, clearly. But I think the important lesson of this model is that uh, in say, in, and that's actually ties into the question I asked the previous speaker is, when I have a model of grammaticality that involves certain choices that are being made that are, are not overtly, for instance, choices with respect uh, to reduction that are not overtly, that cannot be read off, read off from the text in a deterministic way, how do I, use that, take that uncertainty into account uh, to, um, to assign probabilities to sequences. And in fact, by having cert certain latent variables, I can do a better job very often, uh, can compress better than if I don't have that uncertainty. That's a strange thing, it's also counterintuitive. If I throw uncertainty into my model, I can actually do a better job of compressing than if I don't. And I have other work, much more, you know, you know uh, heavy duty work where this technique is used to get models of, say, word sequences, generalizations of Markov models that perform much better that, uh, than simple Markov models. Now, so why does this work? Uh, when this class conditional probabilities, this con uh, this uh, condition, this conditioning on this mental, this sort of hidden quote mental state, uh, is is really a way of factoring departures from equitability into roughly uniform word classes. I didn't say what those word classes are. Those, but if you look at the, if you look at the the actually underlying distributions of con probability of word given class and probability of class given word, you actually can identify certain classes. For instance, all the determiners go together. It, now, and this in fact is a cheat here that I did, I kind of been hiding until now, which is why 16? Why not 32, 64, 2? Well, it turns out 16 performs remarkably well on this task, and that's because it roughly corresponds to the number of common parts of speech in English. I didn't think, it, I mean, actually, this is a post hoc, uh, I actually, did, we did some experimentation with the numbers, and, uh, and six, 
So what am I capturing? Is just capturing pairs of words in the context of a part of speech relation or a relation between two parts. So determiner tends to be followed by nouns. Um, but you can do this more generally. So this kind of analysis that here has to do with syntax, that's what I, I was just dealing with Chomsky's, Chomsky's challenge, can also be applied for semantics. It, and exactly in the spirit of which I think is very much it, it sort of inspired and related to Harris's, which is, can I look at text, a distribution of words in text, and identify classes of words that, perf that behave the same way in, ter in terms of their distribution in the context of other words. For instance, classes of, of arguments that behave in the same way with respect to operators. Uh, so I did some work a number of years ago uh, on the notion of distributional clustering. How to group words into classes, which might be soft classes, not hard boundary classes, that in a way that preserve the maximum amount of information about their context of occurrence. Can I say, ask, it's a compression idea. Can I find a way of compressing a set of words into a smaller set of classes that preserves the maximum amount of information about the context of use? Uh, for example, group nouns according to the distribution of verbs that take them as direct objects. So that's a, one experiment we did. So if you look at histograms like this, where I have the relative frequency of various subjects, for instance, this is another slightly different example of in verbs. So for the so committee and senate, these you see these distributions of of, uh, of verbs. Uh, how often does this particular subject occur with this particular verb? And you see that there's some similarities and some dissimilarities. Committees and sen and the senate vote and investigate and approve and reject and begin things, but then, for instance, committees tend to report, but Senate tends not to report. So that, how can I get something out of this sort of observation about departures from equiprobability equi in use of words? So, a number of, so in that work a number of years ago, I did some experiments. I won't give you the details of how this was done, and this is just a one toy version of a larger thing. So I have the, the verb fire, in look the word fire as a verb in uh, Newswire, and the look and then cluster using this informational analysis, uh, the direct objects of fire. And you find, for example, that so not surprisingly, there are two things you fire in the news. You fire weapons and you fire people. Uh, and, and then if you go further on that when you fire weapons, you, I kind of, there are two kinds of things you fire. Those are things that actually propel something out and some things that are propelled. And then, of course, the fact is that things like rockets appear in both because they are self-propelled. Um, so the, the observation here is that a lot, by, you can, comp one approach to compression, which is kind of complementary to the previous one, is the approach of compressing by looking at words, individual words, and their distributions in context and finding ways of, of uh, replacing them by proxies, which are essentially classes of words, but they're soft classes. Um, five minutes or two? Oh, two minutes. Ah, so I'll skip that. After all, I added this slide, but then I have to skip it because leave it to the discussion if there is time. So I just want to finalize with one observation. Uh, and this is kind of a lot more of this in the paper. The, this whole analysis, you know, kind of, this whole types of approaches rely on something which is really important and people tend to forget when they do practical work, is that in any, uh, the mo there's a class of models that you're trying, you're trying to fit to data. The class of models might be, for instance, those class-based models with different numbers of classes. Uh, and you have to do a trade-off, which is very similar and in fact deeply related theoretically to the trade-off that the previous speaker discussed about, between fitting the observations fairly well and generalizing to new data that is not the expected error of this model on new data, 
is not going to be much worse than the error we observed and later we've seen so far. Now, the critical thing about this type of question is that the generalization ability of a class of models does, can be measured independently of the representation of the model. So, in fact, this, is ta this leads to you know, a, a lot of work in learnability, in language learning, and, and, and uh, has always focused on representations, on how, does the grammar in how is the grammar encoded in the mind. Uh, and I think that's completely the wrong thing to ask. The thing, the, because the fact, the fact is the learning theory, modern learning theory shows that the generalization ability is determined not by how the grammar or the class of models is represented, but what distinctions they can make or not make uh, among sets of data. Uh, so, in, in fact, that generalization requires that not every distribution can be approximated well by the model the, in the class. That is, if I have a class of models that can approximate well any distribution, however arbitrary distribution, then it will not be able to generalize well. And it, so this is where the notion of an innate or a constraint on language come, has to come from, not from representations. And that's uh, just one final, so, so a summary. Learning theory and the techniques that I talked about clears the confusion about zero frequencies, this poverty of the stimulus, and generalization. It's not about encodings of grammars, it's about the informational properties of grammars. Uh, the keys to effective probabilistic modeling are decomposition of events, the way I described before, using latent variables and taking av advantage of redundancy. I didn't have time to talk about that. And the thing which really ties modern learning theory and machine learning to Harris very deeply is that we're talking about is information constraints and not about particular architectures. In the sense we're not doing cognitive science, uh, at least that kind of cognitive science that assumes, that tries to put things in the head, but rather trying to see what are the functional constraints that make minds work and language uh, be a sort of a, a living organism. Yes, exactly, yes, yes. Uh, so so but the, the, I think the thing which is fascinating uh, in these types of models is, and I, that's why I was asking the question to the previous speaker, is when you start throwing those, those uncertainties, you actually can do better compression. And, and there's some beautiful work in, in information theory, by the way, on that, exactly that point, uh, which is the, under the name of model averaging uh, and the relation of, of that to sort of minimum, uh, minimum description length, that kind of those ideas. Uh, so I think this is still a lot to do, and I, I think the previous talk, which was a beautiful talk, I was really, uh, I don't have to go and learn more about this, that work, really st shows that we can, that this program is still just in the beginning. There's still a, a, a lot more to, to do along these lines. Ooh. Well, I, I, could, I could go if I could plug this back in. <laughs> sorry, oh, I was already, oh. I'm sorry. I, I hope that the, my, oh yeah, okay. Somehow things worked right this time. You're safe in the sense that it worked tolerably. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Trying, I think we're great, yeah. as you should. The potential of Harris training models is great. Uh, that's no, no, it's, if you see the probability of a word sequence according to this model is the probability of the first word times the probability of the second word given the first word and so on. Very simplistic first order Markov model, but the probability of a word given the previous word is given as a, is a, in that factor's form. 
So effectively, when you're computing that probability, you're summing over all possible assignments of classes of Cs along the line. Uh, kind of, you can think that at each point choice there's a C, so the kind of mental state for that sentence is a choice of a C for each position. Sure, it would, ha yes. No, 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 no. That would be different. Because the probability of those words given the classes would be different. Now, I, don't, I didn't specify what the classes are. The classes are induced from the data, purely from the data. And, and so the, the probability of class given word and word given class will be specific to those words and classes. Uh, so, if I, so if I had a different string with exactly the same syntactic structure, we still have different probability. That's not the, it's not the absolute probability that's the interesting thing here, it's the relative probability between the grammatical string and the ungrammatical permutations of that string, the same string. Oh, I, 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 unless I go and run the thing, I couldn't. <laughs> I mean, take a, take a, a grammatical string that does this to it, and it under this model, will it come out as difficult? You mean the, the ratio or the probability itself? Yeah, oh, the ratios. So I, I sort of want to control that experiment. Uh, so, so the, sentence, which, which I, I didn't, I mean, the, I, I say this was a target experiment. I didn't, he, I, you were asking me for things that I can't remember now. But I, I did do experiments with some other word permutations, the same thing happened. It's not specific to this. Uh, so it's, it's similar things, and for similar reasons. You essentially are doing is capturing the relation between successive word classes. And if you look at word classes, I can look at, go and say what, I can look at the sort of the soft classes by looking at P of C given WI. And they do the obvious things, right? All the determiners go, have, so the class, there's one class that is very likely for all the words that are determinants. And one class that is very likely for the words that are, that are weekday names, for instance, things like that. So they are kind of a mishmash. They are not perfect uh, part of speech or perf perfect semantic classes or anything like that. They are automatically induced. They just capture as much information as it, this method can from the available data with that number. So, so you will see, I mean, essentially is getting at some very simple syntactic regularities in between word pairs. But it's a good question. I, sh I should, get that, uh, sh should get that data, which I can. In fact, you know, this, all this, one of uh, my students has reproduced this, uh, a lot of this work, so I'm going to get him to do that. <laughs> he's in the room, so no, I, he's <laughs> to be here speaking about this today. I didn't know Zelig Harris personally, um, but I feel that I know him thoroughly. And I'm sure via Lila Gleitman, he has formed uh, an extraordinary number of the ideas that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but mostly through Lila Gleitman, too. Um, so what I want to talk about is some work that I've been doing, especially with Richard Aslan at the University of Rochester on um, statistical language learning in humans and other biological organisms. Um, as you probably know, um, the usual approaches to language acquisition in our field um, are of two kinds, and similar to the great divide that you talked about in the earlier talk. Um, on the one hand, the Chomskyan approach to language acquisition has been one which um, assumes that the learner on a particular learning occasion takes an individual utterance and tries to formulate rules or principles, um, structural descriptions for that utterance. And of course, in order to do that kind of task, one needs to bring to bear a great deal of innate something. Um, 
in this particular approach, the assumption is that what's innate that's brought to the task is innate knowledge about the way in which languages might be structured and the way in which rules or principles of language structure must be formulated. On the other side of the playing field usually is an input-driven approach to learning um, in which the recent instantiations have suggested that one could do input-driven learning without any innate contributions. Um, that one, there is enough information in the input to formulate what languages are like by the child, um, all entirely on that basis. Um, what I want to talk about is some work that Dick Aslan and I have been doing, which is a really uh, a sort of blend of these approaches, in which we have been trying to show that there is, in fact, statistical learning from input that can be done by humans, by human adults, by human babies, um, as young as eight months old, in fact, by monkeys to some degree. Um, but at the same time that there are innate constraints on the nature of the kinds of computations a statistical learning, a human statistical learning device can perform. And to some degree, these innate constraints on computation seem to explain some of the constraints on universals of language structure, and therefore may remove the need for some of the contentful knowledge about what languages might look like. Um, I also want to talk at the end about another related issue, which is how do, given statistical kinds of input, what do you do with them? And I want to show you some recent work in which we've been trying to argue that what you do, what humans do with statistical information is not simply to store the statistics, but actually to formulate something like rules out of the statistics that they get. And this process may help to explain some unusual relationships between input and what one learns, like as in creolization. So let me start with part one, statistical learning from input, and I want to start with some work we've done, we did a few years ago, and then move on to some more recent work. Um, the first problem that, I, the first thing I want to say is what do we mean by statistical learning? And most of you are familiar with the use of this term, perhaps in, uh, most often in computational literatures, um, but I want to talk about what we mean by statistical learning in humans. Um, as Harris said, um, and certainly many others before him and since him, um, the structures of natural languages are reflected in the distributional patterns of the elements in the speech stream. That's, of course, how you do linguistics. You go to a new country and you figure out something about the structures of language by looking at distribution. Um, what we've been finding is that human learners, in fact, are able to compute the statistics of these patterns extremely rapidly and online and seem to use these patterns, in fact, to acquire the structures of languages. We started this work several years ago by looking at the problem of word segmentation. So um, much of the work I want to talk about is looking at the very simplest pa uh, problem that a learner faces, how to figure out from the stream of speech what the words are. Um, which sequences of sounds actually form the words. And as I'm sure you're all aware, there aren't silences. This is not a problem that's signaled by acoustic information. There, by and large, are not silences um, at the word boundaries. The word boundaries in this utterance are signaled, are marked by these red lines. But the red lines are not the place of quiet, of acoustic silence. So um, you can't figure out what the word boundaries are by simply looking for where there are physical indicators like silence between the words. But Harris suggested quite some time ago that there are statistical cues. He didn't, of course, use this term. He sort of used this term. Um, but the idea was that if you look at a big corpus of the language, you will discover that the sound sequences within the words are more predictable than the sound sequences across the word boundaries. So if you look at a sequence like pretty baby, which doesn't show up very well on this coloring, um, pre is often followed by t, and bay is often followed by b, but t bay isn't so often a common occurrence. Happens only when you get particular kinds of junctures between the words. So the question that we asked was whether you could use this. Could you formulate this as a kind of online algorithm that a learner could actually use to figure out where the word boundaries were. And what we did, this was work that we did with Jen Safran 
um, in 19, published in 1996, we borrowed a much older term from Miller and Selfridge, transitional probabilities. Um, I should say we've done a, set, a series of studies that I'm not going to talk about asking what exact kind of statistic does a human brain compute, but I'm not going to talk about that uh, today. I'm going to assume that it's transitional probabilities. For those interested, technically we've shown that it is something on the order of conditional probabilities, conditional entropy, or mutual information, a set of conditionalized statistics that our learners seem to be performing. Um, but we started by talking about transitional probabilities between sound sequences. So the idea that we, as a reformulated statement of what I just said, Transitional probabilities between sounds within a word are relatively high. Transitional probabilities between sounds across word boundaries are relatively low. And the term transitional probability, I mean, given a particular syllable, I'm going to start by saying syllable. I'm going to clarify that later. But given a particular syllable like pr, what's the probability that it will be followed by t? And we asked in our earliest study whether human learners could in fact discover word boundaries using only statistical information. In order to ask that question, we didn't use real speech because of course real speech does um, include a number of cues, partial other cues to word boundaries. So what we did was we constructed an artificial language. It was a teeny language, but the exposure was also teeny. Um, this was the initial study we did with adults. We made an artificial language that had six three-syllable nonsense words, so here are the words. And you can see that our words were constructed by reutilizing a vocabulary of 12 nonsense syllables. So like real languages, syllables appeared in numerous words. And then we formulated, a we concatenated the words to form a continuous stream. So this was really a simple language. The only structure was the sound structure within the words. There was no syntax. There was a random choice. At the end of a word, the choice of the next word was one of the other five. And that meant, I'm sorry, I should also say we, form, we synthesized these by a speech synthesizer, so there were no prosodic cues to the words or to the word boundaries. This was spoken in a monotone by um, the output of Macintalk. And I'll play it for you in a minute. This created a continuous stream of 20 minutes. Um, we paid people money to sit and listen to this. <laughs> where transitional probabilities were the only cues to word boundaries. So these are the words. This is the same thing I've already said. These are the six words. This is something like what the stream was like. And I can play a bit for you, although I'm not paying anyone to listen to it. Pabi kuti budo go latuti budo daro pi pabi ku go latuti budo pabi ku go latu daro pi pabi ku daro. So what you have there is um, a continuous stream in which there are no acoustic cues to the word boundaries, but the transitional probability structure, the statistical structure, does create a pattern. This is actually the pattern of transitional probabilities that you get over a stream of this kind. And you get, obviously, a lot of ups and downs and various in-between numbers. Um, but if you look at where the word boundaries actually occur, as Harris noted in a slightly different computational format, the boundaries of the words are the troughs between the words, statistically. And the words are the relative peaks in this function. And so the question that we asked was whether subjects could acquire this patterning, and whether they could use this pattern of statistics to determine what the words and the word boundaries were. And the way we asked this question of adults was we gave them at the end, after they listened for 20 minutes, we gave them a presentation of a word like dutaba. And we gave them a presentation of what we called a part word, like bupi da, which is the end of one word and the beginning of the next. And we said, which of these sounds like a better group or unit to you? And this is what you get. This is data. These are data from adult listeners and also on the right from five and six-year-old children. Um, so they're answering a two-alternative force choice. Guessing would be 50%, which is what this line indicates. 
And you can see that after 20 minutes of exposure, both adults and children are way above chance on doing this task. They actually do perceive those units that are held together by statistically high probabilities to sound like a group and those that run across the boundary to sound not as much like a group. The phenomenon that happens here, just to try to give you a feeling for it, you listen to it at the beginning and it sounds continuous like I am assuming it does to you. Gradually, um, sets of syllables start to kind of pop out and sound like a unit until after you listen to it for a very long time, it sounds like English sounds to me. That is, it sounds like word, space, word, space, word, space. So quite outside of consciousness, these patterns of statistics seem to produce perceptual units that you start to perceive ultimately in a conscious way. But of course, you don't seem to be conscious about doing any of the computations. Um, we also did this with babies, eight-month-old babies, who are, of course, are the primary subjects for studies of language acquisition. We made the language simpler. Now we had four words, and the transitional probabilities inside the words were perfect, so they were 1.0 probabilities. And at the boundary, because there were four words, the transitional probabilities were 0.33. Um, and we did exactly the same experiment. Now, you can't ask babies to do a two-alternative forced choice, of course. Uh, but you can. Uh, so what you do is, in a standard set of methods that were developed by Jusik and Aslan for studying babies, you can do something equivalent to the two alternative forced choice. What you do is you bring babies in, they sit on their mother's lap, so they're inside an acoustic chamber. This is a replica of a parent. And this is a replica of a baby. And the baby sits on the parent's lap. The parents wear headphones so that they don't acquire the um, task in question and poke the baby at the appropriate time. Um, and there's an experimenter who sits outside the booth and can see what's happening over the video camera but cannot hear any of the sounds. And the experimenter, at the beginning, plays this stream of speech for two minutes. So the baby studies are done with two-minute exposures. Uh, they need to be simpler languages to be learned in two minutes. But the baby language can be learned by adults in two minutes as well. Um, and after the two-minute familiarization, you present, again, a word versus a part word. And now you ask how the infant, which the infant prefers by asking how long they look when you play one of these. So the way a trial works is a trial begins, a test trial begins with the front light lit, and the baby naturally looks forward when the experimenter sees that the baby is looking centered. One of the two speakers on either side will begin to play a word or a part word over and over again. So the baby will hear du taba. Du taba, du taba. Now, the baby will naturally look toward the speaker. The experimenter then looks to see how long the baby is continuously looking in that direction. So the experimenter has a button that she depresses when the baby looks in this direction. When the baby looks away, she lifts her finger. And so you're measuring a cumulative amount of looking time for the baby. When the baby looks away for more than two seconds, is completely bored, the trial terminates, the front light begins, and the, tri the next trial starts. And so what you get, this is just to remind you, there are transitional probability differences in this language between the word and the part word. And what we're asking is, do the babies discriminate this difference? And this is what you get in a baby looking time experiment. You need to compare these two bars to figure out whether you got a discrimination. And what you find is that the cumulative looking time to words is much lower than the cumulative looking time to part words, suggesting that the baby does indeed make this discrimination. In this paradigm, you get a novelty effect. Um, they, look, they listen longer when it's a weird part word. Um, but it doesn't really matter the direction of the effect. The important question is whether you got a discrimination. And babies do discriminate, again, on the basis of these statistical patterns with no other cues to what it is that um, differs. We subsequently went on to ask whether humans could also do this for things that are not languages. Um, is this a computational mechanism devoted or developed 
solely for processing language. And um, we have shown, in fact, that you get the same outcome for musical sequences of tones and for visual sequences, um, also for visual patterns where the statistics are arrayed over space rather than over time. Um, so I can play for you a, just a little bit of the musical version of this. The statistics are just like the baby statistics, um, but now the elements are tones and it sounds like what we liberally call music. You see, it doesn't sound very musical. But the idea is that there's a predictable set of tones and then an unpredictable um, place and then another predictable set of tones. And you're asking whether people start to hear little grouped melodies. So, uh, presumably, it sounds pretty continuous. Those are obviously physically matched in duration. Um, but these are the baby data. Um, the babies do this exactly as well as they do the language task. They look less long at the tone words, that is the predictable sequence of three, and longer at the tone part words, that is the thing that crosses an unpredictable boundary. So it looks like what you have here is a very broad, um, mechanism that keeps track of these kinds of conditionalized statistics across a wide array of stimulus types for language as well as a, a other kinds of stimuli. Now, we also recently asked whether this was something specific to humans. This is a tamarind monkey, and with Mark Hauser, um, Dick Aslan and I have run a series of studies asking whether tamarinds can do this sort of task as well. The reason that we were interested in tamarinds is because they've been claimed to uh, have and produce fairly complex vocalizations in their natural repertoire, which consist of some possibly sequential components. Um, that is, we see sequential components when you look at the spectrogram. It's not entirely clear whether tamarinds perceive this as a sequence of separate elements. But their vocalizations raise the possibility that they might be keeping track of sequential auditory elements and therefore might be able to do the same kind of processing. So we did the same experiment with tamarinds, asking whether they could learn these sound sequences. This is actually an old slide. We had originally uh, asked whether we could compare them to vervets who do not have such complex sequential aspects to their vocalizations as um, some of our colleagues here have described. Um, the vervets turned out not to even look up when you play human speech. So the vervets in Mark Hauser's lab have been sent to the farm. Um, but a very interesting future question is to do some comparative work to see whether se sequence abilities of this kind vary across species. Um, the tamarins are not trained. So this is a very important aspect of work that Mark does. They're not trained to do any of these things. What we're asking is whether they naturally and spontaneously keep track of these kinds of statistics about sequences the way babies do. So the method is just that in their homeroom at night, they get played these sequences. They hear 20 minutes of the baby stimuli where they get a stream of just a continuous looping 20 minute stream of these human speech syllables. And then the next day, they get brought to a testing cage one at a time. They get a two-minute refresher of the stream, just like the babies. And then we're looking at their looking time when we play in the speaker up here a word versus a part word. So it's spontaneous, natural looking, just as in the um, human data are. They're not trained for anything that they do here or rewarded in any way. And what you find is exactly the same kind of data that you get in human babies, actually. This is now divided into two versions of the language. We do all our studies with two different sets of syllable choices with the same statistics so that we can make sure that none of the results are an artifact of some sound preferences for what naturally sounds grouped. Um, and you can see that tamarinds produce the same kind of looking time results with both uh, instantiations. Like babies, they look longer at the part word structure, that is the violation of, of high statistical transitions, and less long at the coherent words. And again, this suggests that they really have learned um, the structure of these sequences. 
So this suggests the tamarins can perceive some speech elements and they can acquire sequencing, but also that they, like human babies, can compute some aspects of the st sequential statistics. So this package of findings in this first part says there's a mechanism for computing sequential consistencies online that works extremely rapidly in humans. And it computes some fairly complex statistics that have to be computed on a large number of sequential units simultaneously. You can only do these tasks if you compute statistics like this on all the combinations of the 12 syllables in the repertoire. So if you figure out how many statistics you have to be computing, how many conditional probabilities you have to be computing to do this task, it's actually pretty impressive. Um, it doesn't look like this basic mechanism is unique to language or to humans, and it looks like, of course, it might be very useful for solving segmentation problems in speech, but also in a number of other domains. But this kind of general pattern makes a problem if what you're interested in is language acquisition, um, because this type of device isn't adequate to learn languages. That is, if all you can keep track of is what the statistics are about syllables that are immediately adjacent to one another, you can do some low-level things. Um, it's a sort of zero-order Markov process, but you can't do the more complicated structures of language with that kind of computation alone. And of course, tamarins don't learn languages. So as long as we find the same kinds of abilities in human babies and in tamarins, we haven't quite solved the language acquisition problem. So what role does this process play in language acquisition? It raises a couple of possibilities. One possibility is maybe this kind of device we've discovered really just does this one basic computation. And then to learn language, it would have to be the handmaiden of a much more um, contentful other device. So you could imagine there is a language faculty it knows lots about what human languages might be like. It has a little idiot handmaiden who runs off and does some Markov computations, reports back, and helps the larger device actually construct the nature of the languages of the world. That's one possibility consistent with what I've said so far. Another possibility which is happens to be personally more interesting to us, and so it's the one we're pursuing is there might be a richer battery of computations. The one we started with might be only one, but uh, suppose you had a set of computations that this kind of ability, uh, this kind of device might be able to perform. Um, is there a set, a small handful of computations of this type that would be adequate to acquire natural languages and that we could show that humans have? Now, if you did this, it would have to just, it would have to be beyond adjacent conditional probabilities. It would have to be more encompassing than that. And there should ultimately be selectivity across domains and species. That is, presumably, as you went up the ladder of more complicated computations, you should get to something tamarins can't do since they don't acquire English. So, part two of what I want to talk about is. Looking at further constraints, and what I want to talk about is a set of studies that Dick Aslan and I have done recently, looking at really only one step beyond our original computation. There's a lot more to be done here, but as soon as we took step two, we actually started to find what um, I would characterize as some innate constraints in humans on computation that fit nicely with what things languages do and what things do not appear in languages of the world. So let me just tell you where we're going here. Um, further questions. We looked at local, immediate, adjacent dependency computations. Obviously, one thing you have to look at to understand about languages is what about non-local dependencies, and that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, we've also been doing work thinking about what would you have to do, what kind of statistic would you have to do to acquire categories. This is work that I've done with Toby Mintz, who was here a few years ago. Um, and also looking at hierarchical relations, what kind of statistics in a stream would be those that would signal the presence of things like morphology and syntax. But I'm just going to talk about the non-local dependencies. 
this is just a um, sort of abstract representation of what we did in our previous baby language. In the baby language, we had four words, so that's what these four lines are supposed to represent. And each of them was made of three syllables. And the statistics for figuring out that those were the words were those that had to do with immediate adjacencies between syllables. So if you could compute the statistics between syllable one and two, two and three, et cetera, you could figure out what the words were in that language. What we did next was to just make a small step away from that, to say, what if we built three syllable words where the grouping of the syllables was defined only by a non-adjacent statistic? So here you have a picture of a language that has six words, um, but the word is formed by the relationships between this syllable at the beginning of a word and this syllable at the end of a word. So th there are three frames. This syllable one is always followed by syllable four. Syllable five is always followed by syllable six. Syllable seven is always followed by syllable eight. But intervening between those perfect 1.0 probabilities is one of two syllables that can appear in the middle of any of the words of the language. And what that does is it, sorry, let me, I thought I had a slide of the, of the statistics. Let me just explain them to you. What that does is if you're only able to compute statistic, statistical relations between adjacent syllables, you will not be able to form groups in a stream made up of words like this. What will happen is, as you go from this syllable to the next, you have a 0.5 probability of what'll come next. Then you have another 0.5, uh, sorry, then you have a 0.33, because it could be any of these. Then you have a 0.5, because it can only be one of the other two, 0.5, et cetera. So you have a continuous stream that fluctuates a little bit between 0.5 and 0.33 but has no peak or trough that allows you to figure out what the grouping of the words are. On the other hand, if the subject can jump one syllable away and compute the um, conditional probabilities between syllables that are not immediately adjacent, then you have a 1.0 perfect probability here and it should be really easy to learn the words. So the idea is the same as what we've done before. You form a continuous concatenation of these words and you present them to subjects for 20 minutes. These are now all done with adult subjects. And you ask, can they learn this very strong probability that's only one syllable away? And these are the data from the first thousand times we ran this. Um, this is just to demonstrate we're very stubborn. It seems like a simple problem on paper each of these bars is a group of adults doing a two alternative force choice. So the bar at 50, per, the line of 50% is chance. And what you can see is that nobody ever gets above chance on these. This is really hard to learn for adult humans. Um, it just doesn't pop out at you. And we started with a language that had five outside frames and, th and four middles. We thought, okay, that's too hard. So we moved to four outside frames and three middles. And then we got to three outside frames and two middles. It's really a bear. People do not learn this readily. Um, but it's also of interest that natural languages do not exhibit every type of non-adjacent regularity. They exhibit extremely constrained non-adjacent regularities. That's one might say that's what all of modern linguistics has been about, characterizing what the non-adjacent regularities are in natural languages. Um, and in fact, the pattern that we built doesn't happen very much in natural languages. Languages really don't have words that have syllables that are one away predictably and then unpredictable things right in the middle of the sentence. That isn't the kind of pattern that languages tend to exhibit. So we were interested in trying to go back and think more carefully about the patterns that languages do exhibit in non-adjacent regularities and see if learning matched those. So this is our non-adjacent syllable pattern that I just described and we re-ran a very carefully constructed version of this and again we got um, terrible performance in two languages by adult subjects. But then we built another kind of language that had a very different kind of non-adjacent pattern. 
This is a language in which there are non-adjacent segments where the consonants are perfectly predictable and the vowels vary, as in Hebrew. And it turns out if you make a language like that, people learn it extremely readily. So these are the other data on the two languages with non-adjacent syllables, which people are terrible at. And these are the data on non-adjacent consonants, which people are extremely good at. Um, it's very easy to learn. And we also did the complement looking at predictable vowels where the consonants vary, as you might find in a language like Turkish where you have vowel harmony, where there are predictable features of vowels that match each other, but the consonants in between vary. Um, and again, what you find is when you do a, a pattern that languages exhibit, um, learners do extremely well. Again, where patterns that languages do not exhibit, learners do not seem to do very well. So this taken together, this th set of results suggests that people are really good at local or adjacent dependencies, but the non-adjacent dependencies show some very strong selectivities. The non-adjacent syllables are extremely difficult. The non-adjacent segments look really easy, and this accords with regularities in natural languages. Now, what might be the account of why non-adjacent segments are very easy to learn and non-adjacent syllables are extremely hard to learn? Um, I want to give you two ways of saying what I think the explanation is. And I think these are exactly equivalent, but they're going to sound very different because they come from different fields, the language, the terms I'm going to use for describing the explanation of this result. One way of thinking about it in terms of a uh, kind of psychological account is to say non-adjacency is really hard. Um, it's not easy, apparently, for human learners to learn anything that's not adjacent. Um, but the non-adjacency may be ameliorated if the things that are not adjacent related to each other are similar, are of the same type. And the thing in between is of a different kind. So it's sort of like figuring out that you have relationships between stripes, where some of the stripes are red and some of the stripes are blue. Um, a different way of saying this is that in a linguistic description, you would say that in a segment representation, consonants and vowels are on different tiers. So if you, have, if you think about speech as having not a flat representation, but a well-structured representation, where you have consonants on one tier and vowels on another, the relationships between consonants are actually adjacent relationships. They're only non-adjacent when you put your tiers together. But in a structured representation, um, the consonants are all next to each other, or the vowels are all next to each other. And so what may be another way of thinking about what's going on here is that you can always only do adjacent relations, but you do them on structured representations of speech. Now, an interesting question, whichever way you prefer uh, in terms of interpreting this is OK with me. I think they're very similar accounts. Um, but an interesting question is whether babies, where babies fit into this picture, and I can't tell you the answer to that now. We're running babies at the moment. Eight and 10 month old babies can't learn any of these languages. They don't appear to be able to do non-adjacent anything. 18 month olds can do the Turkish one. And so they look like they're starting to have representations of vowels as somewhat separate from consonants. Um, but I don't know yet uh, when these patterns of learning develop and when these kinds of elements are um, available to babies for starting to do the more structured kinds of representations. So what we see so far is a mechanism that keeps track of fairly complicated statistical properties of temporal sequences very rapidly with many computations simultaneously run. And not just one elementary finite state statistic that's only on local syllables. Um, it still remains to be seen whether you have a battery of computations that learners can perform. And that's still ongoing work. Um, it looks like we're starting to see that these statistics may be run on fairly structured representations of speech, not sort of lumpy acoustic 
templates. Um, but all of this, an interesting question on, in ongoing work is how infants fit into this picture. Um, and the last point I want to make on this piece of work is that uh, even at this very beginning step away from the adjacent statistics, it looks like there are very serious constraints on computation. Simple computations that learners do not seem to be very good at doing. Other equally simple computations that learners seem to be very good at doing. And those selectivities may be the ones that give rise to patterns that natural languages do not exhibit and patterns that natural languages do exhibit. Um, now I want to quickly mention a third kind of work that we've been doing. Um, this is me, not with Richard Aslan, but it's very related to the enterprise that um, I just talked about. Another kind of question, if you're thinking about a statistical learning theory, one needs to ask, what do you do with statistics? What is it that you end up representing? What do learners actually do as the output of a process that involves probabilistic information? And there are a couple of possibilities, obviously. One is you learn the statistics, and what you represent is some array of statistics about the language in question. Another possibility that is actually what we've been looking at and seeing is that learners may utilize the statistics that I've been describing, but sharpen them. Um, and under certain circumstances, turn them into something that looks like rules. Um, so what I want to tell you about is in a slightly different arena, some results that suggest that may be what learners do with their statistics. Now, how do you study this? One way, of course, is to examine the character of what's learned in natural language acquisition to try to take um, learners, uh, children, who are learning English, Turkish, et cetera, and say, well, do they look like they've stored statistics versus rules? For any of you who have followed the debates between Marcus and Seidenberg and Pinker and et cetera, you will have realized, I'm sure, that taking a natural language acquisition problem and trying to differentiate whether a learner has represented statistics versus rules is really hard. Um, the more these very smart people disagree with each other, the more one realizes it's pretty difficult to tell the difference between these rather different sounding concepts. So what we have been doing in my lab is looking at learners who receive inconsistent input. Um, children with unusual input situations, which I'm going to describe in a minute, um, and circumstances of creolization where people get very inconsistent or impoverished input. And under these circumstances, it's a little easier to tell what's going on because the statistics version of the representation and the rule version of the representation are actually quite different from one another. And you can use this as a better assay of what it is that learners are doing. So let me tell you the paradigm that we started with. This is some field, some naturalistic work that I did a number of years ago. This is a picture from Johnson and Newport of um, a quite different issue, looking at whether there's a critical period or an age effect for language acquisition. And this is just to point out, I'm not going to tell you about this at all, but if you look at how well people do at learning, this is data from English, um, Chinese speakers learning English at various ages of arrival in the United States. People who learn the language as adults do not do as well in the language as people who learn it as children. And what I'm particularly interested in is that late learners of a language actually do pretty well at the language, but they're very inconsistent. They show a very high degree of error. And what we've been studying is kids who only get exposed to a language from that set of parents. So these are um, slightly more relevant data. They're the same kind of data from people, deaf people who are learning American Sign Language as their native language. Um, and this is just to show you that you get the same kind of age of acquisition effect. Um, but I'm going to be talking about families. We've been following families where the parents are late learners. They're deaf or hearing late learners of American Sign Language. 
and their kids are learning the language in the home from the parents, and that is their primary language, and, it's, and their parents are the only people they know who speak this language. So these are kids who are learning their native language from a source that uses the structures very, very inconsistently. So this is the, some data that I collected a number of years ago with Jenny Singleton looking at a kid we called Simon. And Simon, at the time that these data were collected, was nine. Simon is deaf. American Sign Language is his main language. He's not exposed in school to American Sign Language. He doesn't know anybody outside the home who signs American Sign Language. His mom and his dad are his source of input to the language. And his mom and dad are both deaf. They learned the language at ages 15 and 16. And so they're not really perfect signers. And this is testing them on fairly complicated structures in verbs of motion of American Sign Language. They see videotapes and they have to just say what happened. And then we score whether they get the morphemes of the verb of motion correct. And what you should see here first is the mom and dad. This is typical performance for late learners. If you ask whether the mom and dad use the morphemes correctly, you see that the mom about 75% of the time uses correct, the correct morphemes for ASL. The dad about 65% of the time uses the correct morphemes for ASL. And what they do the rest of the time is have very scattered errors that they make. And this is true of my ASL as a late learner or if you're a late learner of some other language, if, even if you're pretty good at the language, you will be pretty correct but have a fairly high proportion of errors. Um, I'm sorry, let me back up to make the important point here. So this is the mom and dad. These are Simon's only input to the language. Simon, at age nine, is using those same structures about 90% of the time. So he's way more consistent than his input. And he's actually exactly as consistent as native speakers, children whose parents are native speakers, who get per perfectly consistent input. And these are similar data from kids whose parents are hearing. This is Susan, same kind of situation. This is Stuart, very similar situation. This is a sort of most knockout situation. This is Sarah, whose mother is really a terrible signer. Um, but Sarah is still way more consistent than her mom. So something's happening in these situations where kids are more consistent than their parents. Now, let me just point out, there's also something going on where kids are different about this process than adults. Um, the adults who are exposed to perfect input get inconsistent. The children who are exposed to imperfect input get consistent. So there's clearly some kind of important change in how statistics are encoded by kids versus adults. And with Carla Hudson, um, I've been starting to do some miniature language laboratory work, trying to figure out how this happens and what sort of learning process there is. So what we have hypothesized is that certain kinds of inconsistent input seem to lead to regularization. As, and as I'm going to show you, children seem especially likely to regularize. So the first study we did, this is an artificial language study in which subjects speak the language. It's a VSO language. It's a little syntax. They get exposed to a sample of sentences, and then we give them novel events on videotape, and they have to say sentences to describe what they've seen. And the language is perfectly consistent, except we made that all the determiners probabilistic, and so all the critical manipulations are in the determiners of the language. And in the first study we did, the determiners were present 45% of the time, 60, 75, or 100. So we just asked, is the amount of presence of this construction leading to regularization? Um, and these are the data that we got. This is the input. These are adult subjects now. This is the input in these four different conditions. And this is what the learners produced after a week of speaking this language. And what you can see here is that they don't regularize under these circumstances. They pretty much perfectly match the statistics they were exposed to. 
So it looks like under these input circumstances, adults actually reproduce the statistics that they got exposed to. In the animal learning literature, this is called probability matching, and they do that quite well. But there are a couple of different kinds of inconsistent input. So in the last study that I want to tell you about, I just want to tell you about an input situation that more closely matches what Simon actually had. What I just described is a manipulation with presence versus absence inconsistency. So you'd have a construction 60% of the time or it wasn't there at all. In the Simon situation, you have your parents do something 60% of the time and the other 40% of the time is an incredible mushmash. Lots and lots of errorful constructions that are each used low percentages of the time. And so that's what we looked at in our second study. So the original study was one of the conditions, 60% the determiners were used and then otherwise it was absent. But we started creating conditions in which the 40% was scattered in consistency. So we had a condition with 60, 20, 20. We had a condition with 60, 10, 10, 10, 10, and then we kept going. Um, and I'm gonna skip over these data and show you, oops, let me show you. This is the most scattered one, 60, and then 16 determiners that each were used 2.5% of the time. Here's what adults do when you give them that kind of input. 60, zero, they use the determiner 51% of the time. So they're almost probability matching, they're actually a little low. Two noise determiners, four noise determiners, eight noise determiners, 16 noise determiners. So you actually can see that with adults, as you make this increasing amount of scattered and consistency, they actually start to regularize. And there's obviously something about the statistical pattern of this type that is producing regularization. Um, we just finished running the same thing with six-year-old children. Um, and so I want to just finish by showing you the data from six-year-old children as compared with adults that were rerun on the same manipulation. Now with these guys, we used perfect 60% zero two noise determiners, and four. So we never went up to 16. What you get with adults, so this is just reproducing what I've already shown you. With adults, if you have 100% determiners, they use them 100%. If you have 60 presence and absence, they go low. 62 and 64, they're still pretty low. They're not yet regularizing. This is what you get with kids under the same circumstances. Kids actually at four noise determiners start to show the phenomenon that I talked about earlier. Kids look like with less scatter, they start to regularize much more quickly. So what you find in these data is a suggestion that there are really two factors that are going on in this phenomenon. Certain types of inconsistent input lead to regularization. Um, having a main form and a lot of statistical scatter looks like it leads subjects not to probability match, but to over-regularize. But in addition to that, children are especially likely to regularize, and they do so much more quickly than adults do. Um, possibly because they're just less capable, they're more incapable of keeping track of the scatter. Um, and so this suggests that part of the phenomenon of things like creolization and regularization may follow some more general principles governing statistical or probability learning. So let me conclude and say what I think this, th these various sets of studies show. Um, the first thing I think they show is structural linguistics is not just for linguists. It's for babies, it's for tamarins. Um, it looks as though the distributional phenomena that um, reveal structure may seem to be acquired, used for computations and used for learning. Um, 
by humans and not just by linguists and not just by computers. It looks like there is some kind of online computational process that learning, that learning actually um, involves these phenomena. Um, humans look like they're remarkably sensitive to a variety of statistics that reflect language distribution. And they use these statistics to acquire the rules and structures of natural languages. And the final point is that um, not only do humans look like they use these statistics, but they also look like they do a variety of very interesting phenomena to change and shape languages. They don't just absorb these statistics veridically. Some of these statistics they learn very readily and others do not. And that will lead to certain kinds of structures remaining in languages and others disappearing. And sometimes under certain statistical circumstances, learners take the statistics and sharpen them and formulate even more regular structures. And that may be part of how languages come to pass. Thank you. simply to listen for about eight months and not try to make sense of it. Just listen, 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 listen. And that would enable the statistical process to happen. And I'm wondering if maybe there's competition in adults from using their language they already know as a meta language to try to figure it out as an internal meta language rather than letting those native processes go. And that might be interesting to try to sort it out. Um, I think that might be part of the process, but I don't think that's the only thing going on with adults. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is, of course, in these miniature language experiments, we make the adults do exactly the same things the kids do. So they speak when the kids speak. They are not allowed to speak when the kids are not allowed to speak. Um, so at least overtly, they actually go through the same processes as the kids. And they, it's not that they look entirely dissimilar. They look similar, but the kids look more sharp as language learners. The other thing I'd say in response to your question is that we've done a lot of work, I only showed you a teeny bit of it, but we've done a lot of work looking at age differences in signers, deaf people, who learn to sign at various ages. And one of the advantages of looking at that community is that late learners who have been deaf all their lives and are learning American Sign Language late are not second language learners. Um, they usually have some fragmentary knowledge of English, so they do know another language early in life, but not fluently. And when people um, under these circumstances first get exposed to American Sign Language, it's their first shot at real natural language acquisition. They're typically very excited about getting exposed to the language. They don't have another well-developed language in which they have a better fluency. And so some of the issues about interference and different approaches don't apply to that community. The data, Rachel Mayberry has a recent paper in Nature comparing first language learners of American Sign Language who are adults and second language learners of American Sign Language who are adults. And it looks like if it's your first language late in life, so you don't have another language earlier, you're worse late in life. Um, so I think that suggests there's really something different about the way adults do language learning, and it's not that they're busy thinking of their old language. Mm -hmm. Nobody else, to my knowledge, has done anything like this except us. We have actually done this with some non-linguistic stimuli. And it does look like the same thing happens with those stimuli. I don't have any reason to say. I think this is something about statistical distributions. I don't think this is something about language. But it obviously comes up in language learning situations and may shape what happens in language change in very important ways. Mm -hmm, Henry? Uh, have you or others done 
any any work on what I have to be called higher order principles in medicine. And I mean, given that the adult or baby has learned uh, four, six, or whatever words, can these now be used as the basis of some transitional probability of meaning something comes before or after a word, so that eventually you could create a kind of a genuine <coughs> statistical syntax. I'm, I don't know if you could hear. Shall I repeat the question? The question was, have you done this in a higher order way? So that can you do statistics to form words and then do the statistics on the words to form phrases, etc., so that you're hierarchically uh, building up um, higher structure. We obviously are on the way to doing that. We've done some of that. We've just finished running an experiment which was kind of statistical morphology where you have words that are made up of two syllables consistently following each other and one of three syllables that's an affix. And then there's a lot of words that have that pattern. And in order to build that structure up, you have to be able to keep track of several levels of statistics very high transitional probabilities in the stem, and then medium statistical probabilities between the stem and an ending, and then very low probabilities at the end of one word and the beginning of another. And people can do that, and they can make all of those discriminations. Um, so what we test them, we do these streams, and then we test them on whether they've got the stem compared with a word boundary, or whether they've got the stem compared with a morpheme, whether they've got a morpheme compared with a word boundary. And they can do all three of those discriminations. So they have all three levels. We've also done the miniature language stuff with syntax. But what we haven't done is the sort of composite. Um, we're on our way. I mean, I don't see any reason from anything we've seen why one shouldn't find what you're saying. The ability to do the words with one set of statistics and then do the phrases out of those words with a sort of higher order statistic. I saw this language. John. Um, uh, I had a question about auditory event perception. Um, is, do, you, do you know of any work that talks about um, the statistical mechanism that might be needed for the simple auditory event be really interesting to see whether vocal sourcings is all that's needed to to track to recognize most temporal events uh, uniquely or whether you need some more complex condition um, again did you do you want me to repeat the question the question was event there is a, a literature on auditory event perception it it talks a little bit about keeping track of frequencies it's not because people who work in that field aren't coming from language, they haven't asked a lot of questions about sort of more complicated statistics that would be similar to what you find in languages. Um, so as far as I know, people really haven't done any investigations like that. Now we have, though. So we're running the non-adjacent patterns with noise sequences, and with we've completed a study with music. Um, the music stuff, I can play for you at the break. It turns out if you interleave two very well-known melodies so that they're alternating, so that the melody has to be heard across non-adjacent tone positions. So what I can play for you is uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and Happy Birthday. P easy to perceive. Now you interleave them so their notes are every other one gone. Um, you real, even for something that you've already learned, you really have trouble with non-adjacency. Um, we're running, we've run the same study with um, arbitrary tone sequences. And if you have them in the same pitch range, people learn medium to poor statistics between adjacent tones, and they never learn really strong statistical relations between non-adjacent ones. If you put them in two different octaves, you reverse the pattern. So now if there's a pitch cue, you learn the non-adjacent things that are in the same pitch range and not the adjacent things that are in different pitch ranges. So it's really like the consonant vowel thing. Um, so again, I think that 
I mean, I think there's a really interesting combination of domain-specific and not at all domain-specific phenomena in these results. Um, I think that um, most of these phenomena have some grounding that goes way outside of language and the non-language domains look just like the language domains. But the language structures arise in more complicated patterns. And so they build on some of what I think are basic auditory uh, event perception or really more basic perceptual mechanisms. Jeff? I th my guess would be that they'd be sort of like putting the tones in different octaves. That because you sort them out as different types of events, you would, mo you would be able to do some non-adjacent things. Now, one interesting issue is when you put things adjacent, they don't have to be similar as much. Adjacent computations just look like they're way easier. So you can obviously apparently compute relationships between consonants and vowels when they're next to each other. Um, so if you had very different stimuli that w where you're asking, can they keep track of the statistics when they're right next to each other, maybe. I mean, again, I think even next to each other, you can probably make um, type differences that people wouldn't go across. So, you know, some of the stuff that Al Bregman has done on auditory event perception would suggest you have stimuli that maybe come from this location in space and that location in space. You probably don't tend to keep track of their temporal relationships or a male voice and a female voice if you had. So if you made it even more different, I think what you do is break the tendency to compute temporal relationships. Okay, thank you. Um, in about 1980, I only uh, was in the same room with uh, Zelig on two occasions. Uh, so I am <coughs> a post uh, by um, uh, te temporally, and um, I am uh, in a different way from, uh, from Lissa, also uh, a grandchild, uh, because I studied at MIT, uh, and one of my teachers was Noam Chomsky. Uh, and of course, in linguistics the, uh, and psychology, the, the uh, dispute between the Chomskyan and the Heresian um, approaches to linguistics has assumed epic proportions. I always had a lot of trouble with that. Um, it seemed to me that there was a lot of ideology uh, ta uh, balancing on a very small number of uh, substantive issues. And I can't tell always whether what I'm saying is Chom is Chomskyan or anti-Chomskyan or Heresian or anti-Heresian, and I'm not going to try to do that. Um, I'll let you decide uh, for yourselves whether what I'm saying is a continuation of what Harris was doing or a response to what Harris was doing or a, um, a counter-argument against what Harris was doing. Probably it's all of those things because that's the way the world really works as opposed to the way it works in our fantasies. So, um, if you'll give me just a minute, I will look for and quickly find uh, the slides. <coughs> Where is there? The, um, the, these are the slides that I've put together for the talk. Uh, I should just, I'm sure that I won't get uh, anywhere near to where I want to get uh, in the short time that I have. So I, I had better give you the punchline um, uh, at the beginning uh, for sake of clarity. I want to uh, show you that there is some evidence um, from the study of historical 
corpora that it, that it is a common occurrence for, um, for languages to actually um, be mixed from a grammatical point of view. That is to say that <coughs> the language that, uh, that people speak is actually not governed by a single set of rules, but by more than one set of rules. And sometimes this, the writer or the speaker invokes one of the rules and on other occasions invokes a different rule. Um, now, in general, this, you might think this was a diff difficult thing to see, and of course it is, but we see it in historical uh, situations more clearly than perhaps we could see it synchronically because we see old forms, which we know will eventually die out of the language, um, alternating with new forms. Um, and we know from looking at um, other languages that these old forms and new forms uh, don't coexist comfortably together. Um, a nice example of that is the so-called verb second constraint. Um, the Germanic languages in general have a rule that the second constituent of any matrix clause, any main sentence, has to be the tensed verb. And English being a Germanic language really should have this rule, and Old English and Early Middle English did, but Modern English doesn't. And we can trace through the texts of English um, a period during which the f both verb second sentences and non-verb second sentences occurred, and we can watch the frequency of the verb second word order decline over time. And in the co over the space of about 250 years, the frequency declines from close to 100% to close to zero. And I've modeled that in, in my work, and other people have, as what we call grammar competition. Now, there's another way of looking at this, which is actually quite common, which is to say, well, no, 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 what's going on here is um, you have statistical distributions of types, and um, a language like Middle English, where you have both verb second sentences and non-verb second sentences, doesn't have to be thought of as, a, as a, some kind of mixture of two distributions, but can be thought of simply as a language in which both word orders are licensed by the grammar. In fact, um, from a, a purely distributional point of view, you might think that this is a better solution. Why, po why postulate something as complicated as two systems of rules with competition between them when you could just say you have one system of rules um, where, the same, where two different strings of words um, are both uh, licensed, they happen to have the same, um, um, the same meaning in some broad sense. And I want to show you today a little bit of why it might be better to say that you have a mixture of distributions and competition um, instead of saying that you have a grammar with, with, with a, a broader set of licensed um, uh, outputs. Um, to the extent that it turns out to be true that you can give evidence for this, it suggests that a purely distributional analysis of a, of a corpus um, of text or even of a, of, a, of, a, of a set of grammaticality judgments may not be the best linguistic analysis. Um, and that's, I think, the, the, uh, the, the, the punchline, that, be, that it might be the case that if we sit down and we do the best possible linguistic analysis of the data set, and here it doesn't really matter whether this is a corpus or these are the data is uh, judgments, we might actually come up with the wrong answer because the psychological processes that are underlying the performance of the uh, writers or speakers are more complex than this um, model allows for. So this is a summary of, uh, um, of a purely distributional analysis. Uh, grammars are constructed to capture regularities in distribution. The best grammar is the most succinct. The grammar is constructed basically without reference to psychological considerations. This is uh, structuralist methodology, and it is the common heritage of all um, modern linguists. It's a heritage that goes back to the beginning of the 20th century through Saussure and others, and Bloomfield and Harris and Chomsky. Now, and as I said, the question I have is, does this method ever mislead? Um, and I want to argue that there are so-called mixed distributions or doublets and that they're found particularly in the course of language change. So the reason I call these things doublets is that the clearest, simplest case to look at are, is the case of um, morphological doublets. It's a standard term. 
And in the history of English, for example, we have lots of doublets for um, the past tense of verbs, where one of the, uh, one of the um, members of the pair is a, a strong form or an irregular form, and the other is a weak form. Sometimes the modern language retains the strong form, sometimes the weak form. And for a few verbs, we still have doublets, like dived and dove. We did some research on this and found that whenever the doublet had been around in the language, um, uh, in attested texts for 300 years, uh, one of the forms had dropped out. So it doesn't seem that these doublets are stable. There are, um, as I said, sometimes syntactic doublets, though. Uh, for example, the difference between the verb second sentence, these are, this is, these are not real examples, but if in, in early Middle English you might have last night came John, and um, in modern English we would have last night John came. Okay, the lesson of the historical work has been that quite systematically doublets are diachronically unstable. And the question that one might ask is why should that be if the, um, if the language is correctly described as simply a distribution of forms? If both of the forms appear, there's positive evidence for both forms, and we just write a grammar which allows both. We might expect some of these doublet, these doublet forms to sometimes be unstable, uh, but they are actually quite systematically unstable. Now, there are, uh, I want to talk now um, about uh, two models of language change, um, which we will then be able to hook back up to this question of the instability of doublets. One is the so-called drift model, which is very widely um, assumed. That model says, well, um, what happens to a language is that the relative frequencies of different forms drift over time. Drift uh, is a term uh, that goes back to Sapir. And eventually, the drift gets so extreme that perhaps one of the uh, options that used to be possible disappears from the language. Another way of thinking uh, about language change um, however, would be to say, no, no, the drift in usage is not uh, something that happens before the language changes. What happens instead is that the language changes. Um, that is to say, speakers of one group or one generation misacquire, misacquire from the point of view of what the language was like before, some features of the language. And these misacquired features lead to, if you like, a new dialect. And this new dialect appears in the speech um, uh, of the community and competes with the uh, old dialect because not everybody um, who was acquiring the language misacquired it. And this competition works itself out over time. And eventually, um, one of the uh, ways of speaking wins out over the other. It's important um, to understand that in this model, it's not that one um, set of speakers speaks one way and another set of speakers speak another way. That's not a problem. That's just two speech communities that may live side by side. What we find instead is that once a new form comes into uh, the language of a speech community, everybody uses both forms, both the old and the new form. And uh, the claim of this model is that that's a case of bidialectalism in the community. Now, in order for um, it to be possible for um, this kind of bidialectalism bi to emerge, it has to be the case that it's possible for uh, acquirers, uh, acquirers of a language to misacquire some features of it. Um, in ordinary uh, descriptive linguistics, there is an assumption that language acquisition is perfect. And for many purposes, that's a perfectly reasonable idealization. But exactly in the case of language change, it's a bit dangerous to assume that language acquisition is perfect. In the case uh, of uh, second language acquisition, it's known to be very, very imperfect. And many cases of language change actually arise out of the imperfections of second language acquisition in cases of language contact. Um, there, are, there are also, however, cases um, which seem like they might come from imperfections in first language acquisition. So one of the things that needs to be done, and um, I've begun to look at some of these cases, but there's a lot of work, more, more work that needs to be done, is to look at the time course and the accuracy of first language acquisition. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis um, in the acquisition literature on the skill that uh, children have in acquiring their first language. It's clearly quite spectacular. 
the question that I would want to raise from the point of view of the study of language change is whether there are any limits to this skill. Does, is, does it ever happen or to what extent does it happen that children actually um, uh, fail to get something that is present in the data? And when we look um, at the actual studies that have been done, we find that, th that errors of this sort, errors by children are very, very common. Um, they obviously mostly go away by the time the child is four or five years old. But they provide us with a population of variability uh, that could potentially be the source of language change. So here, this is just an example of uh, the use in, in one of the nominative case for the accusative in a German sentence by a German child. Um, here's a table from um, a, st a study by Harold Claussen. Uh, the thing to, to look at over here is um, the columns on the right. You see the zero, zero is the u the, the, that there are no data forms in this child's speech where the accusative is expected. But then you see the four and the eight those are accusative forms where the language actually requires the dative. Now, this is important because it's not the case system that the child hasn't learned. It's the proper use of, um, uh, of the accusative and the dative cases. Now, in English, the accusative and the dative have collapsed. So universal grammar here is uh, not going to help uh, the child at all uh, because the language doesn't, doesn't have to distinguish accusative from dative and doesn't have to distinguish them in the way that German does. So the child here is not um, reproducing um, the adult pattern perfectly. Um, eventually, of course, what happens is that the, uh, the child learns this. But if we think about different situations where the amount of evidence available to the child might rise or fall, depending on um, uh, particular features of the language, we see here that there's the potential for um, mislearning and the introduction of a new way of speaking into the community. Uh, it's particularly important to understand that the children who are making these kinds of errors are not just um, um, repeat, not just learning from models, but are actually also themselves models for other children. So once a child starts to make errors, the the learning situation of the other children in his or her immediate vicinity is complicated because these children are hearing both correct and incorrect forms. Uh, Alyssa's talk, the talk uh, obviously is, um, gives us information about how that could be resolved, but it's at least a problem that um, if children hear incorrect forms from other children, that could lead to um, another way of doing things, becoming part of the language. Uh, these are some uh, statistics from Russian. I, I will go over them very quickly, but the Russian, um, the d descriptions of uh, language acquisition of Russian say that the case system as a system is acquired by the age of two in the sense that you can never see with Russian children once they speak in um, clauses that show case marking that they, you, you never see a stage where they don't have case marking. But what you do see is a lot of, uh, of uh, imperfection in the realizations of the case forms and particularly the ones that are more irregular. So the whole complexity of the morpho morphological complexity of the Russian case system takes quite a long time for the child to acquire. Um, I'll skip this. Uh, it's, a, it's another instance of a, 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 a problem of for learning of, of Russian here, learning of the, for the uh, learning to use the genitive um, with a certain class of verbs. Now, why? Um, how is this all related uh, to language change? Um, well, as I said to you, I'm interested in a model of language change where the, uh, at the beginning of the change, what happens is that through some um, um, imperfection in transmission, whether it's second language acquisition or um, perhaps more rarely in the uh, historical data, actual uh, a failure to learn by children, um, you get a situation of grammar competition. And I want to oppose this to a case where you get drift of frequencies within a single linguistic system. Uh, the standard story for the shift in English from verb final to verb medial word order, this OV to VO shift, um, which goes back a very long time, was the standard story was that you got this shift as a result of a drift in frequencies. And the reason was that in Old English, VO word order occurs. Uh, it occurs, however, because the object has been shifted to the end of the sentence, and it's possible to show by grammatical analysis that something like this has happened. 
And the claim that was made by historical uh, syntacticians was that the rate of that shifting simply went up over time. And when the, ra when the shifting had become extremely frequent, uh, people just decided that that was the way you had to do things and they gave up on the old way of doing things. So the model was drift in the frequency of shifting followed by a reorganization of the rule system so that the unshifted version was no longer possible. Uh, but the evidence uh, that Susan Pinsook um, has um, come up with, the statistical evidence, about how the, um, the, the relative frequency of these two orders show that that really is unlikely to be true. <coughs> we can see, to begin with, um, we see that um, uh, we in, in, in sentence four, we find, this is a, a sentence from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, uh, this is a sentence which shows VO word order, which Pinsuk shows uh, on the basis of grammatical analysis, cannot be the result of shift. So the point of this example is to show that VO word order, which is not due to the shift of the object, occurs very early in the, in the historical evolution of, of the system. So if at, at this point, the frequency of VO word order on the surface is very low, and yet we find examples which seem grammatically not to be ex examples of the shifted type. Now, if we assume that what we, are, what we actually have here is a case of a new grammar coming into existence in the community and competing with the old grammar, we would expect these non-shifted VO sentences to be present from the beginning because they're characteristic of the new grammar. If we think that what we're looking at is drift, then the non-shifted type of VO should occur only at the end of the evolution because they are the result, would then be the result of giving up on the old system and reanalyzing everything as VO. Okay. But we, so this is a critical example. The fact that we find the non-shifted VO sentences, that there's to say VO word order not due to shift from the beginning of the evolution of this process is uh, evidence in favor of saying that the, that, the, that the movement in frequencies is not drift, but competition between the two forms, the two grammatical systems. Um, now, here's a, a, a little bit more indirect kind of statistical evidence um, for the same thing. In the top table, you see the frequency of VO word order um, in Beowulf, which is a very old text from the one of the earliest um, texts of the Old English period. In the bottom table, you see um, the same frequencies for late Old English, from in Old English about of about the year 1000. <coughs> the, uh, the critical uh, thing to understand, and I can't explain the details, is that the, the, um, the sentences here are grouped into two, into two groups, I initial and I final. The I final cases are cases where the post-verbal word order is due to shift, for sure. The I initial cases are actually ambiguous. If you look at what happens between the early Old English and late Old English in the I final case, you see a s somewhat of a drop in the rate of shifting. So the rate of shifting has not actually gone up, it's actually gone down. Okay? But when you look at the ambiguous cases, the rate of VO word order has gone up quite a lot between early Old English and late Old English. So why would that be? Well, the argument is, well, that's because the the I initial cases are cases which are exhibiting the competition between the old grammar and the new grammar, okay? and the new grammar is winning out over time. And the I final cases are the ones that are only allowed by the old grammar. So there you see only the, the object shift example. So what's actually happening is object shift is declining and VO word order is rising. So the standard old analysis that says VO word order is the result of increasing frequency of object shift is really completely inconsistent with this, in, uh, with this data. Um, I think, because I really don't have time, I won't go through this second case. And instead what I'll say is that uh, having found this kind of, um, this kind of um, you could say, unexpected result um, in one case, the thing that we did next was start looking for cases and asking ourselves, do we have, uh, what, what are we seeing here? Do we have evidence for grammatical reanalysis followed by competition versus drift followed by reanalysis? 
And what we have found in several cases, of which I only presented to you one, is that it's quite a general fact that the kinds of language changes that are attested in these texts, these syntactic changes, look like cases of reanalysis um, followed by competition and not like cases of drift followed by reanalysis. But, and the, I guess the, the, uh, the take home message of the talk for this uh, occasion is that a model of the, l of the speaker that allows the speaker to have more than one grammatical system makes the relationship between the data of, of production, the, the data that we have access to, um, and the underlying system responsible for it more complicated than um, the simplest models um, uh, have, um, um, have assumed. Thanks. Right, um, and that's uh, the interesting question is whether um, do we want to say that um, the distinction between sublanguages is sort of now are we going to just sort of build that into our grammatical system, right? And then we'll say no, there's really only one grammar; it just branches, right? Uh, or do we want to think that in in the context of a single, uh, if you like, occasion of use? a writer or speaker may actually have available the choice of more than one system, right? And, and that's the difference between sociolinguistic variation as it's been studied by uh, Lebov and others, where there are real variable I variables in the system and other ways of talking about that variation which use <coughs> notions like register, right? And say, no, 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 there's no real linguistic variation. There are just two registers and, y and the choice of register is just a rule like any other rule, right? And these things can get, you know, whether the one way or the other way is the right way to think about it is a tricky question. But I don't think they're the same way of talking. Yeah. Uh, oh, right, because I didn't go into that. Uh, because the evidence um, in Germanic is that particles do not ever shift across the verb. Um, in, in verb final Germanic languages, you never find the particle to the right of the verb. No. In a verb final Germanic language, the particle never occurs to the right of the verb. Right, okay, okay, yeah, that's the reason, right? So we, this is a general property of the Germanic languages, and it allows us to distinguish very nicely the North Germanic languages from the West Germanic languages, and Old English from Modern English. Somebody mentioned Yiddish. Um, Yiddish works like German, and the same thing is true of Yiddish as is true of German. No, 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 it really. There's some other things that are true of Yiddish that complicate the picture, but in the relevant regard, it's like German. You also find that, yes. Yeah, you also find that. And you also find ut adreifen thona athling, of course. But that's the, that's the old order. Does that work? Yes. Uh, there was a in the uh, generation uh, in which um, Arvind Joshi uh, did and Naomi Sager uh, way back when. And um, uh, I think that Harris would have been a little surprised 
uh, and maybe even a little dismayed, uh, uh, first of all, at this uh, title of a talk, uh, and uh, uh, secondly, uh, in the uh, kind of work uh, where I ended up. Um, we don't really think of uh, uh, Zelig Harris uh, as being involved very directly in the problem uh, of language learning, uh, except at the levels that uh, Lissa, of course, was talking about, uh, or certainly not at the, um, uh, the level where we're talking about uh, uh, the acquisition of word meaning. Uh, in fact, Harris had uh, um, was a little suspicious uh, uh, of notions uh, uh, like uh, word meaning. So I want to give you... Um, uh, at least the flavor of how I got into this kind of work uh, and how after some time in it, uh, what I had learned uh, from, uh, from studying with Harris uh, seemed uh, to come back uh, and provide uh, some approach uh, to trying to understand uh, uh, these phenomena. Um, okay, so here... Harris was, was, was very cautious about this uh, and, um, uh, and said that the work that he was doing, quite properly, uh, uh, wasn't going to t uh, tell us directly about processes of learning or processes of human computation, uh, but maybe could give some uh, evidence that people who studied these things uh, 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 could use. Uh, and I think that came true, uh, uh, at least in part, uh, in the work that I'm going to tell you about. Okay, so, ooh. Um, uh, so here's the problem, uh, and that is the problem of how children learn uh, word meanings. Uh, and there seems to be a pretty um, uh, straightforward answer. There's a traditional answer to uh, how you learn the meanings of words. Uh, and that is you observe the context of their use. Uh, and this story goes way back. Um, uh, everybody believes it. John Locke believed it. Uh, the man in the street believed it. Everybody believes that this must be uh, the way you acquire word meanings. And the reason I suppose everybody believes it is because ultimately this has to be the answer. I mean, this is true. This is how you learn word meanings. Uh, but even though this is so, uh, uh, such a remark of this sort, you learn the word meanings by looking around and seeing what's happening, uh, leaves a great deal uh, to the imagination. Uh, so I want to mention a couple of, of, uh, of problems here where everybody knows about this who thinks for more than three minutes about this problem, is that any event, uh, scene, property that you observe in the world any, anything that you look at is subject to a large variety of interpretations. Uh, so it looks to be a very difficult computational problem uh, involving observation over many times and in many situations uh, for you to parse out of these situations uh, enough to find out if a new word means apple, let us say, or think. Uh, all of them are pertinent in some way to the situation. So how are you going to decide which is which? Uh, furthermore, for some words, observation doesn't seem to be a very useful way in principle of learning the meaning of, of a word. Okay, So I'm thinking of a situation, which may or may not be true here, where everybody to the left of the center aisle uh, is thinking. Okay, and everybody to the right of the center aisle is not thinking. So suppose I say to you, uh, the word I'm thinking of in some language is blicket. And it applies to the people over here, and it doesn't apply to the people over here. You can look as long as you want, but it's not going to give you any insight uh, into the fact that the word I have in mind means think. Okay, you just can't observe thinking. I mean, here's a lucky person uh, who hears the word think uh, while at the Rodin Museum downtown. Uh, but most people aren't in this situation. So how could you learn the meaning of the word think by uh, observing what's going on around you? 
look aside, okay? Uh, there are worse situations, uh, uh, cases which Harris was very interested in, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, of pairs of words uh, that describe the same situation, uh, but from two perspectives, from the point of view of a speaker. So they occur in just about the same situations, right? So you hear chase when you, when you see a scene of chasing, you're also seeing a, ch a scene of fleeing. When you see buying, you see selling. When you see leading, you see following, and so forth and so on. Uh, so we ought to expect that these pairs would make great difficulty in acquisition. Right? If you're learning from observing the situations, they occur in the same situations. So how come children don't think chase means flee, that these are synonyms, uh, some children have them backwards, and so forth. It's not the case that these things never happen, but they're vanishingly rare. People get this right too often um, uh, uh, for the story of learning by observation to explain without at least some further detail. Um, Barbara Landau and I uh, got involved in this tricky problem because again, we saw situations where children seem to know more than they should. Uh, we we um, uh, were looking at language acquisition in blind children here uh, and um, uh, with the hope of getting some insight into how observation does its work uh, in uh, word learning. Uh, and the um, remarkable fact uh, is that blind children in ways very analogous uh, to um, uh, sighted children uh, understand the meanings of apparently of terms that apparently refer to sight, uh, but certainly refer to perception, uh, and they're learning these under circumstances that are quite different. The input circumstances are different uh, uh, from the ones in which sighted children uh, learn these words. They even know a great deal about color terms uh, and what these mean. So. Um, well, let me, let me turn to another problem here, related problem. Um, if you look at the input uh, to word learning, you could ask yourself the question, uh, do children learn what's there? Okay, and, and here's one way of looking at this situation, looking here at sort of the distribution of nouns and verbs, their sheer frequency uh, in the speech of adults that little children hear. And one could ask the question, and many people have, uh, is the output, the relative frequency of nouns and verbs, does that predict the rate at which children learn nouns and verbs? Uh, and as you can see by visual comparison of these two figures, something very funny is going on around here. Okay, because, um, while it's true that there are usually, in most languages, more nouns heard than verbs in speech to young children, uh, that disparity is nowhere near uh, what it is in the output of children's speech. So nouns, verbs, adjectives, prepositions, all of that stuff goes into the child's ear, uh, but early in language acquisition, out come nouns. So I want to concentrate on that uh, phenomenon uh, and ask, uh, using it, and showing you some experimental evidence, uh, whether we can understand uh, how it is, uh, why it is, that early acquisition looks so different from the input uh, in this regard. Okay, so there are two main ways that people think about this issue. And the first is, well, um, nouns are conceptually easy. Uh, and verbs, relational terms, are just conceptually more difficult, okay? So nouns label the objects very typically. Verbs label the relationships between those objects. Uh, little brains can't understand these relationships or can't understand them very well, and therefore they only learn the object terms, okay? So I, let me concretize that theory uh, you've probably seen this before, but I think it's a very good example uh, of the conceptual change theory of why you learn what you learn, right? So here's Ginger. 
So ginger here is nouns, verbs, adjectives, prepositions, and so forth and so on, right? But only learns, not only only learns the nouns, but all this creature learns uh, is the word uh, ginger. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with the environment, uh, but the environment gets filtered through an inadequate uh, conceptual system, uh, and that's why the child at first only learns uh, 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 what she does. And I would say that is the dominant position uh, in developmental psychology about why the early vocabulary of children looks the way it is. But I want to take another look, um, uh, uh, which I think you may agree, uh, looks closer uh, to the kind of, of, of um, uh, story that might come out of uh, 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 Zelig Harris's way uh, of looking at language. That rather than it being some change inside the learner, uh, it is a change in the kinds of information, relevant information, uh, that are uh, available uh, as learning begins. Okay, so um, uh, here you have the relevant uh, remark on this topic from, uh, from Harris from uh, his 1951 book uh, in which he's describing the checking procedures uh, uh, of his uh, theory, okay? And um, you have this uh, reiteration of these two steps uh, in doing distributional analysis, right? So you do distributional analysis over some representation uh, and the output of that uh, is some new categories. Uh, and then you do distributional information over those new categories. So gradually you build up higher and higher uh, levels of uh, representation. Uh, and I think a great deal of the story of word learning uh, operates uh, in much uh, this way. So. Uh, we looked at this uh, issue experimentally uh, by trying to remove conceptual change, that first story, as a possible explanation of how the children were learning the word meanings. To remove conceptual change uh, as the story, we look at adults learning new words. Okay, but what words? Very, very simple words, words that they've known since they were two years old, really, uh, in English, uh, and we put them in a situation where we only give them certain kinds of information and ask whether the structure of the information that you, did you, that says 10 minutes? The structure of the information that you give to the learner uh, holds the key for why uh, they learn what they learn. Okay, so um, here's, uh, the first step in, in, uh, in um, uh, uh, such an experiment uh, where we take the position that probably the only thing that you can do when you learn the first few words that you learn uh, is exactly what John Locke was talking about. All you can do is you hear some sound, okay, learned by the methods uh, uh, that Lissa described to you. You recognize some recurrent sound and you try to map it against what's going on uh, in the world around you. So you hear Blicket and you look wildly around the world uh, and see what recurs with Blicket. Is there an elephant usually there? Uh, uh, and so forth. To simulate this process in adults, uh, what we do is we show them real scenes in which uh, mothers are talking to their babies, uh, but we want them to learn by use only of uh, what's going on in these scenes uh, when the word is said. So how could that be done? We just see it's a, about a 45 second videotape. We turn off the sound, okay? You see the scene, uh, but when the mystery word is said, at the very instant that the mother really utters the mystery word in this situation, uh, the subject hears a beep on the tape. Okay, so the subject gets six scenes in which real mothers were saying this mystery word, okay, uh, and they have to make a guess as to what that word was. 
So it's analogous to listening to you. It's exactly the same as listening to your television, uh, but the sound is turned off. Okay. But you do know when the word is said. Okay, so um, uh, because you don't learn from one scene, that's why we give people a half a dozen uh, observations. So you might uh, try this out. Uh, we help our subjects out in this case, and we say, this time you're trying to learn a verb. And these are just stills, cartoon stills, from the videos that subjects actually see. Uh, and um, you're trying to guess exactly what verb the mother was really saying in these circumstances. Is that clear? OK. So um, uh, it's hard. It's really quite difficult. Uh, and here's the outcome of this kind of experiment. Uh, what happens in this experiment uh, is that one reproduces uh, the little baby function that I showed you before. If you only give adult subjects the scenes in which words were used, they learn nouns vastly more efficiently than they learn verbs. Okay, so remember, the words that we're trying to get these people to learn are the simplest words. Okay, they're the words that children know by the time they're two years of age. Okay, so why is it that they're having trouble with the verbs and they're not having trouble with the nouns? Uh, it, seems, it can't be anything about their conceptual structure. Uh, what it has to be uh, is the limitation uh, on information, okay? So, uh, just showing you these results again in another way. For every one of these common nouns that we show subjects, at least some of the subjects get it correct. As for the verbs, a third of the verbs are never learned by any subject from this information. Even though they're these simple verbs like run and eat and so forth and so on, Subject can't learn them by observing the situations in which they're used. And you can see why when you look at the items that the subjects don't learn, okay, there, it's perfectly obvious why you don't learn them. So you can't tell from observation that people are thinking, knowing, seeing, so forth. Mothers aren't shy, but we remember these are, these are verbs that are used frequently, highly frequently, by mothers to their 18-month-old children. Okay. But you can't learn them from observation, uh, and therefore they're not learned. So notice where, where the idea that it's limited conceptual structure comes from. Okay. The verbs that you don't learn seem very abstract, deep, mental content verbs, things about your mental states, uh, uh, and so forth, well, I, I think your first thought would be, how could a little child think about thinking? That must be the problem. Uh, and of course, for all I know, that's true. It could be that the reason 18-month-olds don't learn the meaning of the word think is they can't think about thinking. But notice from these data, you, you don't have to say that. In order to account for the fact that think is learned late, you don't have to say it's because the person was too primitive mentally to learn it. It's enough to say, if, you got, if, if this is the information from which you have to learn, uh, Einstein can't learn the meaning of think, neither can anybody else. Okay? Um, it's a, a limitation uh, on the data source. Okay, so five minutes for everything, right? All right, so. Uh, the idea behind these experiments is to gradually, is to, with different subject groups, give different kinds of information uh, and see what kinds of words, here we're looking at verbs in particular, can be learned efficiently from uh, uh, different data sources. So let me rush through some of this. Of course, there's uh, the distribution of, of uh, words. Right? So once you've learned the nouns, and that's essentially the story I'm trying to tell you, if you've learned the nouns, 
and you hear the nouns, the co-occurrence of these two nouns, uh, then you could have another source of evidence about what the verb might be, right? And, and uh, Fernando talked about some of this uh, earlier on. But first you have to learn the nouns, right? So um, uh, we see an order uh, in, these, in the acquisition of parts of the vocabulary because each time it's dependent on doing an analysis lower down. Nouns from observation of the world, certain kinds of concrete nouns from an observation of the world, but given the nouns, now you can do a distributional analysis across the nouns and get some further information. Um, and that's looked at in an experiment in which we now take the six sentences, but the person doesn't see the scenes. He just sees, is told, these were the nouns that the mother used uh, when she said the mystery verb. So guess what noun that is. So you can see you probably have, an, can take a good guess here uh, uh, in this case. Okay. Uh, but of course, still that's not enough information. But given that you knew the nouns, and I won't be able to talk about this, given that you know the nouns, you have a beginning method for building what's language particular about the phrase structure uh, of your language. So uh, here's a situation in which we ask the question, suppose you knew the phrase structure of the language that you're learning, uh, could you take, could you now acquire uh, a different kind of item? Okay, so I think you probably can do this, right? You probably know the, right? So here, this is Lewis Carroll method, uh, where we're trying to give a person a hint about what the structures are in which these words occur. And given knowledge of, that's the same six sentences, but now you're seeing the structure. Uh, uh, of those sentences, um, now you can, not only is it now possible to learn mental content verbs, but it's much easier to learn mental content verbs <laughs> than verbs like run or eat from this kind of, of information. Okay, so, um, so uh, since the time is running out, let me just show you one case where we, um, one can show that little children use this kind of structural information uh, to learn the meanings uh, of um, uh, verbs. Okay, so in, this, is, this study was done by um, um, uh, Letty Nagels, and it asked the question, uh, suppose you know something uh, about the structure uh, of English, uh, will that help you decide uh, on the meaning of a word in an amb a meaning of a verb in an ambiguous situation? So, uh, Lisa told you something about this kind of situation. Okay, uh, in this case, uh, child sitting on the mother's lap. Uh, it sees scenes on those videotapes. Uh, some linguistic stimulus is given, and now the question is. Uh, in, as a result of this linguistic stimulus, uh, what does the child think uh, about what's going on in the world? So this is the particular, one particular input. Uh, so what the child sees uh, is, um, is a complicated scene in which a duck is, a rabbit is pushing a duck into a squatting position, and the rabbit and the duck are both wheeling their arm, right? So that's the ambiguous situation for language learning. How are you going to decide whether the word means um, wheel your arm or forced to squat, right? Um, and this is tested after the child is introduced using one of these structures or the other, okay? The child hears the rabbit is gorping the duck or the rabbit and the duck are gorping, uh, and then, uh, the scenes are differentiated, okay? On one screen, there comes up a situation in which there's only forcing to squat, but there's no arm wheeling, uh, and on the other side, uh, the two are wheeling their arms. Uh, and 
given that you have a child of about 20 months, children who are beginning to say verbs, uh, the child looks at the screen that matches the syntactic uh, introducing circumstance. So, uh, um, okay. So, uh, let me just finish up. Um, the um, general position uh, that uh, we take on how these words get learned uh, is in fact very close to Harris's point of view. Uh, and that is, one keeps building this, building higher and higher level representations uh, of the language, uh, and these higher level representations enable further learning, okay? So, indeed, observation of the circumstances in which words are used uh, is the basis for learning their uh, meanings. But there are so many possibilities in the world uh, that it's just hopeless. It can't be done. So you need some procedures for narrowing uh, the hypothesis space here. Uh, and those procedures have to do with sophisticated representations uh, of the linguistic input along with the sin. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Uh, yes. Right. And the, the, when the mother says, um, get the ball, yes. the, the child goes and kicks the ball into the other room. Yes. And the mother then, I mean, it, it, it becomes clear to the child, even if the child doesn't know a lot about language, right. by the action of the mother, that, that what it thought was it was supposed to do was incorrect. Uh, yes. Um, the, the question here is, uh, aren't you leaving aside uh, all sorts of facts about social interaction uh, that um, also, or maybe instead, uh, uh, facilitate uh, uh, the acquisition uh, of these words. And um, yes, okay, there are all sorts of, 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 um, of uh, additional sources of information that are used. But let me all of that, not all of that, but a lot of that pragmatics is available in the situation that we're giving to these adults. So let me tell you one interesting story. So they're seeing these 45 second events, right? One after another. Um, and you might say, well, so here's the, it's exactly the situation you're talking of. The, maybe the verb that is learned best from observation alone, which is not too great. Uh, uh, I mean, it's not too large a percentage of the words. Uh, is the verb um, come? Now it turned out that by random, every, every one of the six observations of the word come was a situation of the child going. Okay? So, you see in these situations, the kid is playing around with the ball, okay? Uh, the ball rolls away, the kid runs out of the scene, okay, and you hear beep, right? So there are six observations. Each one of them is a situation in which the child goes. But the subjects in the experiment are able to make use of the pragmatics that you're talking about, okay? Because they're human beings. I'm sure children can too. So they realize that you say, come, because somebody goes. Right? So this, situ this experimental situation is, of course, targeted up in various ways uh, and oversimplifies. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, I think you can make a compelling case that information of this, source, of this sort gets used by children and by adults in the course of learning. Thank you. Oops.
things um, can be uh, best achieved through uh, a, an analysis of the uh, distribution or uh, of lexical items, the probabilistic evidence uh, that is provided by distribution of, of uh, lexical items. Now, uh, Harris used this as a, a tool for uh, descriptive uh, linguistics and uh, discovering uh, structure in language. And uh, it, from, from his readings, at least my interpretation of the readings uh, uh, of reading uh, Harris is that uh, he wasn't as interested uh, necessarily in uh, whether this was a, a valid psychological theory of, uh, of learning. Uh, and even uh, uh, human uh, language comprehension as it goes on in adults on the fly. Uh, there's, there's always been a, a connection. Uh, but the, it, the interesting thing also is that in computer science of late, uh, this has been uh, uh, taking off, taken off as a way of uh, achieving uh, rather high performance in recovering structure from, from input in computational models. And again, uh, with the exception of, of a few people, uh, uh, in particular Arvin Joshi and others, many didn't think of this as uh, necessarily a, a plausible psychological theory uh, uh, because uh, there was a view that uh, much of this sort of statistical evidence might not be deployed and, and rather strict rule-governed systems are used to recover uh, structure uh, in, in humans, uh, in adults. Uh, but uh, of late, psycholinguistic theories have moved uh, greatly towards uh, statistical models of, of parsing, and many of them have taken advantage of uh, uh, linguistic formalisms where structure has been highly lexicalized. Uh, uh, detailed linguistic structure uh, has been entered into the lexicon uh, uh, examples are, for instance, uh, LTAG. Uh, and uh, so to give an, an example of this, uh, what one might want to propose is that when recognizing a verb, uh, you not only retrieve or activate the, the core meaning of the verb, uh, but also uh, detailed uh, uh, syntactic and semantic information uh, about its argument structure. And uh, the uh, proposal would be uh, uh, that the recognition of a verb includes the frequency-based activation of uh, argument structure, where uh, when a verb has multiple frames which uh, it can appear in, uh, we're highly sensitive to not only this fact, but the uh, probability with which one uh, frame is going to occur uh, over another. Now, uh, how can we test this claim uh, experimentally? Uh, there, there are a number of different ways uh, to do this, uh, but one of the most uh, tried and true methods within uh, psycholinguistics uh, for understanding something about the organization of, of uh, the lexicon has been to use uh, lexical priming techniques uh, where you have a prime word and a target and you see whether the prime word facilitates the processing of, of the target. And of course, uh, very simple things like uh, the uh, words that are associated or uh, words that are semantically re related will uh, facilitate, facilitate processing. Um, so a, uh, a two words that are, are related are going to increase uh, reaction time. And the most common tasks are usually something like naming a word or making a lexical decision uh, about a word. But one of the problems is that if you're interested in uh, what, what sort of grammatical information is activated during word recognition, that uh, these sorts of tasks, this naming a word aloud or deciding whether it's a word or not, usually don't uh, require uh, the person to tap any of their syntactic knowledge of the wor word or, or make use of it for the decision. Uh, but recently, there's been uh, the development of a lexical intervention technique, a priming technique, uh, that, is, that can be deployed uh, during continuous uh, language comprehension. Uh, this uh, technique was called uh, fast priming and developed by Keith Rayner and uh, Sarah Serino and others, uh, uh, where uh, continuous reading of text is, is uh, going on and you are tracking a person's eye movements as they read the, the text. And when you encounter a target word, instead uh, a prime word, a different word is presented for a very brief amount of time, uh, usually on the order of about 30 milliseconds, 
And uh, participants are unable to, uh, at least they, they report uh, at the ends of experiments and when you uh, do uh, recognition studies, uh, asking them uh, explicitly to try to identify these primes, uh, you find that they have great difficulty identifying these primes. Uh, they appear to be a flicker, usually, to a reader on the screen. And these studies showed that uh, orthographic, phonological, and semantic uh, uh, relationships between the prime and the target uh, can uh, alter uh, fixation times relative to uh, unrelated uh, controls and non-word uh, controlled primes. Now, uh, we have been taking advantage of this technique in a number of studies, uh, uh, the first of which were done in collaboration with uh, Al Kim, to look at uh, the activation of grammatical information uh, during the uh, course of, uh, of the reading of, of a sentence uh, by adults. And uh, for, uh, for this case, uh, what we did we, was that we provided uh, subjects with sentences to read in which uh, uh, a syntactic ambiguity, a temporary syntactic ambiguity arose at a, a certain point in the sentence. Uh, and uh, in this case, the noun phrase, the fire, uh, could be the direct object of the verb accepted, or it could be the start of a, an embedded sentence, a sentence complement. And this is precisely because of our knowledge of uh, this verb ex accepted, which allows either of these uh, syntactic alternatives. Uh, what do readers do when they read a sentence of this sort? They usually experience uh, a garden path, a misinterpretation, even actually, uh, and I, I can go into this later, even though uh, fire is also sort of an implausible direct object of the verb uh, accepted. Uh, what you see is uh, signs that people have uh, temporarily taken the fire as a direct object and then uh, realize that this is incorrect uh, and try to recover the uh, subordinate alternative in which the verb uh, allows a sentence complement. Indeed, if you look at a large corpus of English, you'll find that uh, the, the, the verb accepted is most, most often used uh, with a direct object and very, very rarely used with just a, a sentence complement. Uh, what we did in this study was uh, we applied the fast priming technique uh, at the verb, uh, where we presented for a very brief amount of time, 39 milliseconds in our study, uh, one of two sorts of prime words. Uh, a verb like obtained, which is a, a direct object uh, uh, transitive verb, or a verb like insisted, which strongly wants uh, a sentence complement. And uh, the question is uh, that, the question is, uh, will this brief display of a prime tip the scales uh, uh, for the reader, uh, provide them with the uh, relevant information to uh, actually avoid the garden path uh, uh, from the, uh, the brief display uh, that is, uh, uh, that's occurring uh, at the verb? Uh, the lexicalist predictions are that, well, if detailed grammatical information, uh, probabilistic information about which structures are likely is provided during the recognition of the verb, uh, we should see uh, a garden path effect for DO primes uh, and little and no garden path for SC primes. And I should mention that uh, as the uh, control, we remove the ambiguity by uh, comparing these two priming conditions with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the sentence, uh, an unambiguous form of the sentence where the word that is inserted uh, after the verb. And in that case, we expect that the priming should have uh, little or no effect because uh, the uh, complementizer that makes it uh, essentially unambiguous as uh, the start of a sentence complement. Um, uh, this, uh, this study was done actually with a self-paced reading version of uh, the uh, fast priming technique. And this just gives you a sense of what the subjects are doing. They start off by seeing on the computer screen a set of dashes uh, which are, are, they know, cover up individual words, uh, where each of these equal signs is uh, indicating a character in the word. They press a button, they get the first word. They press another button, they, they get the second word. And we're recording their response time on each of these words, uh, where increases in reading time are going to show uh, signs of processing difficulty. Uh, and in this particular case, when they press the button, uh, for 39 milliseconds, the verb realized might be up on the screen. Uh, and then it's quickly replaced by uh, a target verb uh, like accepted, and they uh, keep going. And the perception that the subjects have uh, from this display is some sort of flicker. They think that, well, maybe they, they do detect the flicker, 
and they, they often think that uh, you know, maybe there was some problem in, in how the program was uh, uh, implemented. These are psych psychologists, after all, trying to do these experiments. So there might have been some uh, error in the display, uh, but they, they're unable to identify what that prime is. And here are uh, the increases in reading time for the ambiguous uh, sentences as compared to the unambiguous sentences for the direct object primes as compared to the sentence complement primes. And uh, what you can see is uh, that there is a uh, large uh, garden path effect for uh, DO primes and that this garden path, uh, the increases in reading time here are, are uh, this is reading times for the ambiguous minus the unambiguous, so positive reading times indicate a str uh, strong uh, garden path effect. And we can see that that garden path effect is pruned, is, is reduced when we provide uh, a sentence complement prime. Uh, and in uh, follow-up work, we've even shown that if you prime with nouns that have certain uh, argument structures, uh, like uh, factives, like idea, which uh, want to take a sentence complement as well, that we actually can uh, reduce the garden path effect uh, uh, with nouns. Uh, again, uh, this, is, this is quite striking because what it suggests is that uh, it really is something about the, the structure of uh, this lexical item uh, that's being passed, that, that's overlapping between uh, these, these two items. And it doesn't really matter that the major category is different. It's what the, uh, the subcategory information is, is telling you about guiding your decision process. Uh, now, in the second half of this talk, I want to briefly uh, mention some, some work that we've been doing in which we look at priming uh, in the auditory domain. And these studies are quite, uh, quite important to do because if, you're just, uh, if you want to make uh, conclusions about language comprehension more generally, of course, you don't want to uh, rely solely on reading. But also, uh, the, the technique that we've uh, been using for these auditory sentence comprehension uh, experiments allows us to look at language comprehension in context, in a situation in which there's actually a referential world, something in front of you that, that you can see that the speech is referring to. Um, and that, and uh, w as I explain, and I'll explain in a minute, we actually have a continuous uh, measure of this comprehension process, what people are thinking the speech is referring to as they hear it. Uh, and uh, the technique in particular uh, was one that's uh, been uh, developed uh, quite a bit by uh, Mike Tannenhaus's lab up at the University of Rochester in which uh, a subject is wearing a uh, eye tracking visor and we're recording their eye movements as they hear speech that refers to objects in front of them. And it turns out that the eye movements uh, of subjects uh, is closely time locked with the speech. Uh, it's often closely time locked with the speech. Uh, and it provides us with a continuous measure of uh, what subjects are thinking the, the words are referring to as the speech is unfolding. Uh, so for instance, you're, the subject's hearing uh, pick up the square. And uh, what we can see on these two computer monitors is the analysis of the eye image. And this is the scene image, what the subject is looking at. Both of these cameras are mounted on, on this visor. And the eye image is analyzed in real time by an eye tracking uh, program. And a uh, coordinate is plotted on this video image uh, showing uh, where the subject is looking at that uh, moment, at that video frame. And we can relate the speech uh, at any given point in, in time uh, with the eye position to uh, try to give us a window into uh, the online uh, referential processes that must be going on as they, they hear the instruction. Uh, we've been modifying that te technique uh, to try to apply uh, this, this priming procedure to it. Uh, and uh, this is work done with uh, Jared uh, and Al. Um, and uh, in the, these particular studies, uh, they hear a, a male voice giving the instructions uh, but a female voice is uh, uh, saying a prime word uh, on a different digital track. And the onset of the prime and the target word uh, 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 the, are, are from separate files are digitally mixed together uh, such that they hear something like, uh, now I'd like you to turn the bear. And at turn, uh, there's a voice in the background saying clean. And the duration of the prime and target verb are matched as well. Now the first thing is that after the experiment is over, we can ask subjects whether they heard these primes. 
And subjects report being either unaware that the primes were there, uh, or if they were aware of them, that they were rarely able to identify them. They often said something like, uh, they sound like someone saying something in the background. And there's actually a, a long history of studying this sort of thing in uh, the attention literature in perception, uh, dichotic listening studies uh, and, uh, in which uh, one's examining uh, what can be uh, heard in an unattended uh, channel. Now, the uh, primes did not uh, uh, dis and disrupt uh, the understanding of the sentence. People were 100% uh, accurate at carrying out the instructions. They had no trouble hearing uh, the sentences. Uh, they, and here is what uh, a target scene uh, might be like uh, for uh, the subject. They uh, were using little tiny beanie baby dolls here because we also do studies uh, with children, but these were done with adults. Uh, the scene includes, uh, uh, it's clear to see for the subject, maybe not as clear in this, in this photo, uh, a pig holding a knife, uh, a bear uh, holding a stick, uh, a larger stick here, and a computer diskette, and uh, they hear an instruction that ha that's uh, ambiguous, that has an attachment ambiguity. Uh, now I'd like you to turn the bear with the stick, where with the stick could be uh, connected, uh, uh, could be the instrument of the verb, uh, indicating how to do the turning, or it could be the modifier of the noun telling you uh, something about the bear. Uh, and uh, they hear, um, oh, and I should also mention that with a scene like this, uh, you should encourage instrument use because there's, uh, by the subjects because there's only one bear here and it would be essentially somewhat redundant to also uh, specify that, it, that it's holding the stick. Uh, and so you might expect people to take that with the stick to be uh, an instrument reading. Uh, the verb itself, so these, all these verbs were normed uh, both in sentence generation studies and, and corpus analyses. These verbs are equibias in the sense that when they, hear a prep, when they occur with a preposition with, there's an equal chance of it uh, indicating an instrument or being a modifier of a noun. And we used uh, auditory primes, uh, which were also normed in the same way. A verb like clean uh, really would like to have an instrument, and a verb like hug uh, really would like with the X to be a modifier. And uh, here's something uh, what, like what they hear. And in fact, in this case, it's easier to hear it than uh, it is uh, usually, uh, I believe. And, if, it, if you can hear it over the system. Now I'd like you to turn the bear with the stick. Let's do it again. Now I'd like you to turn the bear with the stick. I don't know whether only one channel's coming over or not. I couldn't hear it at all uh, in that case, which I think it might be that only one channel's coming over. Uh, they were mixed, not want left to right, but mixed together. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the predictions are that we should see uh, increased looks to this potential instrument, uh, this large stick, uh, upon hearing with the stick, uh, when uh, we prime with a verb like clean, and decrease looks when we prime with a verb like hug, and that this may even affect uh, their actions as well, with an increased probability of actually picking up the stick and using it to carry out the instruction. Uh, first, the eye movements. Uh, what I'm showing here is the uh, proportion of trials, uh, you can think of this as the proportion of subjects, essentially, uh, that are looking at the uh, target instrument, the stick, at uh, moments in time, and in this case, it's uh, in frames, a 30th of a second, uh, from the onset of stick, and as, as stick unfolds, uh, the duration of stick is, is approximately uh, 500 milliseconds uh, or to uh, 600 milliseconds, so out to about frame 15 uh, to 20 is the offset of stick. And what you can see is that the increased probability of looking at the stick uh, is affected by this prime verb. Uh, if we use an instrument prime, we see uh, increases in uh, the proportion of looks to that uh, instrument. Uh, and if we use a modifier prime verb, uh, there's a there's decreased chance of, of this. And uh, this becomes reliable 400 to 600 milliseconds after the onset of stick. It's a very early effect. Uh, and, uh, and it even shows up in uh, their offline uh, actions in which they are, uh, in which we see uh, increased use of instruments 
uh, in uh, the uh, instrument prime condition as compared to the modifier prime condition. And this is another measure of the eye movements uh, where we show, again, uh, the significant effect. Um, in experiment two, just briefly wanted to mention that if we use a scene in which there are two uh, bears, this supports the modifier interpretation uh, uh, strongly because you want with the stick to distinguish between these two bears. And uh, again, we're going to look at the proportion of looks to uh, the instrument. But to, to cut this off uh, shorter, to, make the, uh, to fit the time here, uh, there, I just want to say that there are small effects of priming, but actually the context the, uh, squelches the use uh, of the instrument uh, interpretation. Uh, in other words, adults also use the context quite rapidly to inform their parsing commitments. Uh, now, uh, I will briefly uh, try to answer the question, what sorts of representations are being primed by these verbs? Another way of asking this really is what sorts of representations are not being primed? It isn't simple lexical association because uh, we get cases like brush priming looks to the paper, poke to, for barrette, feed for pipe cleaner, hit for feather. There aren't straightforward associations here. It's also not uh, the core meaning uh, of the verb. Uh, people never acted out the prime verb. There wasn't blending. So when you hear a sentence like, now I'd like you to turn the bear with a stick, and you prime with hug, you don't get affectionate turning. You don't get fastidious uh, turning with clean. Um, instead, what we seem to be tapping here is argument structure, uh, detailed information about how this verb combines with phrases and what these combinations uh, mean. Uh, so I seem to be out of time, uh, so I'm just going to, to end by uh, saying that these sorts of findings suggest a, a system that's highly tuned to statistical regularities in language and that the recognition of word includes parallel activation of word meanings, but also parallel activation of the uh, grammatical properties needed for sentence comprehension. Yes. Yes. Uh, in fact, we, we selected these items uh, in such a way that the noun uh, was uh, a semantic is was a poor object of the verb uh, accepted, and uh, this was done because of studies, non-priming studies that our lab has done, and, and studies by Susan Garnsey, uh, which show uh, that these sorts of materials show very large increases in processing difficulty. Uh, where uh, there's a slowdown at the noun because people are realizing that it's a, a poor direct object, but also a further slowdown, which is believed to, at the verb could, which is believed to be due to re trying to recover the appropriate uh, structure. And we chose those items because that the, they showed a large effect in hopes that we could then see a reduction due to pr the priming. It was uh, specifically for that reason. Tony. Uh, we uh, have been uh, using, actually, the second set of studies actually are of that sort, where the verb tends to use one structure over another, uh, if that's what you're asking, rather than a verb that requires, requires one structure. Say, say this again. I'm, I'm that's right. Yes, and in fact, in all of these studies, when we do correlational analyses on these, these, these items, we actually see a, a correlational effect as well. So it, it, it's an item by item effect. Uh, and when you do non-priming studies, looking at people's tendency to commit to one interpretation over the other, just from a verb that's in the sentence itself, not a, a primed one, you see graded uh, effects. Again, supporting some sort of probabilistic system for trying, for trying to uh, resolve the ambiguity.
Yeah, I would say that they're, they're, they're activating either analysis, they're activating both analyses to uh, more or less, uh, to, to greater extent or less extent. Uh, it's really actually hard to, to experimentally tease apart that sort of uh, graded model from sort of a stochastic type of model uh, because we're averaging across a, a number of subjects and we're using measures like reaction time, continuous measures, reaction time is very hard to then prove that we have a bimodal distribution uh, in our data as, uh, and which would support uh, the stochastic model. So it's very, that's a, that's a tough question. In fact, uh, a num some people are trying to tackle that right now and it's hard to do. Semantics generated. It's Harry's and generative semantics vindicated. Well, in 1951, just after the publication of Methods of Structural Linguistics, I was a freshman. I was a young student of linguistics, and my professor entered the classroom waving about the book and says, ladies and gentlemen, this is the most awful, the silliest book that has appeared in linguistics ever. That roused my curiosity, and it became a major source of inspiration to me later. <laughs> so, what I want to do is to take up and pursue a little further one of the many strands of thought developed by this highly inspired man. Um, for whom I've always had a great veneration. And what is it that I want to take up and develop? Well, my veneration, if I may say, for Selig Harris has also been tempered a little bit by his, what I have always perceived as his extreme positivism. I am much less positivistic than he was throughout his life and much more European mentalistic, I look for links with the late 19th century people like Wundt and Brentano um, and <coughs> the kind of linguistics that went, that, that went on in those days, but of course enriched with the um, very uh, valuable and indispensable 20th century formal insights, wiser and sadder, if you like. And I also adhere to a Popperian uh, kind of theory of science. I believe in empirical success and falsifiability, perhaps in a slightly more refined way, but that is my belief and that's what I'm talking from. Um, <coughs> my view of grammar, and I will be very brief on that, but I have to explain that, is um, of the mediational kind. I see grammar as a mediational machine between thoughts and utterances. And that is a machine. We have no access to it, or very little access to it. Um, and um, there is a class of grammars. And at one time in his life, Harris also developed a sort of grammar that falls into this class of mediational grammars, but I see grammar as a relation between, a mapping relation between thought and utterance. And the utterance, of course, is presented in the form of a sentence, a series of sentences. I also look at grammar top-down, that is, from the thought to the utterances, the generative way, not the bottom-up way, because I believe that parsing is much less linguistic than the generation of sentences. Parsing is not entirely compositional. It is in part also dependent on context, discourse, world knowledge, and a few other things. <coughs> um, but the generation is fully automatic once the semantic representation of what the speaker has in mind, what the speaker wants to say, uh, once it is there. Uh, I also believe that grammar is carried out in terms of tree structures. 
following Blumf, actually following Wundt. Wundt was the first in 1880 to develop, uh, to, to present tree structures in linguistics, but that was taken over by uh, Bloomfield. Um, first very in a very hesitating manner in his 1914 book on language, but then much more strongly in 1933, although he never drew a tree. Um, but the tree structure is there all over the book, um, the first half of the book. And that is what Jalik Harris worked with also. He's a tree structure man, and in that sense, I am a true Bloomfieldian Harrisian. Um, now, why all this? I will take you very quickly through a few um, slides which have only a remote relation but illustrates the kind of methodology and the frame of mind that I'm working in. So this is, of course, the famous Ogden and Richard semiotic triangle, which I think is the basis of all, uh, although I do without a dotted line at the bottom. We have the linguistic sign on the left bottom and the left base and the, the world, the, thing, the things that we talk about on the right-hand side and at the top, thought or reference. But I think that all that happens between language and the world is mediated by the mind. There's no linguistically significant direct link between the symbol and the reference. So this is my disfiguration of the triangle. Um, <coughs> we have a propositional thought at the top which consists of a speech act defining the social commitment the speaker takes when he utters a sentence. Um, the social commitment with respect to a proposition which you see on the right. Ah, I was given this. A proposition which consists of a, uh, a proposition is the mental assignment of a property to one or more entities. The property is represented in the mind, the entities are represented in the mind, and the speech act and the proposition together go through lexicon and grammar and end up through the grammar into the spoken or written signal. Um, the speech act is related to a speech situation where the speaker takes on a social commitment. The proposition is related to a world situation. That is what the proposition is about. Now, there's a lot of philosophy behind this, and I'm not going to do that because we don't have the time. But I do, <coughs> this is a grammar model according to Harris. You go to the lexicon, you grab a suitable handful of lexical items, and you construct kernel sentences through your constructional grammar, a number of kernel sentences, which you then combine, put the one into the other according to certain prescribed uh, uh, rule-governed uh, procedures, and that then is fed into a transformational grammar to give you the surface structure. The transformational grammar is specifically subjected to semantically controlled conditions. This comes close to what the generative semantics people did in the late 60s and the early 70s until they were um, drowned by the Chomsky drums. Uh, for them, you have the lexical primitives, a phrase structure grammar giving you a semantic analysis, an SA. That was then fed. The semantic analysis was already a tree structure, hence the triangle, fed into a transformational grammar plus pre-lexical syntax. You all remember kill is caused to die, you know. Um, um, and that would lead to a surface structure. That is the generative semantics model. I slightly modified that in my own work and due to my own experience in working with grammar. Uh, a lexicon, phrase structure, grammar that are, somehow got in the wrong place, I don't know why, uh, phrase structure, grammar, um, <coughs> giving you a semantic analysis with all the lexical items in place, virtually all of them, except for morphological variants. That was then f uh, is then fed into a transformational grammar which gives you the surface structure. Now, we are now going to talk in this talk, we are now going to have a look at the transformational grammar. Um, 
This is a quote from Harris, 1957, demonstrating what I've just said. We won't dwell on it because although it comes from the great man, I have already more or less explained what it says. And I now want to tell you what I really want to do in this talk. I want to present you with some data from German and also a little bit from Dutch to do with V-clustering. You're not serious, 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, to do with, with V-clustering, um, which is typical of these languages, but not unique, far from unique. There are hundreds of languages in the world that do things like that. And I want to show how a simple rule system can explain a very nasty little set of facts, crucial facts, be crucial because other theories haven't been able to deal with them in a non-ad hoc way. So this is what I see as the main overall structure of a semantic analysis. We have a speech act operator at the top, two tenses, a present or past there, and simultaneous or preceding there, a relative tense. This is really a Reichenbachian tense analysis. Uh, and then this together is the auxiliary system. Between the two tenses, there's an optional area for modal verbs, typically filled by the English modal verbs, can, shall, will, the famous verbs with a defective paradigm. They have no participles and no infinitives and no perfect tenses. And then here we have the matrix system, the main clause, that'll be the main clause with the main verb here, and argument terms, one or more of which may be embedded clauses, even two you can have, that the man killed the butler, uh, that the man had blood in his hands, proved he was the killer, right? Okay. Um, <coughs> Um, that if there is an S, you have a special bit of grammar called a complementation system. Now, we will be looking at the complementation system, the matrix, and the auxiliary system together in German. This area is the modal area. It typically, certain weak verbs have the tendency in languages to climb from the status of main verb here up the auxiliary tree, and they nestle here. That's what, happened to, uh, that's what happened in, from the 14th till the 17th century with the English auxiliary verbs, can, shall, will, should, must, etc. Uh, since they are now here, they have lost the possibility of having a perfect tense. All they can do is, you see, the present or past is incorporated into whatever is below them. So this is incorporated into this verb and they can occur in the present or the simple past. But the, the perfect can occur after them, but not in them. So you, you can say he may eat, but he may have eaten. See? But not he has made eat. And also infinitives and participles are restricted to positions further down, but not higher up. Because as soon as they come close to, 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 the, um, to the first tense, they become finite. Present or past, make a verb finite. All this is very significant. <coughs> Auxiliation. Some semantically weak or aspectual verbs climb up and nestle between the two tenses. Now, the point is that German werden, which is the auxiliary of futuricity, and müssen, but only epistemic müssen, meaning must, like that must be true and not you must go, epistemic must, have become modal verbs. They have climbed up and nestled between the two um, tenses. Actually, these typical phenomena of werden and müssen have only been observed by German grammarians very recently. But we'll see the data in a moment. The Dutch equivalents zullen, which is futuricity, and moeten have not. They are still full verbs and therefore have a different paradigm. Therefore, like the English modals, German werden and müssen lack infinitives and participles, but Dutch zullen and mutten have a full paradigm. Look at this. Ich hoffe, es morgen schaffen zu werden. No. I hope it tomorrow managed to will. No. But to can is okay. 
Ich hoffe, es morgen schaffen zu können. But in Dutch, it's perfectly okay. Ich hoffe, es morgen zu klären. Ich hoffe, es morgen zu können klären. Equally good. Makes no difference. The difference is that the Dutch Zillen has not undergone auxiliation, the German werden has. Or, das hätte wahr sein werden. No. Das hätte wahr sein müssen. No. Das hätte wahr sein können. Perfect. And the judgments are clear. There's no fuzzy area of, well, you know, no. It's yes and no. That's an advantage in this case, because usually it's not like that. The Dutch, dat had waar zullen zijn, moeten zijn, kunnen zijn. Okay, all of them. Now, we're going to do a bit of grammar. Here we have a matrix S with the main verb wollen. Er, he will, he wants something. What does he want? He wants to eat. Deletion of the subject. What happens in German is that the verb wollen, want, uh, induces predicate raising. So Essen is raised to wollen, but raised on the left-hand side. Verb clusters are left branching in German, but they're right branching in Dutch. So, and we always use um, subordinate clauses to demonstrate these facts because there the verb clusters are not split up. You have to give me that. So, das er das Brot essen will, to one. That he wants to eat the bread. Sorry. The, the Dutch, exactly the same, except that the order of main verb and embedded verb is inverted, but that is because Dutch is right branching in the verb cluster. Dat hij het brood wil eten. That he the bread. That's the only difference. Other than that, Dutch and German are identical in this respect. It's just a branching difference. Further data. Now, this is the crucial bit. Dass sie das tun kann. That she that do can. Not can tun. No, out. Dass sie das hat tun können. Now, we see that part of the tree is right branching, three, two, but there is also at the top there's a, is left branching, at the top there's a right branching element. And all the other uh, possible combinations and forms are ungrammatical. So, dass sie das hat tun können. Dass sie das gekonnt hat. Okay, left branching, two, one. Not hat gekonnt. Dass sie das tun wird. Okay, left branching. Wird tun, no. Dass sie das wird tun können. Now, the wird... The futuristic verb is on the left. But you can also say, tun können wird, can also be on the right. So what on earth is going on? And it's getting worse. Dass sie das wird haben tun können, that she will have do can. That she will have been able to do that. Only possible order is this. That is not allowed. So why is it that the wird can come left here and also right, but not here? That's because of the haben. So what is going on? And that is the question. I'll explain it to you in less than five minutes, Bruce. <laughs> ah, there's a rule in German which is bound up, tied up with a um, collection of verbs, the so-called R verbs. I call them R verbs. They are sehen, hören, fühlen, lassen, können, müssen, sollen, wollen, mögen, and dürfen. But sehen, hören, fühlen are optional members of the class. So in German you can say, Ach, Clara, welche Freude, dass ich dich tanzen gesehen habe. But you can also say, Ach, Clara, welche Freude, dass ich dich habe tanzen sehen. You can say, you can say either. Okay? Right. Now, back. Uh, here we have the modal, which say, let it be filled by werden in this position, and then haben for the perfective tense. And let's have a, an R verb in this position, but clustered. If it's not clustered, the rule doesn't operate. It has to be clustered. Okay. Now, we get... <coughs> the rule is that... If haben is 
did I have the rule here? Oh yes, the rule is double actually. There's an A version and a B version. If we have the verb haben, then haben is lowered onto the lower verb, in this case the A verb. And all subsequent lowerings, those from higher up that are lowered onto the verb, are right branching, obligatory, if the verb here is an R verb. So if this is können or müssen or sollen, then haben lowers the right branching fashion and all subsequent lowerings, the tree, in other words, switches directionality from left branching to right branching midway in the generation process. And that is obligatory in the case of haben. But if you don't have haben, if you have the zero here, which is then deleted, and you have the modal werden here, not müssen, but werden, then you have the same, but it's optional. And that is the whole rule. So now we have das, sie wert, werden, nothing here, können. Now we know, können with a cluster, now we know that werden has a choice between either on the left or on the right. So here it's, it takes the R rule, the flip rule, das, sie, das, uh, wird tun können. Of course, tun comes to the left. That follows the normal left branching procedure. But now the werden can come to the left or to the right. Here it comes to the left, causing right branching. Here it comes to the right, causing left branching. Three, two, one. But here you have one, three, two. But now, if instead of zero here we have haben, now there is no choice because the haben forces the, the right branching rule, the flip. Um, uh, the term in German grammar nowadays is Oberfeldumstellung, but I can't keep on using that word all the time, it's too long. So uh, some people call it flip very irreverently, but it's shorter. Okay. <coughs> um, so we get tun können, but then haben tun können, and then werden haben, because all subsequent lowerings follow the right branching system. And that explains that we can only have das sie das wird haben tun können and nothing else. Now that I consider, oh, the last question is a bit silly, I don't know, that's purely speculative. So that, I think, is a fairly strong demonstration of a particular nasty little fact of grammar which has only recently been observed. Actually, those things began to be observed about 20 years ago. Um, and it is um, fully explained by this principle. It fits into a system which also takes in auxiliary verbs from other languages. I've only mentioned those from English, but I could go on and mention quite a few other languages with similar phenomena. Um, other than accommodating these facts in an ad hoc listing manner which is not revealing. And I thought this was interesting enough to show to you today. Have I overshot my time? Thank you. Okay, that was it. Okay. I haven't looked at that, um, but I assume that there will be different models of grammatical description that would be able to translate my rule system into their terms. If they can do that, it's just a notational variance. Uh, the grammar systems that I have looked at cannot do that. So unfortunately, categorical grammar is at a loss with these cases. So is HPSG, and so are a few other models. A book will be out recently 
with the renowned publisher JB um, on precisely this topic. Uh, written, yes, I'm one of the editors and also a contributor, and we have, uh, me and a colleague of mine, we have collected contributions from different schools of grammar. And of course, I had the vicious idea underlying the whole thing. I'll show that I'm right. <laughs> okay. Linguistic knowledge, very interested in Wittgenstein's philosophy of language. His chapter in volume one of Legacy of Zelig Harris is on discovery procedures, and his talk is on linguistic philosophy versus linguistic science. Francis Lin. Right. Um, in this talk, I, I want to show the relevance of uh, uh, Wittgenstein's later philosophy to linguistic research. Uh, I also want to distinguish between linguistic philosophy and linguistic science. Uh, so the structure of this talk is uh, as follows. So I first want to briefly talk about the nature of philosophy uh, according to the later Wittgenstein. And uh, secondly, I will look at some linguistic puzzles, in particularly, in particularly synthetic uh, competence and semantic competence. Uh, after that, I will have a, a look at linguistic science, uh, especially uh, Harris discovery procedures. Well, the later Wittgenstein's philosophy is um, very exciting, but quite controversial. According to Wittgenstein, there are no philosophical problems. The task of philosophy is not to discover anything new, any profound knowledge, hidden uh, wisdom, uh, and the like. Uh, philosophy only uses and uh, rearranges some known facts. It doesn't discover anything, any, anything new, but it just arranges known facts for particular purposes. Uh, the purpose is to dissolve philosophical problems rather than to solve them, because philosophical problems are not really problems at all. They are just pseudo-problems. And the significance for such a philosophy is to clear the ground for genuine sciences, for genuine uh, discoveries. Um, and all, another usefulness of philosophy is to identify the sources of uh, confusion and helps to cure conceptual diseases. So is this kind of philosophy relevant to linguistic research? Um, so many people have been puzzled by uh, language. Uh, in particular, there are three major puzzles. One is uh, grammatical uh, competence, uh, another one is uh, semantic competence, and third is logical competence. Uh, grammatical competence is the ability to, to know the grammaticality of any sentence. Bear in mind, there may be an uh, infinite number of sentences in, in, a, in a language, but a speaker can instantly know whether a sentence is grammatical or not. Uh, what does this ability consist in? A semantic competence refers to the ability to understand uh, the meaning of any sentence in a, in a language. And I mentioned logical sentence, logical com competence, which refers to the ability to draw some inferences from, from any sentence. Uh, and all these abilities have been, or people have tried to explain such abilities uh, by uh, hypothesizing a finite set of, of rules.
Now, how, how does a speaker know that a sentence is grammatical or not? Uh, well, the, the, the speaker must have uh, learned a grammar. And here I shall first look at Harris transformation grammar. Uh, as, uh, as you all know that uh, Harris transformation grammar comes of two parts. One is the uh, kernel component, and the other is the transformation component. Um, the kernel sentences and the transformation rules are distributional regulators in language. They are real. They exist uh, in speakers in the sense of reflecting their speaking habits. Uh, Harris tried to identify those regularity, like kernels and these transformations, uh, using the so-called discovery procedures. Uh, several speakers have talked about um, discovery pr procedures before, so I will not go to the details. Uh, I'll just uh, show you a few examples of kernel sentences. Uh, according to Harris, there are just a few basic types of sentences. Uh, many simple sentences fall uh, into all these types. Uh, the simplest type is A and V. An example is uh, a tree fell. Uh, another example, um, NVPN, child relies uh, on luck. So all these are very abstract sentence types, sentence constructions, but under each abstract uh, construction, you can find uh, many more, less abstract types. For example, uh, under NV, you, you have X falls or X laughs, X walks, etc. cetera. Uh, under NVPN, you can have X relies on Y, um, uh, X lives, uh, 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 say fish lives in water, so lives in somewhere. So these are uh, kernel sentences. Um, apart from kernel sentences, there are transformations. Uh, here I just give you a few examples. Uh, from the sentence, I, li I like this, uh, we can get a sentence, this I like. So the transformation can be represented like this. This transformation is quite general, but there are much more specific uh, transformations. For example, he learned a lesson and transformed into he learned his, le his lesson. Uh, and this transformation is very specific. It does not apply to other similar sentences. For example, from I saw a girl, you cannot transform them into I saw my girl. Right, uh, though Harris didn't really talk about knowledge of grammar and uh, the learning of grammar, but I think that we can interpret him as saying the following. A, a person's knowledge of grammar is his knowledge of sentence constructions and transformations. Uh, the constructions and transformations are very commonsensical, very intuitive. They are known to everybody, as uh, you can see from the previous examples. And uh, discovery pr procedures suggest a way of how uh, such constructions and uh, uh, transformations are learned. And please note that this learning theory is quite explicit. And, and quite detailed. Right. Well, um, it seems to me that Harris' grammar provides exp explanation to grammatical competence. The speaker has learned uh, a large set of constructions and transformations. Thus, explains why he is able to speak so many uh, sentences and to judge. 
uh, the grammaticality of so many sentences. But Chomsky thinks Harris's approach is completely wrong. Chomsky ha has made so many different arguments, and I find most of his arguments very reasonable, good arguments. Uh, they, they may look a bit strange, but then you can't really argue against him. They, they're not, uh, uh, you can't not, you can argue against those arguments, but it's difficult for you to, to succeed. But I think there is a big flaw in, in, in Chomsky's uh, way, uh, linguistic thinking. And among all the arguments Chomsky has presented, this is the most important one. Uh, and it can be broken down into five steps. First, Harris' discovery procedures belong to the empiricist tradition. Uh, that is true. Secondly, the implicit, implicit learning theory has all been about generalization uh, or analogy. There's no uh, very, uh, very detailed learning theory, so we talk about generalization and analogy, and this is also true. And the third step, uh, many linguistic examples show that knowledge of grammar cannot be learned by analogy or generalization. Chomsky presented many examples, simple ones and complicated ones, uh, and show that uh, this step is true. So Chomsky makes the conclusion that the implicit learning theory is wrong or is useless. And on the basis of that, Chomsky concludes that the idea of uh, discovery procedures is wrong and knowledge of grammar is not learned but innately given. Uh, now, I'll just show you how Chomsky argued for step three. First, according to Chomsky, the idea of analogy is wrong. I look at these two sentences. John is easy to please, John is eager to please. Now, if you say the child learns language by analogy, now these two sentences are very similar when, you know, when it's analog uh, analogous uh, to the other. And you might think the child should then interpret these two sentences in an analogous way, but the child doesn't do this. The child knows the difference, knows that these two sentences have completely different meanings. Uh, so the idea of analogy cannot be right. Yeah, if, if you want to say that a child learns an language by analogy, and this example shows analogy, the idea of analogy. <laughs> Right. You, you might then say that, well, the child learns uh, a language by generalization. Here's the example. Shows that generalization doesn't, doesn't work. Okay, when, uh, sentence three, John ate an apple. Okay, John ate an apple. Sentence four said, John ate. And the child understands the sentence as saying, John ate something. So you may say, oh, on this basis, the, the child may make a generalization. That is, if the object of a ver verb is missing, in an arbitrary object is meant. Okay, here is a generalization, quite you know, a reasonable one. But if you apply this generalization to this sentence, John is too stubborn to talk to there is something missing here, talk to, talk to what? Something missing. 
and you apply this generalization, you say, oh, there must be something here which is an arbitrary object. Then the sentence should mean John is so stubborn that he will not talk to this unidentified uh, uh, person. But that interpretation is wrong. Chomsky says, look, the, the child doesn't make mis this mistake. So the idea of general, generalization is, is wrong. Now, Chomsky's argument and examples are, are very interesting, but, but he's made uh, an error. Uh, the error is, is this. Okay, step three is, is quite right. That is the idea of generalization and are vague, empty. You know, they can't really explain uh, the acquisition of, uh, of, uh, of certain grammatical knowledge. But from three to four, there is a big gap. Uh, the error can be uh, studied like this. Okay, so you say you say grammar is not learned through analogy or generalization. That's fine, but you you can't just say grammar is not learned at all. Okay, grammar is not learned by analogy or generalization. Doesn't mean that grammar is not learned at all. Another way of representing the grammar uh, the error is this. Okay, some implicit theories are wrong. Those based on analogy or generalization are useless or wrong, but it doesn't mean that all implicit theories are wrong. Here is uh, another example where you can see uh, the error more clearly. Okay, John lives on the top floor. John lives on rice. Uh, according to Chomsky's argument, okay, uh, these two sentences are logical. Uh, analogous to each other, so the child should interpret them in a similar way. But the child doesn't do this, the child doesn't make this error, so the idea of analogy is wrong, so the knowledge involved in this example is not learned. But evidently, I mean, these are two constructions. John lives somewhere, John lives on certain food, to constructions, the child can, of course, learn this thing, probably not through analogy or generalization, but the, the child can learn this. So the ideas of analogy and generalization are no good, but that doesn't mean that grammar is not learned or grammar is innate. Uh, there is an alternative way of explaining Chomsky's examples. Uh, we can explain the examples we've seen uh, by saying that the child has acquired a set of constructions. For example, uh, there is a construction in English, John is eager to do something, uh, uh, oh, X is e eager to do something, X is easy to do something to, X is too stubborn to do something, X is too stubborn to do something to, X lives somewhere, X lives on something, certain food. We can say that the child has acquired such constructions. That's why the, the child interprets those sentences uh, according to these different constructions uh, uh, accordingly the child knows that those uh, sentences mean different things. Now, the question you can ask, how does the child acquire such constructions? The answer uh, we can give is that possibly the, uh, the child acquire uh, constructions and uh, transformations through discovery procedures. So, there was a puzzle. Uh, the puzzle was called grammatical competence. But the puzzle can be dissolved by re reminding 
ourselves of the constructions and the transformations we have known all along. No theory, it, no theory is, is actually needed. We don't really need a theory of grammar because the constructions and transformations do constitute grammar and the constructions and the grammars are all known. So there is no theory uh, needed. Uh, next, look at uh, semantic competence. Uh, remember that semantic competence refers to the ability of understanding so many number of uh, so many sentences in a, in, a, in a language, and that seems to be a puzzle. How does you know a speaker do that? Uh, the mathematician Tusky provided a model of each sentence. Uh, Tusky provides recursive truth definitions. He uh, dis distinguishes between uh, an object language and a meta language. The Tusky's system can define the truth of uh, any sentence in this object language in terms of the meta language and the system makes use of a structure of the sentences of the object language. Uh, I will not go into details of his system, just to skip some slides. Uh, here is an example. This is a sentence in the object language. The system can define that this sentence is true in meta language, which is English. Everything is, is, is pretty. Similarly, this sentence is true if there is a man that, such that every man loves her. And all these are theorems of the system, and each proof uh, can be quite complicated. And Davison thinks that you know, Tusky's model, I mean, it provides an uh, explanation of uh, semantic competence. Okay, this, uh, okay, suppose that we have uh, an object language which is German and the meta language is English. Using a Tusky style system, we can prove, we can state the truth of any sentence in German uh, 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 in terms of English sentences. And, and here is an uh, uh, example uh, Schnee is snow. Uh, grass is grass, white is white, green is green, and using some axioms, you will be able to prove that white is true if snow is white, and many, many other sentences. So, so in, in, in this way, it, it, it explains, the system explains how the speaker can understand, how an English speaker understand so many sentences of uh, in, in German. And the system is formal and rigorous, but there are a lot many problems. One is that truth is not equal to meaning, and secondly, uh, ordinary speakers don't seem to know a tasky style system. Um, what I'm saying that there is a alternative explanation to semantic competence, we can say, okay, there is a following Davison, we say that there is the object language, let's say German, there's the meta language, English, there are words in German, the constructions in German, words in English, construction in English, and we can say that certain words in German means certain words in English, certain constructions mean certain constructions uh, in English. Uh, a German sentence is constructed uh, on the basis of certain words and constructions, and following this construction procedure, we can uh, 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 see what uh, this a sentence in German means in, in English. And here is the example, dogs bark, haunt means dogs, ex bellen means uh, ex bark, uh, so haunt bellen, we can easily see that Hong Bellen in English means dog's bark. Uh, yeah. 
Right, just to say that Horridge produced a similar theory, but his, prob his system is slightly different. If his system faces several problems, but the, the, uh, the example I proposed uh, is able to avoid those problems. So the uh, semantic competence, there was a puzzle, and the puzzle is now resolved. And in doing so, we didn't really you know, uh, hypothesize anything. We just say there are constructions and words in, in language, and sentences are constructed uh, on the basis of uh, words and constructions. So no semantic theory is needed. Uh, now, I just spent one or two minutes on, 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 the, on the, this third topic, linguistic science. Um, how do children acquire constructions and transformation? Uh, the answer is that, you know, discovery procedures. You can view discovery procedures as innate procedures for children to acquire, uh, acquire const uh, constructions and transformations. And this ap approach is, is, is quite concrete because the input is known, grammatical data, the output is also known, the, the known constructions and the transformation. What is in the middle is discovery procedures. Um, if you don't know the, what grammatical rules are there in the language, how you can't really say very much about this learning component because you, in that case, you don't know what is learned. How can you, can you inquire into the learning process? But, uh, but in this approach, the output is known, so the thing need to be done is discovery procedures in the middle. Uh, other questions can be invested along the way. Uh, the difference between humans and animals, uh, maybe animals do not have discovery procedures at all, or maybe their discovery procedures are not as sophisticated as ours. But there is now something specific to talk about Instead of universal grammar, we don't really know what, what a universal grammar is. How can we know whether humans have universal grammar, animals don't? Uh, linguistic abilities versus other cognitive abilities, maybe re re they are related because uh, they both involve detection of regularities. Uh, language and evolution may be uh, uh, discovered procedures are a result of direct result of evolution or a byproduct of evolution. But mm -hmm. if we know enough details about discovery procedures, then we can investigate such questions. So, uh, this uh, uh, summarize. Uh, there are a lot of puzzles, uh, but those puzzles may, be not, may not be genuine. They may be just pseudo, pseudo problems. Philosophy is, is a way of dissolving those puzzles. Um, there are other puzzles like deep structure, logic form. I don't think they, they're really uh, 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 genuine problems. Uh, but discovery procedures are, are genuine uh, scientific uh, topics. And in, in this region, we do need theories when we do in, in, in here, we don't really need a theory of syntax or theory of grammar or theory of logical form. But discovery procedures are genuine scientific theories are needed. That's right. Um, what concerns me is, is, is knowledge of, of uh, the rules you come out with in, in, in any system. To me, if the speaker doesn't know the rule, then you, 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 you face a lot of uh, uh, um, philosophical problems. Uh, if you can explain a you know, certain phenomena, 
using things which are known already. There is no need to do it otherwise. So that's why I, when I look at a, a theory, any, any linguistic theory, if there are things there which are quite trou troublesome, like I don't know this, I mean, do I, do I really know, ha, ha, have this knowledge of your theory in my, in my mind? And this, this is a question I, I was going to ask. But on, on the other hand, your theory wants to explain certain things. Yeah, I have another way of explaining this, using things which everybody knows. So what's the point of having your theory then? So that, 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 that's, the, that, that's the approach I, I take. critique of political economy and the critical history of art. Uh, he's written a book, Art in Its Time, Modern, Modern Aesthetic Theories and Practices, and this is forthcoming. His chapter in The Legacy of Zelig Harris is in volume one, uh, chapter two, Some Implications of Zelig Harris's Work for the Philosophy of Science. He's here to talk to us about the syntax of science and the science of syntax. Paul Maddock. Thanks. And, uh, uh, just a couple of preliminary remarks. One is I, uh, can you hear? Is this okay? One is I really want to thank Bruce for organizing this as well as for organizing the book. I think that was a terrific thing to do and this has been a terrific thing. And I want to say that I've uh, enjoyed all the talks so far and I'm, I'm sure I will enjoy the, the last one after me. Uh, and I want to apologize for two things. One is I don't have any pictures to show you or even text to put on the wall, which I appreciate very much. It's a nice thing. I wish I had some, but I don't. And the other is that I'm going to read a text, and that's because I wanted to say a certain amount of stuff, and I wanted to make sure I could do it in a certain amount of time. And the only way to control myself is to actually write it down. So uh, if you'll pardon the formality, I'm actually going to read something. Once I remember, I was talking to Zelig Harris about criticisms that had been made of his work by other linguists and some philosophers of language. He had been accused of being an empiricist. Gee, he said, or words to that effect, is that a bad thing now? I thought it was a good thing. Of course, he was under no illusions as to the centrality of theorizing to science. Theory. Harris says at the beginning of the volume in which he drew conclusions from a lifetime of studying language, reveals an underlying structure of language that is not directly visible in the observables, sound patterns, and word combinations. The distinction was made clearly already in Distributional Structure, written in 1954, in which Harris spoke of a set of linguistic data as structured in respect to some feature to the extent that we can form, in terms of that feature, some organized system of statements which describes the members of the set and their interrelations. Further, he insisted that, I quote, data can be usefully analyzed only in respect to a specified whole structure of a language and not as selected examples in support of episodic grammatical rules or processes. Thus, the syntactic theory presented in a theory of language and information was a generalization from the detailed grammar of English on mathematical principles, itself, as the title suggests, a theory of a language. In this, his writing contrasts with work done in the framework of generative grammar, which, as Maurice Gross pointed out some years ago, in a trenchant critique of that framework, displayed, I quote, the total lack of a program for constructing grammars of particular languages. This resulted, more or less, from Noam Chomsky's treatment of natural language grammars as a class of formal system, so that, to quote Gross again, all arguments have been made with respect to classes of formal grammars, that is, sets of grammars defined a priori, and not with respect to particular grammars of languages. Harris's joking avowal of empiricism 
may be understood against the background of this development within linguistics, which dominated the field after the mid-1960s. Less locally, it was also directed against philosophy as a mode of intellectual work. Despite his admiration for individual philosophers, Harris was not impressed by claims of the efficacy of non-scientific methods for the investigation of such matters as the structure of scientific cognition or the nature of language. From this point of view, the philosophical bent of generative grammar is not incidental. The idea of a Cartesian linguistics was not likely to appeal to someone unimpressed by theoretical constructions unsupported by the necessary mass of data. The employment of symbolization and the apparatus of mathematical logic by contemporary analytic philosophy no more, generates, uh, no more guarantees purchase on truth than does the operation of complex algebraic equipment by economists, to mention another field in which something called theory develops at a considerable distance from empirical information. On the other hand, Harris's attachment to the empiricist label reflected what we might call an attitude of consonance with one 20th century philosophical tendency, logical empiricism. While the members of the Vienna Circle are decisively out of intellectual fashion at the moment, they are worth recalling in this context. As I've just suggested, Harris shared their skepticism about philosophy's claims of special modes of knowledge and a conviction that the acquisition of information about the world depended on scientific methods of investigation. His theory stresses the special aptness of language for the transmission of information about the world, as opposed to, I quote, private feelings and desire or interpersonal comments and requests, for which, as we know, language is very poorly equipped. Uh, how are you? Fine. <laughs> This may be compared to the positivist distinction between cognitively meaningful and emotive or expressive modes of speech. This view of language, together with the conviction that scientific discourse represents a maximally effective use of language for organizing and transmitting information, explains why Harris focused, beyond his general theory of language, on the specific form of linguistic information in science. In fact, his massive study of the immunology sublanguage can be seen as a realization of the positivist's wish to render explicit the syntax of science, including the suggestion of a canonical form for the statement of science information. This work, as I suggest in my contribution to the publication we are celebrating, sheds light on the idea of the logical proposition that was fundamental to the philosophical analysis as well as on issues of the structure of argument and of the relation between sciences in which these philosophers were interested. To cite only one detail linking the two modes of thought, to Otto Neurath's assertion that, I quote, by its syntax, the language of science excludes anything that is meaningless from the very beginning, we may compare Harris's statement that the consistent restriction of subject matter in scientific texts creates a novel semantic power for language, a distinguishing and eliminating of irrelevance and nonsense. The differences, I hasten to say, are as striking as the similarities. For Harris, it is not philosophical considerations about the relation of linguistic signs to something called reality, but discoverable features of language that explain its informational nature. His theory of information of what the positivists called cognitive meaning, rests not on a priori hypothesized relations of sign to unit of experience, on which the philosopher's verifiability criterion of meaningfulness depended, but on the structure of language itself as it is revealed under empirical analysis. Where the elimination of nonsense from philosophy, for instance, was a goal of logical empiricism, Harris explains the restriction of science language to concepts and relations between them accepted as meaningful in particular domains of investigation in terms of its differences from other modes of discourse. The fact that operator and argument words occur in relation to each other within a range of acceptabilities, 
quote, makes it impossible for language in general to exclude nonsense. That is, for nonsensical sentences to be ungrammatical. This fact also means that even sentences conjoined with their negations can be grammatical. It's raining and it's not raining, unlike in logic. In contrast, I quote again, in science languages, where likelihood properties are replaced by special word subclasses, both of these limitations can be overcome. Nonsense can be eliminated, and or at least nonsense as defined within the field can be eliminated, and uh, illogicalities can be avoided. Most fundamentally, Harris's success in formalizing the syntax of science, in contrast to the failure of logical positivism, rests on his empiricism, where they began their study with the assumption that science language is a model for the relations of truth functional mathematical logic, Harris proceeded by seeking an order in syntax itself, an order which turned out to constitute an explanation of sentence meaning. Science did not have a logical syntax, as the positivists had assumed, though it is regulated by logic, but a syntax of its own, a subset of natural language grammar. The affinities between Harris's linguistic researches and the logical empiricist program, however, are deeper and perhaps more interesting than the specific interest in the analysis of scientific discourse. The positivists' advocacy of scientific understanding involved a response to an intellectual situation that was related to particular social and political circumstances. Their emphasis on the verifiability criterion of meaning in part reflected, to quote Otto Neurath, the historical fact that an idealistic metaphysical current was on the increase during the 1930s. We might think here of the influence of a thinker like Henri Bergson, whose vitalism not only affected biological speculation, but was an inspiration to fascist intellectuals. Martin Heidegger, enemy number one of logical empiricism, was not only a fuzzy-minded thinker, but an enthusiastic Nazi. Science, in contrast to such metaphysical tendencies, is public as it is collective in its mode of production. Hence the centrality to the politically scientific attitude, as the positivists viewed it, of Wittgenstein's dictum, what can be said at all can be said clearly. Unlike metaphysical conceptions, scientific theories, to quote Neurath again, can be checked because they do not contain any appeal to infinite totalities, to unknowable and transcendental things. In short, the logical empiricist wish to render explicit the implicit syntax of science was not distinct from the socialist leanings of the members of the Vienna Circle. A point made clear in the group's 1929 programmatic statement, the scientific conception of the world. In Harris's case, too, we can see a close relation between his empiricism and his socialism. It is not only that in his political writing, he employed the same intellectual methods as in his, his linguistic work. Thus, for example, he described his book on the transformation of capitalist society as an effort to bring together an orderly set of evidentially supported generalizations on the basis of which one can usefully analyze the socioeconomic changes in our world and the possibilities of a future more humane society. More fundamentally, what socialism and science have in common is a mode of social practice oriented toward problem solving on the basis of public discussion of evidence and alternatives. It is for the statement and analysis of public problems as opposed to the expression of private feelings that language seems to have developed. For Harris, as for the logical empiricists, understanding and use of this virtue of language was of prime human importance. To put the point in somewhat different terms, Zelig Harris was, in short, a modernist not of the caric caricatural type of the believer in historical master narratives, but what I would call a critical modernist, 
seeking to understand the resources offered by the current social order with an eye to changing it. This is the deepest meaning of his avowed empiricism. It is expressed very well by the closing paragraph of the Vienna Circle document of 1929 that I quoted earlier. They wrote, thus the scientific world conception is close to the life of the present. Certainly, it is threatened with hard struggles and hostility. Nevertheless, there are many who do not despair, but in view of the present sociological situation, look forward with hope to the course of events to come. The scientific world conception serves life, and life receives it. The present particularly gloomy moment is one in which it may be hard to maintain beliefs of this sort. Yet, as Harris maintained in closing his book on social transformation, the door for change is not closed. In politics, as in science, what happens is an empirical matter. Thank you. Oh, question, yes. Yes. Uh, you may be right, I, but, but uh, it's funny, but you can, the point is that you can say it. It's not a, fine with me. <laughs> I'm always in favor of improvements. <laughs> Other comments? Good. Thanks. I hope this will be brief. Um, we're all exhausted. Um, uh, I wanted to also thank Bruce for making this event possible, and particularly for seeing through the publication of the book. It's, uh, it really is a case of without whom not. So, um, Bruce. Uh, <coughs> somewhat pompous title. Um, is to disguise the implicit subtitle of my talk, which is to say that um, uh, it's to show how little, how a little bit and why a little bit goes a long way. Um, I can, uh, the motto of the talk is taken from Whitehead. Uh, it's uh, always possible to find such things uh, from philosophers. I'm going to look at um, several uh, levels of reflection I'll take them in crescendo. Um, the uh, problem, as you'll see, is one called the, I borrow from H.M. Uh, Scheffer and from a paper of Tom Ricketts, who's in the audience of some years ago, called the logocentric predicament. Uh, it's actually self-explanatory, if you think about it. Uh, Schaeffer wrote this uh, in reviewing this uh, second edition of volume one of Principia Mathematica of Russell and Whitehead. In order to give an account of logic, we must presuppose and employ logic. The uh, situation is uh, a little bit different in uh, natural language because we can say that natural language is a meta-language of logic, but we can't say that there's a meta-language of natural language that's uh, external to natural language. And that's a fundamental principle in Zelig's methodology. Uh, natural languages, the set of them, have no external meta-language. And Zelig draws uh, methodological consequences from that that are really quite profound. Uh, it tells us both how language structure must be found, how you discover it, and ultimately what that language structure is and how, what it must be. Uh, how it must be found uh, from the non-equiprobability of the parts as established by distributional methods. 
what language structure must be. And this really uh, comes out most clearly at the end of Zellig's last book, uh, Theory of Language and Information. It's a descriptively accretional structure of constraints on combinations of elements arising through a self-organizing process, supposing only the existence of some arbitrary stock of words. Um, well, we know uh, methodological arguments against distributional methods. Um, they're an unnecessary and illegitimate limitation on inquiry. Uh, linguistic theory is not essentially methodologically different from theorizing about molecules or elementary particles. Uh, in sum, there is no predicament in the fact that a theory is about language rather than molecules. Linguists are free to, preserve, to uh, pursue the Galilean style formulating theories of deep underlying principles or structures from which the observable data may be explained. And I'm going to try to convince you uh, why that's not the way we should think about language structure by attending rather closely to these reflections on Zellig's work. Uh, these are uh, reflections I call epistemological. They're actually almost pre-epistemological. Uh, well, what do we know? Uh, observationally, even, language has a structure, a pattern or a systematicity, uh, for well-known reasons. Uh, we know that whatever language structure is, it must have a proper of recursivity. Why? Because users are finite, but we all know that language is an unbent, unbounded set of different, as Zellig actually calls them, different activities. Um, another observation is that natural languages contain their own metalanguages, uh, including the apparatus for talking about language, defining and characterizing the language and its occurrences. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, crucially, uh, a metalanguage uh, that's contained within natural language is actually a sublanguage of the natural language, according to Zellig, but that's a, uh, that's a theoretical remark. A metalanguage enables expression of what is tacitly known in understanding a sentence. John came and went, transformationally reduced from John came and John went, and speakers know that the second occurrence of John may be omitted, as Zellig says, repetitionally zeroed as having high likelihood in this occurrence. Uh, that's just known by understanding the sentence. And uh, the fourth point is what is tacitly presupposed by language users in understanding a sentence is itself statable impermissible word co-occurrences. What speak speakers know is itself language in understanding language. Um, methodological remarks. Observables are sufficient data. Now here I use uh, observables not in the sense of naive, naive positivism. I once had a conversation about this with Zellig and he said something similar to what is perhaps better expressed by the famous Eddington that the theory tells you what you can observe. Um, and so when we're talking about observables we're talking about occurring occurrences of language, even though some of those occurrences, like in Zellig's unreduced sentences, are not going to be sentences that you would ordinarily hear. Um, anyway, uh, the characterization of occurrences uh, can be given in terms of other sentences of the language, which are observables, providing statements of which combinations of elements can occur. The grammar has to be axiomatic, um, and that has to do, of course, with that uh, recursivity process that we talked about before. The data, observed and observable occurrences, right, can be fundamentally described in terms of departures from equiprobability of combination. And in the absence of an external metalanguage, this is the only way the data can be described without presupposing another structure or system. We're not yet to the point where I prove theoretically that you can't have an external metal language. This is just methodological point. If there is another structure or system, that structure itself has to be explained. Otherwise, it's circular. Uh, we know also just methodologically that Markov methods are not successful in describing these departures from equiprobability, uh, stochastic uh, machines. Instead, these are stated in terms of gross inequalities of likelihood of co-occurrence. Again, nothing here about operator grammar, 
We just can talk about gross inequalities of likelihood of co-occurrence. Some worded co-occurrences have high likelihood, very high, high likelihood, likelihood. Others less than high likelihood but are possible. Uh, still others have zero likelihood. So the, co the combinations red deer, sad deer, you could even say plutonium deer, uh, <laughs> if it happened to be uh, too near the uh, meltdown of the power plant, uh, Hanford, Washington, but not everyone deer. Uh, these are theoretical reflections, and these really uh, are based on Zellig's theory, which I can uh, rush through because we've heard a lot about that theory today. Uh, the gross inequalities, the combinations that can occur, right, are characterized by a basic sentence forming relation, a dependence on dependence relation, it's a partial order constraint on word combinations, having the meaning, crucial, of predication. Operator argument dependence distinguishes non-zero likelihoods from all others. That's what it does. Uh, on account of separating predication, grammaticality from specific word classes meaning. Right? It's an information creating relation in the sense of saying something about something. There's still another sense that will have to do with redundancy of, this, of structure. Satisfaction of any non-zero level operator's argument requirement is itself a sentence. Uh, this constraint alone, the dependence on dependence relation, creates a mathematical object of a mathematical object of the actual sentential word occurrences. A system of entities defined only by the relations and closed in respect to them. It's not a question of mapping the occurrences of language onto some mathematical structure and seeing how it fits. You have already a mathematical structure with these uh, unreduced uh, word co-occurrences just on the basis of the dependence on dependence uh, relation. Transformations, including reductions, generate complex sentences from elementary sentences. So that's part of the axiomatic grammar. The inclusion of the meta-language in the language is crucial because it enables transformations to be defined as a mapping in the set of sentences. That's what a transformation is. It's not something that changes something into something else. It's a mapping in the set of sentences, leaving invariant the dependence on dependence relation. All transformations should have an invariant. That's what they do. That dependence on dependence relation is the information of the sentence. Um, and so these examples are simply to show that uh, uh, metalinguistic appendages are implicitly present of what must be known to understand the sentence. Uh, particularly, he's back because his car is in the garage. Well, for every sentence uh, in, in Zellig's uh, grammar uh, has an implicit I say on it. But the only way that you can understand uh, that sentence from a reduced form is to have the I say explicit, made explicit. I say he's back because his car is in the garage. And there are many, many wonderful examples like that in Harris's work. And I don't need to prolong discussion of them. Um, the underlying structure must also be language, right? Because the predicational structure is information engendering, the structure of sentences must be described in a system that itself has this predicational structure, and thus there can be no external meta language. Right? Language structure has an informational interpretation in the Shannon sense that redundancy creates information. Departures from equiprobability are differences in meaning co-varying with their user attested, I'm sorry, differences in form, co-varying with their user attested differences in meaning. The grammar must be minimal. This is a key theoretical point, describing only language and not a wider system of which language is a part, because it must not contribute to the redundancy it attempts to describe, because that redundancy is what carries information. It has a constructive structure, language, with the accretional property that second level operators act on first level, level operators, elementary sentences, in the same way that the latter act on their elementary arguments. That's what makes the dependence on depend dependence relation create a mathematical object of the unreduced sentences. In general, language structure is a system of constraints, constraints at level k acting on the resultants of those at all lower levels, 
and the initial constraints of phonemes can be independently attested by the pair test, for example. Well, um, I'm going to wind up now with um, these you know, hoary metaphysical issues. And I, I don't use the term lightly um, because uh, I think that Zelig has actually shown us what language is in terms of the old Aristotelian what is the nature of X, uh, particularly in the last parts of theory of language and information. We've seen that operator classes are defined by their dependence on the dependence properties of other operator classes. This creates an abstract system of categories, right, closed under the dependence on dependence relation. This shows that language is self-contained. It's a self-organizing system. The constraints governing departures from equiprobability arose from a situation without constraints. Constraints developed in turn from pre-existing tendencies to use certain kinds of word combinations in given situations in preference to others. The initial sentence forming constraint, the dependence on dependence relation, can be seen as conventionalizing and freezing out certain tendencies through an understandable need for efficiency of communication. Repetition without error compounding is how you might think of it in uh, code theoretic terms and for minimizing ambiguity. And what this finally says about language structure is that it's an evolutionary emergent property, an adaptive response to, and thereby assisting increasing complexities of social organization. Right? In no interesting sense is there a language organ. Right? It's the wrong place to look for language structure. Language structure comes out of um, this system of self-organizing, uh, self-developing uh, response of humans to other humans, basically, and to situations other humans are in. So, in, in sum, I shall simply say that um, the attempt in much of the linguistic theorizing since 1960 to seek uh, deep structures, uh, profound principles, far removed from observation, it's actually methodologically, methodologically the wrong track to take. You can get the structure you need uh, by looking only from the observables and the information create, creating relation that, that is uh, present already in those observables. That's why uh, a little bit goes a long way when you're mathematizing natural language. Uh, thanks very much. That's a uh, very deep question. I know. Yeah. yeah. Well, why, why do people prefer um, the other way and not these Heresian principles? I mean, historically that's been true. Um, uh, there's a philosopher of science. Um, I actually happen to know that Zelig had a profound interest in philosophy of science, although there weren't many philosophers of science that he liked to read that much. Um, there was a philosopher of science who wrote once about the uh, development of science as, a, uh, as being trackable along the lines of um, research paradigms that um, advance and degenerate. Um, I think that um, we're, we're seeing the degeneration of the one pr paradigm that you're referred to. And I think that the fact that Zelig uh, never wanted uh, to have a church around him, he didn't really care about it. It was just people who would interact with him and find out what he was doing that uh, continued the work. He always worked pretty much on his own. Uh, he wasn't interested in that, and uh, he didn't waste his time uh, arguing on behalf of his own cause. Um, that's, a, a, that's a very poor answer to a complicated question, but um, I think the, the more complex answer would have to go somewhat along those lines. Uh, it's a good question, and I, I really don't want to. I don't want to touch that 
why doesn't science recognize these, these principles? Um, I'm open to anybody's opinion about what that might be, what the answer might be. I think there's a, there's a thing sociological Of course. Uh, I think I think uh, Professor Siren had his hand up first. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to say something about the uh, setup question. Uh -huh. It's very top of your paper. Mm -hmm. um, in order to give an account of logic, you must presuppose and employ logic. Now you can put two other words for logic, and that is um, even body. Mm -hmm. do that, there is no such duality. There's also, well, you can make the distinction between Hegelian and the Kantian theory and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. But you can do nothing with that. Mm -hmm. There is no separate. Mm -hmm. That's the way I would see it. In order to give an account of logic, you must no. presuppose no. and have a mental command of a certain aspect of logic. No. Such theory no. and theory and that. No. Well, uh, let me just explain. Uh, behind that quote, actually, there, there's a bit of a story that I didn't tell, although it's told in my paper in the volume. 
uh, and Tom Ricketts uh, laid it out first, um, it's that um, there's a conception of logic that's really um, most visible in Frege, but also in the Wittgenstein of the Tractatus. People thought that um, there, there could be no such thing as illogical thought. Um, logic was the structure of rationality. Yeah, yeah. So the idea that you could explain logic by something else, to them, it means that you would have to be trying to explain rationality by something else, which was not, which was not uh, conceivable. In particular, it's not, you couldn't explain it by psychology, you see. Now, you, saw, you talk about things being lodged in the mind. Here, I'm a little bit... Uh, That, that may very well be true if, if um, set theory is logic. Um, um, uh, I think actually set theory is probably considerably wider than logic, but um, logic. yeah, but the, the point here was, was to, to make a point about language. Uh, and even set theory has got to have English or some other natural language and, as its meta language. Well, I would say, of course, that's, that's, a, that's a conventionalization of use in ordinary language. I mean, they don't have those set theoretic meanings in ordinary language in all, in all situations. I, I, I maintain that they do. I'm not sure about that. Well, <laughs> good, good luck. I, I think there was a question here, and then I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to you. Mm -hmm. Similarly, with, 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 you look at physics, physicists long ago have long been trying to find some metaphor that's going to explain quantum mechanics. They just make their measurements and they apply it to much mechanical theory and applies it. 